Section 1 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Introductory Essay. It dico eum quisit orator virum bone esse oportere in omnibus cue dicit tanta auctoritas in est, ut dissentere puteat, nec advocati studium set testis aut iudis afferat fidem. Quintilianis. Quote, democracy is the most monstrous of all governments, because it is impossible at once to act and control, and consequently the sovereign power is then left without any restraint whatever. That form of government is the best which places the efficient direction in the hands of the aristocracy, subjecting them in its exercise to the control of the people at large. End quote. So James Mackintosh. The intellectual homage of more than half a century has assigned to Edmund Burke a lofty preeminence in the aristocracy of mind, and we may justly assume succeeding ages will confirm the judgment which the past has thus pronounced. His biographical history is so popularly known that it is almost superfluous to record it in this brief introduction. It may, however, be summed up in a few sentences. He was born at Dublin in 1730, his father was an attorney in extensive practice, and his mother's maiden name was Nogle, whose family was respectable and resided near Castletown, Roche, where Burke himself received five years of boyish education under the guidance of a rustic schoolmaster. He was entered at Trinity College, Dublin, in 1746, but only remained there until 1749. In 1753 he became a member of the Middle Temple, and maintained himself chiefly by literary toil. Bristol did itself the honour to elect him for her representative in 1774, and after years of splendid usefulness and mental triumph as an orator, statesman, and patriot, he retired to his favourite retreat, Beaconsfield, in Buckinghamshire, where he died on... July 9th, 1797. He was buried here, and the pilgrim who visits the grave of this illustrious man when he gazes on the simple tomb which marks the earthly resting place of himself, brother, son, and widow, may feelingly recall his own pathetic wish, uttered some forty years before in London, quote, I would rather sleep in the southern corner of a little country churchyard than in the tomb of the Capulets. I should like, however, that my dust should mingle with kindred dust, the good old expression family burying ground has something pleasing in it, at least to me, end quote. Alluding to his approaching dissolution, he thus speaks in a letter addressed to a relative of his earliest schoolmaster, quote, I have been at Bath these four months for no purpose, and am therefore to be removed to my own house at Beaconsfield tomorrow, to be nearer a habitation more permanent, humbly and fearfully hoping that my better part may find a better mansion, end quote. It is a source of deep thankfulness for those who reverence the genius and eloquence of this great man to state that Burke's religion was that of the cross, and to find him speaking of the intercession of our redeeming Lord as, quote, what he had long sought with unfeigned anxiety, and to which he looked with trembling hope, end quote. The commencing paragraph of his will also authenticates the genuine character of his personal Christianity. Quote, according to the ancient, good, and laudable custom of which my heart and understanding recognize the propriety, I bequeath my soul to God, hoping for his mercy only through the merits of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. My body I desire to be buried in the church of Beaconsfield, near to the bodies of my dearest brother and my dearest son, in all humility praying that, as we have lived in a perfect unity together, we may together have part in the resurrection of the just. End quote. In reference to the intellectual grandeur, the eloquent genius and prophetic wisdom of Burke, which have caused his writings to become oracles for future statesmen to consult, it is quite unnecessary for contemporary criticism to speak. By the concurring judgment both of political friends and foes, as well as by the highest arbiters of taste throughout the civilized world, Burke has been pronounced not only primus inter pares, but facile omnium princeps. At the termination of these introductory remarks, the reader will be presented with critical portraitures of Burke from the writings and speeches of men, who, while opposed to him in their principles of legislative policy, with all the chivalry and candour of genius, paid a noble homage to the vastness and variety of his unrivalled powers. Meanwhile, it may not be presumptuous for a writer, on an occasion like the present, to contemplate this great man under certain aspects which perhaps are not sufficiently regarded in their distinctive bearings on the worth and wisdom of his character and writings. 
we say distinctive, because the eloquence of Burke, beyond that of all other orators and statesmen which Great Britain has produced, is featured with expressions and characterized by qualities as peculiar as they are immortal. So far as invention, imagination, moral fervor, and metaphorical richness of illustration, combined with that intense pathos and ethos, which the Roman critic describes as essential to the true orator, are concerned, the author of Reflections on the French Revolution and Letters on a Regicide Peace, is justly admired and appreciated. Moreover, if what we understand by the sublime in eloquence has ever been embodied, the speeches and writings of Burke appear to have been drawn from those five sources, Pege, to which Longinus alludes. In the eighth chapter of his fragment on the sublime, he observes that if we assume an ability for speaking well as a common basis, there are five copious fountains from whence sublimity and eloquence may be said to flow, viz. one, boldness and grandeur of thought, two, the pathetic or the power of exciting the passions into an enthusiastic reach and noble degree, three, a skilful application of figures, both from sentiment and language, four, a graceful, finished and ornate style embellished by tropes and metaphors, five, lastly, as that which completes all the rest, the structure of periods in dignity and grandeur. These five sources of the sublime, the same philosophical critic distinguishes into two classes, the first two he asserts to be gifts of nature, and the remaining three are considered to depend in a great measure upon literature and art. Again, if we may linger for a moment in the attractive region of classical authorship, how justly applicable are the words of Cicero in his De Oratore to the vastness and variety of Burke's attainments. Ac mea quidim sententia nemo poterit esse omni laude cumulatus orator, nisi erit omnium rerum magnarum atque artium scientiam consectus. Cicero, De Oratore. Liber 1, Caput 6. Equally descriptive of Burke's power in raising the dormant sensibilities of our moral nature by his intuitive perception of what that nature really and fundamentally is are the following expressions of the same great authority. Quis enim nescit maximum vim existere oratoris in hominum mentibus vel ad iram aut ad odium aut dolorem in sitandis vel abhisce istem permonitionibus ad lenitatem misere cortiamque revocandis, quare nisi qui naturas hominum vimque omnem humanitatis causaque eas quibus mentes aut excitantur aut reflectuntur penitus perspexerit dicendo quod volet per fissere non poterit. Cicero, De Oratore, Liber 1, Caput 12. But to return, if a critical analysis of Burke as an exhibition of genius be attempted, his characteristic endowments may, probably, be not incorrectly represented by the following succinct statement. 1. Endless variety in connection with exhaustless vigour of mind. 2. A lofty power of generalization, both in speculative views and in his argumentative process. 3. Vivid intensity of conception, which caused abstractions to stand out with almost living force and visible feature in his impassioned moments. 4. An imagination of oriental luxuriance, whose incessant play in tropes, metaphors, and analogies frequently causes his speeches to gleam on the intellectual eye, as Aeschylus says the ocean does when the sun irradiates its bosom with the anerith mon gelasma of countless beams. 5. His positive acquirements in all the varied realms of art, science, and literature endowed him with such vast funds of knowledge that Johnson declared of Burke, quote, enter upon what subject you will, and Burke is ready to meet you, end quote. 6. In addition to these high gifts, may be added an ability to wield the weapons of sarcasm and irony with a keenness of application and effect, rarely equalled. But in all candor it may be added, that just as a profusion of figures and metaphors sometimes tempted this great orator into incongruous images and coarse analogies, so his passion for irony was occasionally too intense. Hence there are occasions where his pungency is embittered into acrimony. Strength degenerates into vulgarism, and the vehemence of a satire is infuriated with the fierceness of invective. 7. With regard to language and style, it may be truly said, they were the absolute vassals of his genius, and did homage to its command in every possible mode by which it chose to employ them. 
Thus, in his letters on a regicide piece, and above all in French revolutions, the reader will find almost every conceivable manner of style and mode of expression the English language can develop, and what is more, together with classical richness, there are also the pointed seriousness and persuasive simplicity of our own vernacular Saxon, which increase the attractions of Burke's style to a wonderful extent. But beyond controversy among these great endowments, the imaginative faculty is that which appears to be the most transcendent in the mental constitution of Burke. And so truly is this the case, that both among his contemporaries, as well as among his successors, this predominance of imagination has caused his just claims as a philosophic thinker and statesman to be particularly overlooked. The union of ideal theory and practical realization, of imaginative creation with logical induction, is indeed so rare we cannot be surprised at the injustice which the genius of book has had to endure in this respect. And yet, in the nature of our faculties themselves, there exists no necessity why a vivid power to conceive ideas should not be combined with a dialectic skill in expressing them. De Gérando, an admirable French writer in one of his treatises, has some profound observations on this subject, and does not hesitate to define poetry itself as a species of logique cachée. But when we assert that these excellencies which have thus been succinctly exhibited characterize the mental constitution of book we do not mean that others have not in their degree possessed similar endowments such an inference would be an absurd extravagance but what we mean to affirm is the qualifications enumerated have never been combined into cooperative harmony and developed in proportionable effect as they appear in the speeches and writings of this wonderful man but after all we have not reached what may be considered a peerless excellence the peculiar gift the one great and glorious distinction which separates Burke's oratory from that of all others, and which has caused his speeches to be blended with political history and to incorporate themselves with the moral destiny of Europe, namely his intuitive perception of universal principles. The truth of this statement may be verified by comparing the eloquence of Burke with specimens of departed orators, or by reference to existing standards in the parliamentary debates. Compared, then, either with the speeches of Chatham, Holland, Pitt, Fox, etc., etc., we perceive at once the grand distinction to which we refer. These illustrious men were effective debaters, and in various senses orators of surpassing excellency. But how is it that, with all their allowed grandeur of intellect and political eminence, they have ceased to operate upon the hearts and minds of the present age, either as teachers of political truth or oracles of legislative wisdom? simply because they were too popular in temporary effect ever to become influential by permanent inspiration. In their highest moods and amid their noblest hours of triumph, they were of the earth earthy. Party, personality, crushing rejoinders or satirical attacks, a felicitous exposure of inconsistency, or a triumphant self-vindication, brilliant repartees and logical gladiatorship, such are among the prominent characteristics which caused parliamentary debates in Burke's day to be so animating and interesting to those who heard or perused them, amid the excitements of the hour. It is not to be denied that commanding eloquence, vast genius, political ardour, intellectual enthusiasm, together with indignant denunciation and argumentative subtlety, were thus summoned into exercise by the perils of the nation and the contentions of party. Nevertheless, the local, the temporal, the conventional, and the individual, in all which relates to the science of politics or the tactics of partisanship, are sufficient to excite and employ the energies and qualities which made the general parliamentary debates of Burke's period so captivating. But when we revert to his own speeches and writings, we at once perceive why, as long as the mind can comprehend what is true, the heart appreciate what is pure, or the conscience authenticate the sanction of heaven and the distinctions between right and wrong, Edmund Burke will continue to be admired, revered, and consulted, not only as the greatest of English orators, but as the profoundest teacher of political science. It was not that he despised the arrangement of facts or overlooked the minutiae of detail. On the contrary, as may be proved by his speeches on economical reform and Warren Hastings, in these respects his research was boundless and his industry inexhaustible. Moreover, he was quite alive to the claims of a crisis, and with the coolness and calm of a practical statesman, knew how to confront a sudden emergency and to contend with a gigantic difficulty. Yet all these qualifications recede before Burke's amazing power of expanding particulars into universals, and of associating the accidents of a transient discussion with the essential properties of some permanent law in policy, 
or abstract truth in morals. His genius looked through the local to the universal, to the temporal, perceived the eternal, and while facing the features of the individual, was enabled to contemplate the attributes of a race. Hence his speeches are virtual prophecies, and his writings a storehouse of pregnant axioms and predictive enunciations as limitless in their range as they are undying in duration. In one word, no speeches delivered in the English Parliament are so likely to be eternalized as Burke's, because he has combined with his treatment of some especial case or contingency before him the assertion of immutable principles which can be detached from what is local and national, and thus made to stand forth alone in all the naked grandeur of their truth and their tendency. Let us be permitted to investigate this topic a little further. If then what Quintilian asserted of the Roman orator may be applied to our own British Cicero, Ile se profecise sciat cui Cicero valde placebit, and if, moreover, this preeminence be chiefly discovered in Burke's instinctive grasp of that moral essence which is incorporated with all questions of political science and social ethics, from whence came this diviner energy of his genius? No believer in Christian revelation will hesitate to appropriate even to this subject the apostolic axiom, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. But while we subscribe with reverential sincerity to this announcement, it is equally true that the infinite inspirer of all good adjusts his secret energies by certain laws and condescends to work by analogous means. Bearing this in mind, we venture to think Burke's gift of almost prescient insight into the recesses of our common nature and his consummate faculty of instructing the future through the medium of the present were partly derived from the elevation of his sentiments and the purity of his private life. It would be unwise to draw invidious comparisons, but no student of the period in which Burke was in Parliament can deny that, compared with some of his illustrious contemporaries, he was indeed a model of what reason and conscience alike approve in all the relative duties and personal conduct of a man when beheld in his domestic career. It is indeed a source of deep thankfulness, the admirer of Burke's genius in public has no reason to blush for his character in private, and that when we have listened to his matchless oratory upon the arena of the House of Commons, we have not to mourn over dissipation, impurity, and depravity amid these circles of private history. Our theory, then, is that beyond what his distinctive genius inspired, Burke's wondrous power of enunciating everlasting principles and of associating the loftiest abstractions of wisdom with the commonest themes of the hour, was sustained and strengthened by the purity of his heart and the subjection of passion to the law of conscience. And if the worshippers of mere intellect apart from, or as opposed to, moral elevation, are inclined to ridicule this view of Burke's genius, we beg to remind them that one greater than the temple of mortal wisdom and all the idols enshrined therein has asserted a positive connection to exist between mental insight and moral purity. We allude to the Redeemer's words when he declares, If any man wills to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, how the passions act upon our perceptions, and by what process the motions of the will elevate or depress the forces of the intellect is beyond our metaphysics to analyse, but that there exists a real, active, and influential connection between our moral and mental life is undeniable, and since Burke's power of seizing the essential idea or fundamental principle of every complex detail which came before him was preeminently his gift, the intellectual insight such gift developed was not only an expression of senatorial wisdom, but also a witness for the elevation of his moral character. We must now allude to the public conduct of Burke as a statesman and politician, and only regret the limited range of a popular essay confines us to one view, namely his alleged inconsistency. There was a period when charges of apostasy were brought against him with reckless audacity, but time, the instructor of ignorance and the subduer of prejudice, is now beginning to place the conduct of Burke in its true light. The facts of the case are briefly these. Up to the period of 1791, Fox and Burke fought in the same rank of opposition and stood together upon a basis of complete identity in principle and sentiment. But even before the celebrated disruption of 1791, the progress of republicanism in America and the approaching separation of the colonies from their parent state, Burke's views of political liberty had received extensive modifications, and the ardour of his confidence in the so-called friends of freedom had been greatly cooled. 
but in 1791 the disruption between Burke and Fox became open, absolute, and final when the latter statesman uttered, in the hearing of his friend, this fearful eulogium on the French Revolution, quote, the new constitution of France is the most stupendous and glorious edifice of liberty which had been erected on the foundation of human integrity in any age or country, end quote. The reply of Burke to this boast of Jacobinism, with all its consequences in the political history of Europe, is far too well known to be quoted here. But since it was at this point in the career of Burke, the charge of apostasy was commenced, and which has never quite died away, even in existing times, we may be permitted first to cite a noble passage from Burke's self-vindication, and secondly to adduce a still more impressive evidence of his political rectitude and wisdom, derived from the admission of those who were once his uncompromising opponents. In relation to the attacks of Fox upon his supposed inconsistency, Mr. Burke thus replies, quote, I pass to the next head of charge, Mr. Burke's inconsistency. It is certainly a great aggravation of his fault in embracing false opinions, that in doing so he is not supposed to fill up a void, but that he is guilty of a dereliction of opinions that are true and laudable. This is the great gist of the charge against him. It is not so much that he is wrong in his book, that, however, is alleged also, as that he has therein belied his whole life. I believe, if he could venture to value himself upon anything, it is on the virtue of consistency that he would value himself the most. Strip him of this, and you leave him naked indeed. In the case of any man who had written something, and spoken a great deal upon very multifarious matter, during upwards of twenty-five years' public service, and in as great a variety of important events as perhaps have ever happened in the same number of years, it would appear a little hard, in order to charge such a man with inconsistency, to see collected by his friend a sort of digest of his sayings, even to such as were merely sportive and jocular. This digest, however, has been made with equal pains and partiality, and without bringing out those passages of his writings which might tend to show with what restrictions any expressions quoted from him ought to have been understood. From a great statesman he did not quite expect this mode of inquisition. If it only appeared in the works of common pamphleteers, Mr. Burke might safely trust to his reputation. When thus urged, he ought perhaps to do a little more. It shall be as little as possible, for I hope not much is wanting. To be totally silent on his charges would not be respectful to Mr. Fox. Accusations sometimes derive a weight from the persons who make them, to which they are not entitled for their matter. A man, who, among various objects of his equal regard, is secure of some and full of anxiety for the fate of others, is apt to go to much greater lengths in his preference of the objects of his immediate solicitude than Mr. Burke has ever done. A man so circumstanced, often seems to undervalue, to vilify, almost to reprobate and disown, those that are out of danger. This is the voice of nature and truth, and not of inconsistency and false pretense. The danger of anything very dear to us removes, for the moment, every other affection from the mind. When Priam had his whole thoughts employed on the body of his Hector, he repels with indignation, and drives from him with a thousand reproaches his surviving sons, who with an officious piety crowded about him to offer their assistance. A good critic, there is no better than Mr. Fox, would say that this is a masterstroke and marks a deep understanding of nature in the father of poetry. He would despise a Zoilus, who would conclude from this passage that Homer meant to represent this man of affliction as hating or being indifferent and cold in his affections to the poor relics of his house, or that he preferred a dead carcass to his living children. Mr. Burke does not stand in need of an allowance of this kind, which, if he did, by candid critics ought to be granted to him. If the principles of a mixed constitution be admitted, he wants no more to justify to consistency everything he has said and done during the course of a political life just touching to its close. I believe that gentleman has kept himself more clear of running into the fashion of wild, visionary theories, or of seeking popularity through every means, than any man perhaps ever did in the same situation. He was the first man who, on the hustings at a popular election, rejected the authority of instructions from constituents, or who in any place has argued so fully against it. Perhaps the discredit into which that doctrine of compulsive instructions under our Constitution is since fallen may be due in a great degree to his opposing himself to it in that manner and on that occasion. The reformers in representation and the bills for shortening the duration of parliaments he uniformly and steadily opposed for many years together, in contradiction to many of his best friends. These friends, however, in his better days, 
when they had more to hope from his service and more to fear from his loss than now they have, never chose to find any inconsistency between his acts and expressions in favour of liberty and his votes on those questions, but there is a time for all things. End quote. We need not, however, confine our vindication of Burke to his own eloquence, but invite the especial attention of his accusers and defamers unto two forgotten facts. First, a few weeks before Fox died, he dictated a dispatch to Lord Yarmouth, which confirmed all the policy for which Pitt for fifteen years had contended. Moreover, in a debate on Wyndham's military system, 1806, Fox thus delivered his own recantation. Quote, Indeed, by the circumstances of Europe, I am ready to confess I have been weaned from the opinions I formerly held with respect to the force which might suffice in time of peace. Nor do I consider this any inconsistency, because I see no rational prospect of any peace which would exempt us from the necessity of watchful preparation and powerful establishment. End quote. But the change of Fox's opinions, and their similarity to those maintained by Pitt with reference to our war with France, are by no means all which history can produce in justification of Burke's political wisdom and consistency. The whole civilized world has read the reflections on the French Revolution, whose sale in one year achieved the enormous number of 30,000 copies in connection with medals or marks of honor from almost every court in Europe. Now, of all the replies made to this masterpiece of reasoning and reflection, Mackintosh's Vindicie Gallicae was incontestably the ablest and profoundest, and yet the greatest of all his intellectual opponents thus addresses Burke, as appears from Memoirs of Mackintosh, Volume 1, page 87. Quote, the enthusiasm with which I once embraced the instruction conveyed in your writings is now ripened into solid conviction by the experience and conviction of more mature age. For a time, seduced by the love of what I thought liberty, I ventured to oppose without ceasing to venerate that writer who had nourished my understanding with the most wholesome principles of political wisdom. Since that time, a melancholy experience has undeceived me on many subjects in which I was the dupe of my own enthusiasm. End quote. Let us part from this branch of our subject by quoting Burke's own words, uttered, as it were, on the very brink of eternity. They attest to the latest moment of his life with what a sacred intensity and unflinching sincerity he clung to his original sentiments touching the French Revolution. Nor let the present writer shrink from adding they constitute but one of the many specimens of that instinctive prescience whereby this profoundest of philosophical statesmen was enabled to herald from afar the final triumphs of courage, patriotism, and truth. The passage occurs towards the conclusion of his Letters on a Regicide Peace, and is as follows. Quote, never succumb, it is a struggle for your existence as a nation. If you must die, die with the sword in your hand. But I have no fear whatever for the result. There is a salient living principle of energy in the public mind of England, which only requires proper direction to enable her to withstand this or any other ferocious foe. Persevere, therefore, till this tyranny be overpassed. End quote. If, from the glare of public history, we follow this great man into the shades of domestic seclusion, or watch the features of his social character unfolding themselves in the varied circle, which he graced by his presence or dignified by his worth, he is alike the object of respectful esteem and love. Warmth of heart, chivalry of sentiment, and that true high breeding which springs from the soul rather than a pedigree, eminently characterize the history of Burke in private life. Above all, a sympathizing tendency for the children of genius, and a Catholic largeness of view, in all which relates unto mental effort, combined with the utmost charity for human failings and infirmities, cannot but endear him to our deepest affections, while his unrivaled endowments command our highest admiration. To illustrate what is here alluded to, let the reader recall Burke's noble generosity towards that erratic victim of genius and grief, the painter Barry or his instantaneous sympathy in behalf of Crabbe the poet, when almost a foodless wanderer in our vast metropolis, and our estimate of Burke's excellencies as a man will not be deemed overdrawn. It now remains for the selector of the following pages to offer a few remarks on their nature and design. Accustomed from the earliest period of his mental life to read and study the writings of Edmund Burke, he has long wished that such a selection as now appears should be published. The works of Burke extend through a vast range of large volumes, and it is feared thousands have been deterred from holding communion with a master spirit of British literature by the magnitude of his labours. Hence a concentrated specimen of his intellect may not only tempt the reading public, Coleridge's horror yet an author's friend, to some study of Burke's noblest passages, 
but even ultimately to introduce them into a full acquaintance with his entire productions. Let it be distinctly understood, the selection now published is not a second-hand one grafted on some pre-existing volume, but the result of a diligent, careful, and analytical perusal of Burke's writings. In attempting such a work, there was one difficulty which none but those who have intimately studied this great orator can appreciate. We allude to the giving general titles or descriptive headings to passages selected for quotation. There is a mental fullness, a moral variety, and such a rapid transition of ideas in most of Burke's speeches that it almost baffles ability to abbreviate the spirit of his paragraphs so as to exhibit under some general head the bearing of the whole. The selector, in this respect, can only say he has done his best, and those who are most competent to appreciate difficulty will be least inclined to criticize failure. Finally, as to the leading design of this volume, its title, First Principles, is sufficiently descriptive to save much explanation. Burke represents an unrivaled combination of patriot, senator, and orator, and as such the moral and intellectual nature of the age will be purified and expanded when brought into contact with the attributes of his character and the productions of his mind. Nor can the meditative statesman, whose party is his country and whose political creed is based upon a true philosophy of human nature, forget that while the French Revolution, as involving facts, belongs to history, as in closing principles, it appertains to humanity, and hence the abiding application of Burke's profound views, not only to France and England, but to the world. Of course, those who reverence the majesty of eloquence, and are fascinated by a florid richness of style, boundless imagination, inexhaustible metaphor, and all the attending graces of consummate rhetoric, will also be charmed by the appropriate supply these pages afford. But, without seeking to be homiletical, let the writer be permitted to add a far higher purpose than mere literary amusement or the gratification of taste is designed by the present volume. It is the selector's most earnest hope that the first principles these pages so eloquently inculcate may be transcribed in all their purity, loftiness, and truth into the reason and conscience of his countrymen. And among these, for whose especial guidance he ventures to think the profound wisdom of these pages to be invaluable, are the rising statesmen and senators of the day, who are either being trained in our public schools, at the universities or about to enter upon the difficult but inspiring arena of the House of Commons. In reference to this sphere of legislative action, with all reverence to its claims and character, let it be said, material ends, commercial objects, and secular aggrandizement are now receiving an idolatrous homage and passionate regard, which no Christian patriot can contemplate without anxiety. The ideal, the imaginative, and the religious element is almost sneered out of the House of Commons at the existing moment, and any glowing exhibition of oratory or splendid manifestation of intellect is derided as being unpractical and ill-adapted to the sobriety of the English Senate. Against this heartless materialism and unholy mammon worship, Burke's pages are a magnificent protest, and are admirably suited to protect the political youth and dawning statesmen of our country from the blight and the blast of doctrines which decry enthusiasm as folly, and condemn the beautiful as worthless and untrue. Ships, colonies and commerce, exports and imports, taxes and imposts, characters and civic arrangements, none but a madman will depreciate what such themes involve of duty, energy, and zeal in political life. Still, let it be fearlessly maintained, neither wealth nor commerce in themselves can constitute the real greatness of an empire. It is only because they stand in relation to the higher destinies and holier responsibilities of an empire that a true statesman will regard them as vitally wound up with the vigor and prosperity of national development. Such, at least, is the philosophy of politics, breathed from the undying pages of Edmund Burke. He who studies this great writer will, more and more, sympathize with what Hooker taught and Bishop Sanderson inculcates. In one word, he will learn to venerate, with increasing reverence, the British Constitution as that peerless growth of patriotic mind, the great eternal wonder of mankind. Burke traced the ultimate origin of civil government to the divine will, both as declared in Revelation and imaged forth by the moral constitution of man. In this respect, it is well known how fundamentally he differs from the theories of Hobbes, Mandeville, Shaftesbury, and Hutcheson. Not less, also, is he opposed to Locke, who tells us, quote, The original compact, which begins and actually constitutes any political society, is nothing but the consent of any number of freemen capable of a majority to unite and incorporate into such a society. And this is that, and that only, which could give beginning to any lawful government in the world. End quote. 
In one word, Locke declares that civil government is not from God in the way of principle, but from man in the way of fact, and thus, being a mere contingency or moral accident in the history of human development, self-government is the essential prerogative of our nature. In accordance with this irrational and unscriptural hypothesis, we find Price and Priestley expanding Locke's views at the period of Burke, while in the writings of that apostle of political antinomianism, Rousseau, and his English counterpart, Tom Paine, the principles of the assumed contrat social display their utmost virulence. This is not the place to discuss the origin of civil government, but the classical reader, who has been taught to revere the political wisdom of those ancient teachers, whose insight was almost prophetical in abstract science, will thank us for an extract from Aristotle's politics which bears upon this subject, presents a most striking coincidence of sentiment between two master spirits on the philosophy of government, and will at once remind the reader of Burke's memorable passage, beginning with society is a partnership, etc., etc., the passage to which we allude in Aristotle's Politics begins thus, O temen un e polis fusi proteron e egatos getalupa. The whole passage may be thus freely translated, quote, A participation in rights and advantages forms the bond of political society, an institution prior in the intention of nature to the families and individuals from whom it is constituted. What members are to the body, that citizens are to a commonwealth, the hand or foot, when separated from the body, retains its name, but totally changes its nature, because it is completely divested of its uses and powers. In the same manner, a citizen is a constituent part of a whole system, which invests him with powers and qualifies him for functions, for which, in his individual capacity, he is totally unfit, and independently of such system, he might subsist indeed as a lonely savage, but could never attain that improved and happy state to which his progressive nature invariably tends." Perfected by the offices and duties of social life, man is the best, but rude and undisciplined he is the very worst of animals. For nothing is more detestable than armed improbity. Man is armed with craft and courage which, uncontrolled by justice, he will most wickedly pervert and become at once the most impious and fiercest of monsters, the most abominable in gluttony and shameless in personality. But... Justice is the fundamental virtue of political society, since the order of society cannot be maintained without law, and laws are constituted to proclaim what is just. End quote. Let us add to this noble passage, Aristotle remarks in his Ethics, Liber 10, Caput 8, that a higher destination than political virtue is the true end of man. In this respect he concurs with Plato, who teaches us, in his Thea Tetos, the main object of human pursuit ought to be omuosis to theo kataton dunaton, etc., etc., i.e., a similitude unto God as far as possible, which similitude consists in an imitation of his justice, holiness, and wisdom. To conclude, the noblest end of all policy on earth is to educate human nature for that august pole trefma, Philippines 3, verse 20, that eternal commonwealth which awaits perfected spirits above, when, through infinite grace, they are finally admitted into a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, verse 10. End of section 1. Section 2 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Appendix. The following are the critical sketches of Burke's character alluded to in the commencement of this essay. They are from the pens of his most distinguished contemporaries who were opposed to him in their political views and public career. From Sir James Mackintosh. Quote, there can be no hesitation in according to him a station among the most extraordinary men that ever appeared, and we think there is now but little diversity of opinion as to the kind of place which it is fit to assign him. He was a writer of the first class, and excelled in almost every kind of composition, possessed of most extensive knowledge and of the most various description, acquainted alike with what different classes of men knew each in his own province, and with much that hardly any one ever thought of learning, he could either bring his masses of information to bear directly upon the subjects to which they severally belonged, or he could avail himself of them generally to strengthen his faculties and enlarge his views, or he could turn any of them to account for the purpose of illustrating his theme or enriching his diction. 
Hence, when he is handling any one matter, we perceive that we are conversing with a reasoner or a teacher to whom almost every other branch of knowledge is familiar. His views range over all the cognate objects, his reasonings are derived from principles applicable to other themes as well as the one in hand. Arguments pour in from all sides as well as those which start up under our feet, the natural growth of the path he is leading us over. While to throw light round our steps and either explore its darkest places or serve for our recreation, illustrations are fetched from a thousand quarters, and an imagination marvellously quick to descry unthought-of resemblances points to our use the stores which a love yet more marvellously has gathered from all ages and nations and arts and tongues. We are, in respect of the argument, reminded of Bacon's multifarious knowledge and the exuberance of his learned fancy. Whilst the many-lettered diction recalls to mind the first of English poets and his immortal verse, rich with the spoils of all sciences and old times, he produced but one philosophical treatise, but no man lays down abstract principles more soundly or better traces their application. All his works, indeed, even his controversial, are so infused with general reflection, so variegated with speculative discussion, that they wear the air of the Lyceum as well as the Academy. End quote. From Lord Erskine, quote, I shall take care to put Burke's work on the French Revolution into the hands of those whose principles are left to my protection. I shall take care that they have the advantage of doing in the regular progression of youthful studies what I have done even in the short intervals of laborious life, that they shall transcribe with their own hands from all the works of this most extraordinary person, and from this last among the rest, the soundest truths of religion, the justest principles of morals, inculcated and rendered delightful by the most sublime eloquence, the highest reach of philosophy brought down to the level of common minds by the most captivating taste, the most enlightened observations on history, and the most copious collection of useful maxims for the experience of common life. End quote. From King, Bishop of Rochester, quote, In the mind of Mr. Burke, political principles were not objects of barren speculation. Wisdom in him was always practical. Whatever his understanding adopted as truth made its way to his heart and sank deep into it, and his ardent and generous feelings seized with promptitude every occasion of applying it to mankind. Where shall we find recorded exertions of active benevolence at once so numerous, so varied, and so important, made by one man? Among those, the redress of wrongs and the protection of weakness from the oppression of power were most conspicuous. The assumption of arbitrary power in whatever shape it appeared, whether under the veil of legitimacy or skulking in the disguise of state necessity, or presenting the shameless front of usurpation, whether the prescriptive claim of ascendancy, or the career of official authority, or the newly acquired dominion of a mob, was the pure object of his detestation and hostility, and this is not a fanciful enumeration of possible cases, etc. End, quote. End of section 2. Section 3 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke by Edmund Burke. Section 3. Nature and Functions of the House of Commons. Whatever alterations time and the necessary accommodations of business may have introduced, this character can never be sustained unless the House of Commons shall be made to bear some stamp of the actual disposition of the people at large. It would, among public misfortunes, be an evil more natural and tolerable that the House of Commons should be infected with every epistle frenzy of the people, as this would indicate some consequentity, some sympathy of nature, of their constitutions, than that they should in all cases be wholly untouched by the opinions and feelings of the people out of doors. By this want of sympathy they would cease to be a house of commons, for it is not the derivation of the power of that house from the people which makes it a distinct sense their representative the king is the representative of the people so are the lords so are the judges they all are trustees for the people as well as the commons because no power is given for the 
sole sake of the holder, and, although government certainly is an institution of divine authority, yet its forms and the persons who administer it all organize from the people. A popular origin cannot, therefore, be characteristical distinction of a popular representative. This belongs equally to all parts of government and in all forms. The virtue, spirit, and essence of a house of commons consists in its being the express image of the feelings of the nation. It was not instituted to be a control upon the people, as of late it has been taught by a doctrine of the most pernicious tendency. It was designed as a control for the people. Other institutions have been formed for the purpose of checking popular excesses, and they are, I apprehend, fully adequate to their object. If not, they ought to be made so. The House of Commons, as it was never intended for the support of peace and subordination, is miserably appointed for that service, having no stronger weapon than its mace, and no better officer than its sergeant-at-arms, which it can command of its own proper authority. A vigilant and jealous eye over executory and judicial magistracy, an anxious care of the public money, an openness approaching towards facility, to public complaint, these seem to be the true characteristics of a House of Commons. But an addressing House of Commons and a petitioning nation, a House of Commons full of confidence, when the nation is plunged in despair, and the utmost harmony with ministers whom the people regard with their utmost adhorrence, who vote thanks when the public opinion calls upon them for impeachments, who are eager to grant when the general voice demands account who in all disputes between the people and administration presume against the people who punish their disorders but refuse even to inquire into the provocations to them this is an unnatural a monstrous state of things in this constitution such an assembly may be a great wise and awful senate but it is not to any popular purpose a house of commons this change from an immediate state of procuration and delegation to a course of acting for, as from original power is the way in which all the popular magistracies in the world have been perverted from their purposes it is indeed the greatest and sometimes their incurable corruption for there is a material distinction between that corruption by which particular points are carried against reason this is a thing which cannot be prevented by human wisdom, and is of less consequence, and the corruption of the principle itself. For then the evil is not accidental, but settled. The distemper becomes the natural habit. Retrospect and Resignation You are but just entering into the world. I am going out of it. I have played long enough to be hardly tired of the drama. Whether I have acted my part in it well or ill, Posterity will judge with more candor than I, or than the present age with our present passions can possibly pretend to. For my part, I quit it without a sigh, and submit to the sovereign order without murmuring. The nearer we approach to the goal of life, the better we begin to understand the true value of our existence, and then the real weight of our opinions. We set out much in love with both, but we leave much behind us, as we advance. We first throw away the tails along with the rattles of our nurses. Those of the priest keep their hold a little longer, those of our governors the longest of all. But the passions which prop these opinions are withdrawn, one after another, and the cool light of reason at the setting of our life shows us what a false splendor played upon these objects during our more sanguine seasons. Modesty of Mind if any inquiry, thus carefully conducted, should fail at last of discovering the truth, it may answer an end perhaps as useful in discovering to us the weakness of our own understanding. If it does not make us knowing, it may make us modest. If it does not preserve us from error, it may, at least from the spirit of our error, and may make us cautious of pronouncing with positiveness or with haste, when so much labor may end in so much uncertainty. 
Newton, and nature. When Newton first discovered the property of attraction and settled its laws, he found it served very well to explain several of the most remarkable phenomena in nature. But yet, with reference to the general system of things, he could consider attraction but as an effect whose cause at that time he did not attempt to trace. But when he afterwards began to account for it by a subtle elastic sether, this great man, if in so great a man it be not impious to discover anything like a blemish, seemed to have acquitted his usual cautious manner of philosophizing, since, perhaps, allowing all that has been advanced on the subject to be sufficiently proved, I think it leaves us with as many difficulties as it found us. That great chain of causes, which, linking one to another, even to the throne of God himself, can never be unraveled by any industry of ours. When we go but one step beyond the immediate sensible qualities of things, we go out of our depth. All we do after is but a faint struggle that shows we are in an element which does not belong to us. Theory and Practice It is, I own, not uncommon to be wrong in theory, and right in practice, and we are happy that it is so. Men often act right from their feelings, who afterwards reason but ill on them from principle. But, as it is impossible to avoid an attempt at such reasoning, and equally impossible to prevent its having some influence on our practice, surely it is worth taking some pains to have it just and founded on the basis of sure experience. End of section 3. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 4 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke by Edmund Burke. Section 4. Induction and Comparison. We must not attempt to fly when we can scarcely pretend to creep. In considering any complex matter, we ought to examine every distinct ingredient in the composition one by one and reduce everything to the utmost simplicity, since the condition of our nature binds us to a strict law and very narrow limits. We ought afterwards to re-examine the principles by the effect of the composition, as well as the composition by that of the principles. We ought to compare our subject with things of a similar nature, and even with things of a contrary nature, for discoveries may be, and often are, made by the contrast which would escape us on the single view. The greater number of the comparisons we make, the more general and the more certain our knowledge is likely to prove as built upon a more extensive and perfect induction. Divine Power on the Human Idea Whilst we consider the Godhead merely as he is an object of the understanding, which forms a complex idea of power, wisdom, justice, goodness, all stretch to a degree far exceeding the bounds of our comprehension. Whilst we consider the divinity in this refined and abstracted light, the imagination and passions are little or nothing affected. But because we are bound by the condition of our nature to ascend to these pure and intellectual ideas, through the medium of sensible images, to judge of these divine qualities by their evident acts and exertions, it becomes extremely hard to disentangle our idea of the cause from the effect by which we are led to know it. Thus, when we contemplate the deity as attributes and their operation, coming united on the mind from a sort of sensible image, and as much are capable of affecting the imagination. Now, though in a just idea of the deity, perhaps none of his attributes are predominant, yet, to our imagination, his power is by far the most striking. Some reflection, some comparing, is necessary to satisfy us of his wisdom, his justice, and his goodness. To be struck with his power, it is only necessary that we should open our eyes. But whilst we contemplate so vast an object under the arm, as it were of almighty power, and invested upon every side with omnipresence, we shrink into the minuteness of our own nature, 
and are, in a manner, annihilated before him. Union of love and dread in religion. True religion has, and must have, a large mixture of salutary fear, but false religions have generally nothing else but fear to support them. Before the Christian religion had, as it were, humanized the idea of the divinity and brought it somewhat nearer to us, there was very little said of the love of God. The followers of Plato have something of it, and only something. The other writers of pagan antiquity, whether poets or philosophers, nothing at all. And they who consider with what infinite attention, by what a disregard of every perishable object, through what long habits of piety and contemplation, it is that any man is able to attain an entire love and devotion to the deity. We easily perceive that it is not the first, the most natural, and the most striking effect which proceeds from that idea, office of sympathy. Whenever we are formed by nature to any act of purpose, the passion which animates us to it is attended with delight, or a pleasure of some kind. Let the subject matter be what it will. And as our Creator has designed that we should be united by the bond of sympathy, He has strengthened that bond by a proportionable delight. And there most where our sympathy is most wanted, in the distress of others. Words. Natural objects affect us by the laws of that connection which providence has established between certain motions and configurations of bodies, and certain consequent feelings in our mind. Painting effects in the same manner, but with the superadded pleasure of imitation. Architecture affects by the laws of nature and the law of reason, from which latter result the rules of proportion, which make a work to be praised or censured in the whole or in some part when the end for which it was designed or is not properly answered but as to words they seem to me to affect us in a manner very different from that in which we are affected by natural objects or by painting or architecture yet words have a considerable a share in exciting ideas of beauty and of the sublime as many of those and sometimes a much greater than any of them End of section 4. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 5 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke by Edmund Burke. Section 5. Nature Anticipates Man. Whenever the wisdom of our Creator intended that we should be affected with anything, he did not confide the execution of his design to be languid and precarious operation of our reason, but he endued it with powers and properties that prevent the understanding and even the will, which, seizing upon the senses and imagination, captivate the soul before the understanding is ready either to join with them or to oppose them it is by a long deduction and much study that we discover the adorable wisdom of god in his works when we discover it the effect is very different not only in the manner of acquiring it but in its own nature from that which strikes us without any preparation from the sublime or the beautiful self-inspection. Whatever turns the soul inward on itself tends to concentrate its forces and to fit it for greater and stronger flights of science. By looking into physical causes, our minds are opened and enlarged, and in this pursuit, whether we take or whether we lose our game, the chase is certainly of service. Power of the obscure. Poetry, with all its obscurity, has a more general, as well as a more powerful, dominion over the passions than the other art. And I think there are reasons in nature why the obscure idea 
when properly conveyed, should be more affecting than the clear. It is our ignorance of things that causes all our admiration, and chiefly excites our passions. Knowledge and acquaintance make the most striking causes affect but little. It is thus with the vulgar, and all men are as the vulgar in what they do not understand. The ideas of eternity and infinity are among the most affecting we have. And yet, perhaps, there is nothing of which we really understand so little as of infinity and eternity. Female Beauty The object, therefore, of this mixed passion, which we call love, is the beauty of the sex. Men are carried to the sex in general, as it is the sex, and by the common law of nature, but they are attached to particulars by personal beauty. I call beauty a social quality, for where women and men, and not only they, but when other animals give us a sense of joy and pleasure in beholding them, and there are many that do so, they inspire us with sentiments of tenderness and affection towards their persons. We like to have them near us, and we enter willingly into a kind of relation with them, unless we should have strong reasons to the contrary. Novelty and Curiosity Curiosity is the most superficial of all the affections. It changes its object perpetually. It has an appetite which is very sharp, but very easily satisfied, and it has always an appearance of grittiness, restlessness, and anxiety. Curiosity, from its own nature, is a very active principle. It quickly runs over the greatest part of its objects, and soon exhausts the variety which is commonly to be met with in nature. The same things make frequent returns, and they return with less and less of any agreeable effect. In short, the occurrences of life, by the time we come to know it a little, would be incapable of affecting the mind with any other sensations than those of loathing and weariness. If many things were not adapted to affect the mind by means of other powers besides novelty in them, and of other passions besides curiosity in ourselves. End of section 5. Read by Elijah Fisher. Section 6 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke Pleasures of Analogy the mind of man has naturally a far greater alacrity and satisfaction in tracing resemblances than in searching for differences, because by making resemblances we produce new images. We unite, we create, we enlarge our stock. But in making distinctions we offer no food at all to the imagination. The task itself is more severe and irksome, and what pleasure we derive from it is something of a negative and indirect nature. Ambition. God has planted in man a sense of ambition and a satisfaction arising from the contemplation of his excelling his fellows in something deemed valuable amongst them. It is this passion that drives men to all the ways we see in use of signalizing themselves, and that tends to make whatever excites in a man the idea of this distinction so very pleasant. It has been so strong as to make very miserable men take comfort that they were supreme in misery. And certain it is that, where we cannot distinguish ourselves by something excellent, we begin to take a complacency in some singular infirmities, follies, or defects of one kind or other. It is on this principle that flattery is so prevalent, for flattery is no more than what raises in a man's mind an idea of a preference which he has not. Extensions of sympathy. For sympathy must be considered as a sort of substitution by which we are put into the place of another man and affected in many respects as he is affected, so that this passion may either partake of the nature of those which regard self-preservation and turning upon pain may be a source of the sublime, or it may turn upon ideas of pleasure 
and then whatever has been said of the social affections, whether they regard society in general, or only some particular modes of it, may be applicable here. It is by this principle chiefly that poetry, painting, and other affecting arts transfuse their passions from one breast to another, and are often capable of grafting a delight on wretchedness, misery, and death itself. Philosophy of Taste So far, then, as taste belongs to the imagination, its principle is the same in all men. There is no difference in the manner of their being affected, nor in the causes of the affection, but in the degree there is a difference, which arises from two causes principally, either from a greater degree of natural sensibility, or from a closer and longer attention to the object. Clearness and Strength in Style We do not sufficiently distinguish, in our observations upon language, between a clear expression and a strong expression. These are frequently confounded with each other, though they are in reality extremely different. The former regards the understanding, the latter belongs to the passions. The one describes a thing as it is, the latter describes it as it is felt. Now, as there is a moving tone of voice, an impassioned countenance, an agitated gesture, which affect independently of the things about which they are exerted, so there are words, and certain dispositions of words, which being peculiarly devoted to passionate subjects, and always used by those who are under the influence of any passion, touch and move us more than those which far more clearly and distinctly express the subject matter. We yield to sympathy what we refuse to description. The truth is, all verbal description, merely as naked description, though never so exact, conveys so poor and insufficient an idea of the thing described, that it could scarcely have the smallest effect if the speaker did not call in to his aid those modes of speech that mark a strong and lively feeling in himself. Then, by the contagion of our passions, we catch a fire already kindled in another, which probably might never have been struck out by the object described. Words, by strongly conveying the passions, by those means which we have already mentioned, fully compensate for their weakness in other respects. End of section 6. Read by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in November of 2023. Section 7 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Unity of Imagination. Since the imagination is only the representation of the senses, it can only be pleased or displeased with the images from the same principle on which the sense is pleased or displeased with the realities, and consequently there must be just as close an agreement in the imaginations as in the senses of men. A little attention will convince us that this must of necessity be the case. Effect of Words If words have all their possible extent of power, three effects arise in the mind of the hearer. The first is the sound, the second the picture or representation of the thing signified by the sound, the third is the affection of the soul produced by one or by both of the foregoing. Compounded abstract words, of which we have been speaking, honor, justice, liberty, and the like, produce the first and the last of these effects, but not the second. Simple abstracts are used to signify some one simple idea without much adverting to others which may chance to attend it, as blue, green, hot, cold, and the like. These are capable of affecting all three of the purposes of words, as the aggregate words, man, castle, horse, etc., are in a yet higher degree. But I am of opinion that the most general effect, even of these words, 
does not arise from their forming pictures of the several things they would represent in the imagination, because, on a very diligent examination of my own mind, and getting others to consider theirs, I do not find that once in twenty times any such picture is formed, and when it is, there is most commonly a particular effort of the imagination for that purpose. But the aggregate words operate, as I said of the compound abstracts, not by presenting any image to the mind, but by having from use the same effect on being mentioned that their original has when it is seen. Investigation I am convinced that the method of teaching which approaches most nearly to the method of investigation is incomparably the best, since, not content with serving up a few barren and lifeless truths, it leads to the stock on which they grew. It tends to set the reader himself in the track of invention, and to direct him into those paths in which the author has made his own discoveries, if he should be so happy as to have made any that are valuable. The Sublime Whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible, or is conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. Obscurity Those despotic governments which are founded on the passions of men, and principally upon the passion of fear, keep their chief as much as may be from the public eye. The policy has been the same in many cases of religion. Almost all the heathen temples were dark. Even in the barbarous temples of the Americans at this day, they keep their idol in a dark part of the hut which is consecrated to his worship. For this purpose, too, the Druids performed all their ceremonies in the bosom of the darkest woods and in the shade of the oldest and most spreading oaks. No person seems better to have understood the secret of heightening, or of setting terrible things, if I may use the expression, in their strongest light by the force of a judicious obscurity, than Milton. End of section 7 Read by Geoffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in December of 2023of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Principles of Taste Whatever certainty is to be acquired in morality and the science of life, just the same degree of certainty have we in what relates to them in works of imitation. Indeed, it is for the most part in our skill in manners, and in the observances of time and place, and of decency in general, which is only to be learned in those schools to which Horace recommends us, that what is called taste, by way of distinction, consists, and which is in reality no other than a more refined judgment. On the whole, it appears to me that what is called taste, in its most general acceptation, is not a simple idea, but is partly made up of a perception of the primary pleasures of sense, of the secondary pleasures of the imagination, and of the conclusions of the reasoning faculty concerning the various relations of these, and concerning the human passions, manners, and actions. All this is requisite to form taste, and the groundwork of all these is the same in the human mind, for as the senses are the great originals of all our ideas, and consequently of all our pleasures, if they are not uncertain and arbitrary, the whole groundwork of taste is common to all, and therefore there is a sufficient foundation for conclusive reasoning on these matters. The Beautiful Beauty is a thing much too affecting not to depend upon some positive qualities, and, since it is no creature of our reason, 
since it strikes us without any reference to use, and even where no use at all can be discerned, since the order and method of nature is generally very different from our measures and proportions, we must conclude that beauty is, for the greater part, some quality in bodies acting mechanically upon the human mind by the intervention of the senses. The Real and the Ideal Choose a day on which to represent the most sublime and affecting tragedy we have. Appoint the most favorite actors. Spare no cost upon the scenes and decorations. Unite the greatest efforts of poetry, painting, and music. And when you have collected your audience, just at the moment when their minds are erect with expectation, let it be reported that a state criminal of high rank is on the point of being executed in the adjoining square. In a moment, the emptiness of the theatre would demonstrate the comparative weakness of the imitative arts and proclaim the triumph of the real sympathy. I believe that this notion of our having a simple pain in the reality, yet a delight in the representation, arises from hence that we do not sufficiently distinguish what we would by no means choose to do from what we should be eager enough to see if it was once done. We delight in seeing things which so far from doing our heartiest wishes would be to see redressed. This noble capital, the pride of England and of Europe, I believe no man is so strangely wicked as to desire to see destroyed by a conflagration or an earthquake, though he should be removed himself to the greatest distance from the danger. But suppose such a fatal accident to have happened, what numbers from all parts would crowd to behold the ruins, and amongst them many who would have been content never to have seen London in its glory? Judgment in Art A rectitude of judgment in the arts, which may be called a good taste, does in a great measure depend upon sensibility, because if the mind has no bent to the pleasures of the imagination, it will never apply itself sufficiently to works of that species to acquire a competent knowledge in them. But though a degree of sensibility is requisite to form a good judgment, Yet a good judgment does not necessarily arise from a quick sensibility of pleasure. Moral Effects of Language This arises chiefly from these three causes. First, that we take an extraordinary part in the passions of others, and that we are easily affected and brought into sympathy by any tokens which are shown of them and that there are no tokens which can express all the circumstances of most passions so fully as words. So that if a person speaks upon any subject, he can not only convey the subject to you, but likewise the manner in which he is himself affected by it. Certain it is that the influence of most things on our passions is not so much from the things themselves as from our opinions concerning them and these again depend very much on the opinions of other men, conveyable for the most part by words only. Secondly, there are many things of a very affecting nature which can seldom occur in the reality, but the words that represent them often do, and thus they have an opportunity of making a deep impression and taking root in the mind whilst the idea of the reality was transient and to some perhaps never really occurred in any shape, to whom it is notwithstanding very affecting, as war, death, famine, etc. Besides, many ideas have never been at all presented to the senses of any men but by words, as God, angels, devils, heaven, and hell, all of which have, however, a great influence over the passions. Thirdly, by words we have it in our power to make such combinations as we cannot possibly do otherwise. By this power of combining, we are able, by the addition of well-chosen circumstances, to give a new life and force to the simple object. 
In painting we may represent any fine figure we please, but we never can give it those enlivening touches which it may receive from words. To represent an angel in a picture, you can only draw a beautiful young man winged, but what painting can furnish out anything so grand as the addition of one word, the angel of the Lord? End of section 8 Read by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in December of 2023section nine of selections from the speeches and writings of edmund burke this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org selections from the speeches and writings of edmund burke security of truth i then thought and am still of the same opinion that error and not truth of any kind is dangerous, that ill conclusions can only flow from false propositions, and that to know whether any proposition be true or false, it is a preposterous method to examine it by its apparent consequences. Imitation an instinctive law. For as sympathy makes us take a concern in whatever men feel, so this affection prompts us to copy whatever they do, and consequently we have a pleasure in imitating, and in whatever belongs to imitation merely as it is such, without any intervention of the reasoning faculty, but solely from our natural constitution, which providence has framed in such a manner as to find either pleasure or delight, according to the nature of the object, in whatever regards the purposes of our being. It is by imitation far more than by precept that we learn everything. And what we learn thus, we acquire not only more effectually, but more pleasantly. This forms our manners, our opinions, our lives. It is one of the strongest links of society. It is a species of mutual compliance which all men yield to each other without constraint to themselves, and which is extremely flattering to all. Standard of Reason and Taste It is probable that the standard both of reason and taste is the same in all human creatures. For if there were not some principles of judgment as well as of sentiment common to all mankind, no hold could possibly be taken either on their reason or their passions, sufficient to maintain the ordinary correspondence of life. Use of theory A theory founded on experiment, and not assumed, is always good for so much as it explains. Our inability to push it indefinitely is no argument at all against it. This inability may be owing to our ignorance of some necessary mediums, to a want of proper application, to many other causes besides a defect in the principles we employ. Political Outcasts In the meantime, that power, which all these changes aimed at securing, remains still as tottering and as uncertain as ever. They are delivered up into the hands of those who feel neither respect for their persons nor gratitude for their favors, who are put about them in appearance to serve, in reality to govern them, and when the signal is given to abandon and destroy them in order to set up some new dupe of ambition, who in his turn is to be abandoned and destroyed thus living in a state of continual uneasiness and ferment, softened only by the miserable consolation of giving now and then preferments to those for whom they have no value. They are unhappy in their situation, yet find it impossible to resign, until at length, soured in temper and disappointed by the very attainment of their ends, in some angry, in some haughty, or some negligent moment, 
they incur the displeasure of those upon whom they have rendered their very being dependent. Then, perirun tempora longi seviti, they are cast off with scorn, they are turned out, emptied of all natural character, of all intrinsic worth, of all essential dignity, and deprived of every consolation of friendship. Having rendered all retreat to old principles ridiculous, and to old regards impracticable, not being able to counterfeit pleasure or to discharge discontent, nothing being sincere or right or balanced in their minds, it is more than a chance that in the delirium of the last stage of their distempered power they make an insane political testament by which they throw all their remaining weight and consequence into the scale of their declared enemies and the avowed authors of their destruction. End of section 9section 10 of selections from the speeches and writings of edmund burke this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org selections from the speeches and writings of edmund burke injustice to our own age if these evil dispositions should spread much farther they must end in our destruction for nothing can save a people destitute of public and private faith. However, the author, for the present state of things, has extended the charge by much too widely, as men are but too apt to take the measure of all mankind from their own particular acquaintance. Barren as this age may be in the growth of honor and virtue, the country does not want at this moment a strong, and those not a few, examples as were ever known of an unshaken adherence to principle and attachment to connection against every allurement of interest. Those examples are not furnished by the great alone, nor by those whose activity in public affairs may render it suspected that they make such a character one of the rounds in their ladder of ambition, but by men more quiet and more in the shade, on whom an unmixed sense of honor alone could operate. False Coalitions No system of that kind can be formed which will not leave room fully sufficient for healing coalitions, but no coalition which, under the specious name of independency, carries in its bosom the unreconciled principles of the original discord of parties ever was or will be an healing coalition. Nor will the mind of our sovereign ever know repose, his kingdom settlement, or his business order, in efficiency or grace with his people, until things are established upon the basis of some set of men who are trusted by the public and who can trust one another. Political Empiricism Men of sense, when new projects come before them, always think a discourse proving the mere right or mere power of acting in the manner proposed to be no more than a very unpleasant way of misspending time. They must see the object to be of proper magnitude to engage them. They must see the means of compassing it to be next to certain the mischiefs not to counterbalance the profit. They will examine how a proposed imposition or regulation agrees with the opinion of those who are likely to be affected by it. They will not despise the consideration even of their habitudes and prejudices. They wish to know how it accords or disagrees with the true spirit of prior establishments, whether of government or of finance because they well know that in the complicated economy of great kingdoms and immense revenues, which in a length of time and by a variety of accidents have coalesced into a sort of body, 
an attempt towards a compulsory equality in all circumstances, and an exact practical definition of the supreme rights in every case, is the most dangerous and chimerical of all enterprises. The old building stands well enough, though part Gothic, part Grecian, and part Chinese, until an attempt is made to square it into uniformity. Then it may come down upon our heads altogether in much uniformity of ruin, and great will be the fall thereof. A Visionary Enough of this visionary union, in which much extravagance appears without any fancy, and the judgment is shocked without anything to refresh the imagination. It looks as if the author had dropped down from the moon without any knowledge of the general nature of this globe, of the general nature of its inhabitants, without the least acquaintance with the affairs of this country. Party Divisions Party divisions, whether on the whole operating for good or evil, are things inseparable from free government. This is a truth which, I believe, admits little dispute, having been established by the uniform experience of old ages. The part a good citizen ought to take in these divisions has been a matter of much deeper controversy. But God forbid that any controversy relating to our essential morals should admit of no decision. It appears to me that this question, like most of the others which regard our duties in life, is to be determined by our station in it. Private men may be wholly neutral and entirely innocent, but they who are legally invested with public trust or stand on the high ground of rank and dignity, which is trust implied, can hardly in any case remain indifferent without the certainty of sinking into insignificance, and thereby in effect deserting that post in which, with the fullest authority and for the wisest purposes, the laws and institutions of their country have fixed them. However, if it be the office of those who are thus circumstanced to take a decided part, it is no less their duty that it should be a sober one. End of section 10。section 11 of selections from the speeches and writings of Edmund Burke。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke Decorum in Party It ought to be circumscribed by the same laws of decorum and balanced by the same temper which bound and regulate all the virtues. In a word, we ought to act in party with all the moderation which does not absolutely innervate that vigor and quench that fervency of spirit without which the best wishes for the public good must evaporate in empty speculation. Not so bad as we seem. Our circumstances are indeed critical, but then they are the critical circumstances of a strong and mighty nation. If corruption and meanness are greatly spread, they are not spread universally. Many public men are hitherto examples of public spirit and integrity. Whole parties, as far as large bodies can be uniform, have preserved character. However they may be deceived in some particulars, I know of no set of men amongst us which does not contain persons on whom the nation, in a difficult exigence, may well value itself. Private life, which is the nursery of the commonwealth, is yet in general pure, and on the whole disposed to virtue. And the people at large want neither generosity nor spirit. No small part of that very luxury, which is so much the subject of the author's declamation, but which, in most parts of life, 
by being well balanced and diffused, is only decency and convenience, has perhaps as many or more good than evil consequences attending it. It certainly excites industry, nourishes emulation, and inspires some sense of personal value into all ranks of people. What we want is to establish more fully an opinion of uniformity and consistency of character in the leading men of the state, such as will restore some confidence to profession and appearance, such as will fix subordination upon esteem. Without this, all schemes are begun at the wrong end. Politics without principle. People not very well grounded in the principles of public morality find a set of maxims in office ready made for them, which they assume as naturally and inevitably as any of the insignia or instruments of the situation. A certain tone of the solid and practical is immediately acquired. Every former profession of public spirit is to be considered as a debauch of youth or, at best, as a visionary scheme of unattainable perfection. The very idea of consistency is exploded. The convenience of the business of the day is to furnish the principle for doing it. Then the whole ministerial cant is quickly got by heart. The prevalence of faction is to be lamented. All opposition is to be regarded as the effect of envy and disappointed ambition. All administrations are declared to be alike. The same necessity justifies all their measures. It is no longer a matter of discussion who or what administration is, but that administration is to be supported is a general maxim. Flattering themselves that their power has become necessary to the support of all order and government, everything which tends to the support of that power is sanctified and becomes a part of the public interest. Moral debasement progressive. I believe the instances are exceedingly rare of men immediately passing over a clear, marked line of virtue into declared vice and corruption. There are a sort of middle tints and shades between the two extremes, there is something uncertain on the confines of the two empires which they first pass through, and which renders the change easy and imperceptible. There are even a sort of splendid impositions so well contrived that, at the very time the path of rectitude is quitted for ever, men seem to be advancing into some higher and nobler road of public conduct. Not that such impositions are strong enough in themselves, but a powerful interest, often concealed from those whom it affects, works at the bottom and secures the operation. Men are thus debauched away from those legitimate connections which they had formed on a judgment, early perhaps, but sufficiently mature and wholly unbiased. Despotism it is the nature of despotism to abhor power held by any means but its own momentary pleasure, and to annihilate all intermediate situations between boundless strength on its own part and total debility on the part of the people. End of section 11「Section 12 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Judgment and Policy Nothing can render this a point of indifference to the nation, but what must either render us totally desperate or soothe us into the security of idiots we must soften into a credulity below the milkiness of infancy to think all men virtuous. We must be tainted with a malignity truly diabolical to believe all the world to be equally wicked and corrupt. Men are in public life, as in private, some good, some evil. The elevation of the one and the desperation of the other 
are the first objects of all true policy. But that form of government, which neither in its direct institutions nor in their immediate tendency has contrived to throw its affairs into the most trustworthy hands, but has left its whole executory system to be disposed of agreeably to the uncontrolled pleasures of any one man, however excellent or virtuous, is a plan of polity defective not only in that member, but consequently erroneous in every part of it. Popular Discontent To complain of the age we live in, to murmur at the present possessors of power, to lament the past, to conceive extravagant hopes of the future, are the common dispositions of the greatest part of mankind, indeed the necessary effects of the ignorance and levity of the vulgar. Such complaints and humors have existed in all times, yet as all times have not been alike, true political sagacity manifests itself in distinguishing that complaint which only characterizes the general infirmity of human nature from those which are symptoms of the particular distemperature of our own air and season. THE PEOPLE AND THE RULERS I am not one of those who think that the people are never in the wrong. They have been so, frequently, and outrageously, both in other countries and in this. But I do say that in all disputes between them and their rulers, the presumption is at least upon a par in favor of the people. Experience may perhaps justify me in going farther. When popular discontents have been very prevalent, it may well be affirmed and supported that there has been generally something found amiss in the Constitution or in the conduct of the government. The people have no interest in disorder. When they do wrong, it is their error and not their crime. Government Favoritism It is this unnatural infusion of a government, which in a great part of its constitution is popular, that has raised the present ferment in the nation. The people, without entering deeply into its principles, could plainly perceive its effects, in much violence, in a great spirit of innovation, and a general disorder in all the functions of government. This is the fountain of all those bitter waters, of which, through an hundred different conduits, we have drunk until we are ready to burst. The discretionary power of the crown, in the formation of ministry, abused by bad or weak men, has given rise to a system which, without directly violating the letter of the law, operates against the spirit of the whole Constitution. A plan of favoritism for our executory government is essentially at variance with the plan of our legislature. One great end, undoubtedly, of a mixed government like ours, composed of monarchy and of controls on the part of the higher people and the lower, is that the prince shall not be able to violate the laws. This is useful indeed and fundamental, but this, even at first view, is no more than a negative advantage, an armor merely defensive. It is therefore next in order and equal in importance that the discretionary powers which are necessarily vested in the monarch, whether for the execution of the laws or for the nomination to magistracy and office or for conducting the affairs of peace and war or for ordering the revenue, should all be exercised upon public principles and national grounds and not in the likings or prejudices, the intrigues or policies of a court. Administration and Legislation In arbitrary governments, the constitution of the ministry follows the constitution of the legislature. Both the law and the magistrate are the creatures of will. It must be so. Nothing, indeed, will appear more certain on any tolerable consideration of this matter than that every sort of government ought to have its administration correspondent to its legislature. If it should be otherwise, Things must fall into a hideous disorder. The people of a free commonwealth who have taken such care that their laws should be the result of general consent cannot be so senseless as to suffer their executory system to be composed of persons on whom they have no dependence and whom no proofs of the public love and confidence have recommended to those powers upon the use of which the very being of the state depends. End of section 12 Read by Robert Goodwin, Jr. 
January 21, 2024. Section 13 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by D. Randall. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Influence of the Crown. The power of the crown, almost dead and rotten as prerogative, has grown up anew, with much more strength and far less odium, under the name of influence. An influence which operated without noise and without violence. An influence which converted the very antagonist into the instrument of power, which contained in itself a perpetual principle of growth and renovation and which the distresses and the prosperity of the country equally tend to augment, was an admirable substitute for a prerogative, that, being only the offspring of antiquated prejudices, had molded into its original stamina irresistible principles of decay and dissolution. The ignorance of the people is a bottom, but for a temporary system, the interests of active men in the state is a foundation perpetual and infallible. Voice of the People Government is deeply interested in everything which, even through the medium of some temporary uneasiness, may tend finally to compose the minds of the subjects and to conciliate their affections. I have nothing to do here with the abstract value of the voice of the people, but as long as reputation the most precious possession of every individual, and as long as opinion, the great support of the state, depend entirely upon that voice. It can never be considered as a thing of little consequence either to individuals or to governments. Nations are not primarily ruled by laws, less by violence. Whatever original energy may be supposed either in force or regulation, the operation of both is, in truth, merely instrumental. Nations are governed by the same methods and on the same principles by which an individual without authority is often able to govern those who are his equals or his superiors by a knowledge of their temper and by a judicious management of it. I mean, when public affairs are steadily and quietly conducted, and when government is nothing but a continued scuffle between the magistrate and the multitude, in which sometimes the one and sometimes the other is uppermost, in which they alternately yield and prevail in a series of contemptible victories and scandalous submissions. The temper of the people amongst whom he presides ought therefore to be the first study of a statesman, and the knowledge of this temper it is by no means impossible for him to attain if he has not an interest in being ignorant of what it is his duty to learn. Fallacy of Extremes It is a fallacy in constant use with those who would level all things and confound right with wrong to insist upon the inconveniencies which are attached to every choice without taking into consideration the different weight and consequence on those inconveniencies. The question is not concerning absolute discontent or perfect satisfaction in government, neither of which can be pure and unmixed at any time or upon any system. The controversy is about that degree of good humor in the people, which may possibly be attained and ought certainly to be looked for. While some politicians may be waiting to know whether the sense of every individual be against them, accurately distinguishing the vulgar from the better sort, drawing lines between the enterprises of a faction and the efforts of a people, they may chance to see the government, which they are so nicely weighing and dividing and distinguishing, tumble to the ground in the midst of their wise deliberation. Prudent men when so great an object as the security of government 
or even its peace is at stake, will not run the risk of a decision which may be fatal to it. They who can read the political sky will see a hurricane in the cloud no bigger than a hand at the very edge of the horizon and will run into the first harbor. No lines can be laid down for civil or political wisdom. They are a matter incapable of exact definition. But though no man can draw a stroke between the confines of day and night, yet light and darkness are, upon the whole, tolerably distinguishable. Nor will it be impossible for a prince to find out such a mode of government and such persons to administer it as will give a great degree of content to his people without any curious and anxious research for that abstract, universal, perfect harmony, which, while he is seeking, he abandons those means of ordinary tranquility which are in his power without any research at all. Private character a basis for public confidence. Before men are put forward into the great trusts of the state, they ought by their conduct to have obtained such a degree of estimation in their country as may be some sort of pledge and security to the public that they will not abuse those trusts. It is no mean security for proper use of power that a man has shown by the general tenor of his actions that the affection, the good opinion, the confidence of his fellow citizens have been among the principal objects of his life and that he has owed none of the degradations of his power or fortune to a settled contempt or occasional forfeiture of their esteem. That man who, before he comes into power, has no friends, or who coming into power is obliged to desert his friends, or who losing it has no friends to sympathize with him, he who has no sway among any part of the landed or commercial interests, but whose whole importance has begun with his office and is sure to end with it, is a person who ought never to be suffered by a controlling parliament to continue in any of those situations which confer the lead and direction of all our public affairs, because such a man has no connection with the interests of the people. Those knots or cabals of men who have got together avowedly without any public principle in order to sell their conjunct iniquity at the higher rate, and are therefore universally odious, ought never to be suffered to domineer in the state, because they have no connection with the sentiments and opinions of the people. Prevention Every good political institution must have a preventive operation as well as a remedial. It ought to have a natural tendency to exclude bad men from government, and not to trust for the safety of the state to subsequent punishment alone, punishment which has ever been tardy and uncertain, and which, when power is suffered in bad hands, may chance to fall rather on the injured than the criminal. End of section 13. Section 14 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by D. Rando. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Confidence in the People they may be assured that however they amuse themselves with a variety of projects for substituting something else in the place of that great and only foundation of government, the confidence of the people, every attempt will but make their condition worse. When men imagine that their food is only a cover for poison, and when they neither love nor trust the hand that serves it, it is not the name of the roast beef of old England that will persuade them to sit down to the table that is spread for them. When the people conceive that laws and tribunals and even popular assemblies are perverted from the ends of their institution, 
they find in those names of degenerated establishments only new motives to discontent. Those bodies which, when full of life and beauty, lay in their arms and were their joy and comfort when dead and putrid become but the more loathsome from remembrance of former endearments. A sullen gloom and furious disorder prevail by fits. The nation loses its relish for peace and prosperity, as it did in that season of fullness which opened our troubles in the time of Charles I. A species of men to whom a state of order would become a sentence of obscurity are nourished into a dangerous magnitude by the heat of intestine disturbances. And it is no wonder that, by a sort of sinister piety, they cherish in their turn the disorders which are the parents of all their consequence. False Maxims Assumed as First Principles It is an advantage to all narrow wisdom and narrow morals that their maxims have a plausible air, and, on a cursory view, appear equal to first principles. They are light and portable. They are as current as copper coin and about as valuable. They serve equally the first capacities and the lowest, and they are at least as useful to the worst men as to the best. Of this stamp is the cant of not men but measures, a sort of charm by which many people get loose from every honorable engagement. When I see a man acting this desultory and disconnected part, with as much detriment to his own fortune as prejudice to the cause of any party, I am not persuaded that he is right, but I am ready to believe he is in earnest. I respect virtue in all its situations, even when it is found in the unsuitable company of weakness. I lament to see qualities rare and valuable squandered away without any public utility, but when a gentleman with great visible emoluments abandons the party in which he has long acted and tells you it is because he proceeds upon his own judgment that he acts on the merits of the several measures as they arise and that he is obliged to follow his own conscience and not that of others. He gives reasons which it is impossible to controvert and discovers a character which it is impossible to mistake. What shall we think of him who never differed from a certain set of men until the moment they lost their power, and who never agreed with them in a single instance afterwards? Would not such a coincidence of interest and opinion be rather fortunate? Would it not be an extraordinary cast upon the dice that a man's connections should degenerate into faction precisely at the critical moment when they lose their power or he accepts a place? When people desert their connections, the desertion is a manifest fact upon which a direct simple issue lies, triable by plain men. Whether a measure of government be right or wrong is no matter of fact, but a mere affair of opinion on which men may, as they do, dispute and wrangle without end. But whether the individual thinks the measure right or wrong is a point at still a greater distance from the reach of all human decision. It is therefore very convenient to politicians not to put the judgment of their conduct on avert acts, cognizable in any ordinary court, but upon such matter as can be triable only in that secret tribunal, where they are sure of being heard with favor, or where at worst the sentence will be only private whipping. Lord Chatham. Another scene was opened and other actors appeared on the stage. The state in the condition I have described it was delivered into the hands of Lord Chatham, a great and celebrated name, a name that keeps the name of this country respectable in every other on the globe. It may be truly called Clarum et venerabile nomen gentibus et multum nostri quad proderet urbi. Sir, the venerable age of this great man, his merited rank, his superior eloquence, 
his splendid qualities, his eminent services, the vast space he fills in the eye of mankind, and more than all the rest, his fall from power, which, like death, canonizes and sanctifies a great character, will not suffer me to censor any part of his conduct. I am afraid to flatter him. I am sure I am not disposed to blame him. Let those who have betrayed him by their adulation insult him with their malevolence. But what I do not presume to censure, I may have leave to lament. For a wise man, he seemed to me at that time to be governed too much by general maxims. I speak with the freedom of history, and I hope without offense. One or two of these maxims flowing from an opinion not the most indulgent to our unhappy species, and surely a little too general, led him into measures that were greatly mischievous to himself, and for that reason, among others, perhaps fatal to his country, measures the effects of which, I am afraid, are forever incurable. He made an administration so checkered and speckled. He put together a piece of joinery, so crossly indented and whimsically dovetailed, a cabinet so variously inlaid, such a piece of diversified mosaic, such a tessellated pavement without cement, here a bit of black stone and there a bit of white. Patriots and courtiers, kings, friends, and republicans, Whigs and Tories, treacherous friends and open enemies, that it was indeed a very curious show, but utterly unsafe to touch and unsure to stand on. The colleagues whom he had assorted at the same boards stared at each other and were obliged to ask, quote, Sir, your name? Sir, you have the advantage of me. Mr. Such a one, I beg a thousand pardons. End quote. I venture to say, it did so happen that persons had a single office divided between them, who had never spoken to each other in their lives until they found themselves, they knew not how, pigging together, heads and points in the same truckled bed. Sir, in consequence of this arrangement, having put so much the larger part of his enemies and opposers into power, the confusion was such that his own principles could not possibly have any effect or influence in the conduct of affairs. If ever he fell into a fit of the gout, or if any other cause withdrew him from the public cares, principles directly the contrary were sure to predominate. When he had executed his plan, he had not an inch of ground to stand upon. When he had accomplished his scheme of administration, he was no longer a minister. When his face was hid but for a moment, his whole system was on a wide sea, without chart or compass. The gentlemen, his particular friends, who, with the names of various departments of ministry, were admitted to seem as if they acted a part under him, with the modesty that becomes all men, and with the confidence in him, which was justified even in its extravagance by his superior abilities, had never, in any instance, presumed upon any opinion of their own. Deprived of his guiding influence, they were rolled about, the sport of every gust, and easily driven into any port, and as those who joined with them in manning the vessel were the most directly opposite to his opinions, measures, and character, and far the most artful and most powerful of the set, they easily prevailed so as to seize upon the vacant, unoccupied, and derelict minds of his friends. And instantly they turned the vessel wholly out of the course of his policy, as if it were to insult as well as to betray him, even long before the close of the first session of his administration, when everything was publicly transacted, and with great parade in his name, they made an act, declaring it highly just and expedient to raise a revenue in America. For even then, sir, even before this splendid orb was entirely set, 
and while the western horizon was in a blaze with his descending glory, on the opposite quarter of the heavens arose another luminary, and for his hour became lord of the ascendant. Grenville. Mr. Grenville was the first-rate figure in this country, with a masculine understanding and a stout and resolute heart. He had an application undissipated and unwearied. He took public business not as a duty which he was to fulfill, but as a pleasure he was to enjoy, and he seemed to have no delight out of this house, except in such things as some way related to the business that was to be done within it. If he was ambitious, I will say this for him, his ambition was of a noble and generous strain. It was to raise himself not by the low, pimping politics of a court, but to win his way to power through the laborious gradations of public service and to secure himself a well-earned rank in Parliament by a thorough knowledge of its constitution and a perfect practice in all its business. Sir, if such a man fell into errors, it must be from defects not intrinsical. They must be rather sought in the particular habits of his life, which, though they do not alter the groundwork of character, yet tinge it with their own hue. He was bred in a profession. He was bred to the law which is, in my opinion, one of the first and noblest of human sciences, a science which does more to quicken and invigorate the understanding than all the other kinds of learning put together. But it is not apt, except in persons very happily born, to open and to liberalize the mind exactly in the same proportion. Passing from that study, he did not go very largely into the world, but plunged into business. I mean, into the business of office and the limited and fixed methods and forms established there. Much knowledge is to be had undoubtedly in that line, and there is no knowledge which is not valuable. But it may be truly said that men too much conversant in office are rarely minds of remarkable enlargement. Their habits of office are apt to give them a turn to think the substance of business not to be much more important than the forms in which it is conducted. These forms are adapted to ordinary occasions, and therefore persons who are nurtured in office do admirably well, as long as things go on in their common order. But when the high roads are broken up, and the water's out, when a new and troubled scene is opened, and the foul affords no precedent, then it is that a greater knowledge of mankind and a far more extensive comprehension of things is requisite than ever office gave or than office can ever give. Charles Townsend This light, too, is past and set forever. You understand, to be sure, that I speak of Charles Townsend, officially the reproducer of this fatal scheme, whom I cannot even now remember without some degree of sensibility. In truth, sir, he was the delight and ornament of this house, and the charm of every private society which he honored with his presence. Perhaps there never arose in this country, nor in any country, a man of a more appointed and finished wit, and where his passions were not concerned, of a more refined, exquisite, and penetrating judgment. If he had not so great a stock, as some have had who flourished formerly of knowledge long treasured up, he knew better by far than any man I ever was acquainted with how to bring together within a short time all that was necessary to establish, to illustrate, and to decorate that side of the question he supported. He stated his matter skillfully and powerfully. He particularly excelled in a most luminous explanation and display of his subject. His style of argument was neither trite and vulgar, nor subtle and abstruse. He hit the house just between wind and water, and not being troubled with too anxious a zeal for any matter in question, he was never more tedious or more earnest than the preconceived opinions and present temper of his hearers required, to whom he was always in perfect unison. 
He conformed exactly to the temper of the house, and he seemed to guide because he was always sure to follow it. End of section 14《セクション14》セクション15の「スピーチ・アン・ライティングズ・オブ・エドモン・バーク」。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Party and Place. Party is a body of men united for promoting by their joint endeavors the national interest upon some particular principle in which they are all agreed. For my part, I find it impossible to conceive that anyone believes in his own politics or thinks them to be of any weight who refuses to adopt the means of having them reduced into practice. It is the business of the speculative philosopher to mark the proper ends of government. It is the business of the politician, who is the philosopher in action, to find out proper means towards those ends and to employ them with effect. Therefore, every honorable connection will avow it is their first purpose to pursue every just method to put the men who hold their opinions into such a condition as may enable them to carry their common plans into execution with all the power and authority of the state. As this power is attached to certain situations, it is their duty to contend for these situations. Without a proscription of others, they are bound to give to their own party the preference in all things, and by no means for private considerations to accept any offers of power in which the whole body is not included, nor to suffer themselves to be led, or to be controlled, or to be overbalanced in office or in council. By those who contradict the very fundamental principles on which their party is formed, and even those upon which every fair connection must stand. Such a generous contention for power, on such manly and honorable maxims, will easily be distinguished from the mean and interested struggle for place and emolument. The very style of such persons will serve to discriminate them. From those numberless impostors who have deluded the ignorant with professions incompatible with human practice, and have afterwards incensed them by practices below the level of vulgar rectitude. Political connections. Every profession, not excepting the glorious one of a soldier or the sacred one of a priest, is liable to its own particular vices. Which, however, form no argument against those ways of life, nor are the vices themselves inevitable to every individual in those professions. Of such a nature are connections in politics, essentially necessary for the full performance of our public duty, accidentally liable to degenerate into faction. Commonwealths are made of families, free commonwealths of parties also, and we may as well affirm. That our natural regards and ties of blood tend inevitably to make men bad citizens, as that the bonds of our party weaken those by which we are held to our country. Some legislators went so far as to make neutrality in party a crime against the state. I do not know whether this might not have been rather to overstrain the principle. Certain it is, the best patriots and the greatest commonwealths have always commended and promoted such connections. Edom Sentier de Republica was with them a principal ground of friendship and attachment, nor do I know any other capable of forming firmer, dearer, more pleasing, more honorable, and more virtuous habitudes. The Romans carried this principle a great way. Even the holding of offices together. The disposition of which arose from chance, not selection, gave rise to a relation which continued for life. It was called necessitudo sortis, and it was looked upon with a sacred reverence. Breaches of any of these kinds of civil relation were considered as acts of the most distinguished turpitude. The whole people was distributed into political societies in which they acted in support of such interests in the state. As they severally affected. For it was then thought no crime to endeavor, by every honest means, 
to advance to superiority and power those of your own sentiments and opinions. This wise people was far from imagining that those connections had no tie and obliged to no duty, but that men might quit them without shame upon every call of interest. They believed private honor to be the great foundation of public trust, that friendship was no mean step towards patriotism, that he who, in the common intercourse of life, showed he regarded somebody besides himself when he came to act in a public situation, might probably consult some other interest than his own. Neutrality. They were a race of men, I hope in God the species is extinct, who, when they rose in their place, no man living could divine, from any known adherence to parties, to opinions, or to principles, from any order or system in their politics, or from any sequel or connection in their ideas, what part they were going to take in any debate. It is astonishing how much this uncertainty, especially at critical times, called the attention of all parties on such men. All eyes were fixed on them, all ears opened to hear them. Each party gaped and looked alternately for their vote, almost to the end of their speeches. While the House hung on this uncertainty, now the hear hymns rose from this side, now they rebellowed from the other, and that party, to whom they fell at length from their tremulous and dancing balance, always received them in a tempest of applause. The fortune of such men was a temptation too great to be resisted by one to whom a single whiff of incense withheld gave much greater pain than he received delight in the clouds of it which daily rose about him from the prodigal superstition of innumerable admirers. He was a candidate for contradictory honors, and his great aim was to make those agree in admiration of him who never agreed in anything else. Weakness in government. Let us learn from our experience. It is not support that is wanting to government, but reformation. When ministry rests upon public opinion, it is not indeed built upon a rock of adamant. It has, however, some stability. But when it stands upon private humor, its structure is of stubble, and its foundation is on quicksand. I repeat it again. He that supports every administration subverts all government. The reason is this. The whole business in which a court usually takes an interest goes on at present equally well in whatever hands, whether high or low, wise or foolish, scandalous or reputable. There is nothing, therefore, to hold it firm to any one body of men or to any one consistent scheme of politics. Nothing interposes to prevent the full operation of all the caprices and all the passions of a court upon the servants of the public. The system of administration is open to continual shocks and changes, upon the principles of the meanest cabal and the most contemptible intrigue. Nothing can be solid and permanent. All good men at length fly with horror from a, such a service. Men of rank and ability, with a spirit which ought to animate such men in a free state, while they decline the jurisdiction of dark cabal on their actions and their fortunes, will for both cheerfully put themselves upon their country. They will trust an inquisitive and distinguishing parliament, because it does inquire and does distinguish. If they act well, they know that, in such a parliament, they will be supported against any intrigue. If they act ill, they know that no intrigue can protect them. The situation, however awful, is honorable. But in one hour, and in the self-same assembly, without any assigned or assignable cause, to be precipitated from the highest authority to the most marked neglect, possibly into the greatest peril of life and reputation, is a situation full of danger and destitute of honor. It will be shunned equally by every man of prudence and every man of spirit. American Progress Nothing in the history of mankind is like their progress. For my part, I never cast an eye on their flourishing commerce and their cultivated and commodious life, but they seem to me rather ancient nations grown to perfection through a long series of fortunate events, and a train of successful industry accumulating wealth in many centuries 
than the colonies of yesterday, than a set of miserable outcasts a few years ago, not so much sent as thrown out on the bleak and barren shore of a desolate wilderness, 3,000 miles from all civilized intercourse. End of section 15. Section 16 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Combination, not faction. That connection and faction are equivalent terms is an opinion which has been carefully inculcated at all times by unconstitutional statesmen. The reason is evident. Whilst men are linked together, they easily and speedily communicate the alarm of any evil design. They are enabled to fathom it with common counsel and to oppose it with united strength. Whereas, when they lie dispersed, without concert, order, or discipline, communication is uncertain counsel difficult, and resistance impracticable. Where men are not acquainted with each other's principles, nor experienced in each other's talents, nor at all practiced in their mutual habitudes and dispositions by joint efforts in business, no personal confidence, no friendship, no common interest subsisting among them, it is evidently impossible that they can act a public part with uniformity, perseverance, or efficacy. In a connection, the most inconsiderable man, by adding to the weight of the whole, has his value and his use. Out of it, the greatest talents are wholly unserviceable to the public. No man who is not inflamed by vain glory into enthusiasm can flatter himself that his single, unsupported, desultory, unsystematic endeavors are of power to defeat the subtle designs and united cabals of ambitious citizens. When bad men combine, the good must associate, else they will fall, one by one, an unpitied sacrifice in a contemptible struggle. Great Men Great men are the guideposts and landmarks in the state. The credit of such men at court, or in the nation, is the sole cause of all the public measures. It would be an invidious thing, most foreign, I trust, to what you think my disposition, to remark the errors into which the authority of great names has brought the nation, without doing justice at the same time to the great qualities whence that authority arose. The subject is instructive to those who wish to form themselves on whatever of excellence has gone before them. There are many young members in the House, such of late has been the rapid succession of public men, who never saw that prodigy, Charles Townsend, nor, of course, know what a ferment he was able to excite in everything by the violent ebullition of his mixed virtues and failings. For failings he had undoubtedly, many of us remember them, we are this day considering the effect of them, but he had no failings which were not owing to a noble cause, to an ardent, generous, perhaps an immoderate passion for fame, a passion which is the instinct of all great souls. Power of Constituents The power of the people, within the laws, must show itself sufficient to protect every representative in the animated performance of his duty, or that duty cannot be performed. The House of Commons can never be a control on other parts of government unless they are controlled themselves by their constituents, and unless these constituents possess some right in the choice of that house, which it is not in the power of that house to take away. If they suffer this power of arbitrary incapacitation to stand, they have utterly perverted every other power of the House of Commons. The late proceeding, I will not say, is contrary to law. It must be so, for the power which is claimed cannot, by any possibility, be a legal power in any limited member of government. Influence of place in government. It is no inconsiderable part of wisdom to know how much of an evil ought to be tolerated, lest, by attempting a degree of purity impracticable in degenerate times 
and manners, instead of cutting off the subsisting ill practices, new corruptions might be produced for the concealment and security of the old. It were better, undoubtedly, that no influence at all could affect the mind of a member of Parliament. But of all modes of influence, in my opinion, a place under the government is the least disgraceful to the man who holds it, and by far the most safe to the country. I would not shut out that sort of influence which is open and visible, which is connected with the dignity and the service of the state, when it is not in my power to prevent the influence of contracts, of subscriptions, of direct bribery, and those innumerable methods of clandestine corruption which are abundantly in the hands of the court, and which will be applied as long as these means of corruption and the disposition to be corrupted have existence among us. Our Constitution stands on a nice equipoise, with steep precipices and deep waters upon all sides of it. In removing it from a dangerous leaning towards one side, there may be a risk of oversetting it on the other. Every project of a material change in a government so complicated as ours, combined at the same time with external circumstances still more complicated, is a matter full of difficulties, in which a considerate man will not be too ready to decide, a prudent man too ready to undertake, or an honest man too ready to promise. They do not respect the public nor themselves, who engage for more than they are sure that they ought to attempt, or that they are able to perform. Taxation involves principle. No man ever doubted that the commodity of tea could bear an imposition of threepence, but no commodity will bear threepence or will bear a penny when the general feelings of men are irritated and two millions of people are resolved not to pay. The feelings of the colonies were formerly the feelings of Great Britain. Theirs were formerly the feelings of Mr. Hampton, when called upon for the payment of twenty shillings. Would twenty shillings have ruined Mr. Hampton's fortune? No, but the payment of half twenty shillings, on the principle it was demanded, would have made him a slave. End of section 16. Section 17 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Good Member of Parliament. To be a good member of Parliament is, let me tell you, no easy task, especially at this time when there is so strong a disposition to run into the perilous extremes of servile compliance or wild popularity. To unite circumspection with vigor is absolutely necessary, but it is extremely difficult. We are now members for a rich commercial city. This city, however, is but a part of a rich commercial nation, the interests of which are various, multiform, and intricate. We are members for that great nation, which, however, is itself but part of a great empire, extended by our virtue and our fortune to the farthest limits of the East and of the West. All these widespread interests must be considered, must be compared, must be reconciled, if possible. We are members for a free country, and surely we all know that the machine of a free constitution is no simple thing but as intricate and as delicate as it is valuable. We are members in a great and ancient monarchy, and we must preserve religiously the true legal rights of the sovereign, which form the keystone that binds together the noble and well-constructed arch of our empire and our constitution. Fisheries of New England As to the wealth which the colonies have drawn from the sea by their fisheries, you had all that matter fully opened at your bar. You surely thought those acquisitions of value, for they seemed even to excite your envy, and yet the spirit by which that enterprising employment has been exercised ought rather, in my opinion, to have raised your esteem and admiration. And pray, sir, what in the world is equal to it? 
pass by the other parts and look at the manner in which the people of New England have of late carried on the whale fishery, whilst we follow them among the tumbling mountains of ice and behold them penetrating into the deepest frozen recesses of Hudson's Bay and Davis's Straits, whilst we are looking for them beneath the Arctic Circle, we hear that they have pierced into the opposite region of polar cold, that they are at the Antipodes, and engaged under the frozen serpent of the south. Falkland Island, which seemed too remote and romantic an object for the grasp of national ambition, is but a stage and resting place in the progress of the victorious industry. Nor is the equinoctial heat more discouraging to them than the accumulated winter of both the poles. We know that whilst some of them draw the line and strike the harpoon on the coast of Africa, others run the longitude and pursue their gigantic game along the coast of Brazil. No sea but what is vexed by their fisheries, no climate that is not witness to their toils. Neither the perseverance of Holland, nor the activity of France, nor the dexterous and firm sagacity of English enterprise ever carried this most perilous mode of hard industry to the extent to which it has been pushed by this recent people, a people who are still, as it were, but in the gristle, and not yet hardened into the bone of manhood. Preparation for Parliament When I first devoted myself to the public service, I considered how I should render myself fit for it, and this I did by endeavoring to discover what it was that gave this country the rank it holds in the world. I found that our prosperity and dignity arose principally, if not solely, from two sources, our constitution and commerce. Both these I have spared no study to understand and no endeavor to support. The distinguishing part of our constitution is its liberty. To preserve that liberty inviolate seems the particular duty and proper trust of a member of the House of Commons. But the liberty, the only liberty I mean, is a liberty connected with order, that not only exists along with order and virtue, but which cannot exist at all without them. It inheres in good and steady government, as in its substance and vital principle. The other source of our power is commerce, of which you are so large a part, and which cannot exist no more than your liberty without a connection with many virtues. It has ever been a very particular and a very favorite object of my study in its principles and in its details. I think many here are acquainted with the truth of what I say. This I know, that I have ever had my house open and my poor services ready for traders and manufacturers of every denomination. My favorite ambition is to have those services acknowledged. I now appear before you to make trial, whether my earnest endeavors have been so wholly impressed by the weakness of my abilities as to be rendered insignificant in the eyes of a great trading city, or whether you choose to give a weight to humble abilities for the sake of the honest exertions with which they are accompanied. This is my trial today. My industry is not on trial. Of my industry, I am sure, as far as my constitution of mind and body admitted. Bathurst in America's Future Let us, however, before we descend from this noble eminence, reflect that this growth of our national prosperity has happened within the short period of the life of man. It has happened within 68 years. There are those alive whose memory might touch the two extremities. For instance, my Lord Bathurst might remember all the stages of the progress. He was, in 1704, of an age at least to be made to comprehend such things. He was then old enough, acta parentum, jam leger, et qui sit poterit cognoscere virtus. Suppose, sir, that the angel of this auspicious youth, foreseeing the many virtues which made him one of the most amiable, as he is one of the most fortunate men of his age, had opened to him in vision that when, in the fourth generation, the third prince of the house of Brunswick had sat twelve years on the throne of that nation, which, by the happy issue of moderate and healing counsels, was to be made Great Britain, he should see his son, Lord Chancellor of England, 
turn back the current of hereditary dignity to its fountain and raise him to a higher rank of peerage whilst he enriched the family with a new one. If amidst these bright and happy scenes of domestic honor and prosperity, that angel should have drawn up the curtain and unfolded the rising glories of his country, and whilst he was gazing with admiration on the then commercial grandeur of England, the genius should point out to him a little speck, scarce visible in the mass of the national interest, a small seminal principle rather than a formed body, and should tell him, Young man, there is America, which at this day serves for little more than to amuse you with stories of savage men and uncouth manners, yet shall, before you taste of death, show itself equal to the whole of that commerce which now attracts the envy of the world. Whatever England has been growing to by a progressive increase of improvement brought in by varieties of people, by succession of civilizing conquests and civilizing settlements in a series of 1,700 years, you shall see as much added to her by America in the course of a single life. If this state of his country had been foretold to him, would it not require all the sanguine credulity of youth and all the fervid glow of enthusiasm to make him believe it? Fortunate man, he has lived to see it. Fortunate indeed if he lives to see nothing that shall vary the prospect and cloud the setting of his day. Candid Policy Refined policy ever has been the parent of confusion, and ever will be so, as long as the world endures. Plain good intention, which is as easily discovered at the first view as fraud is surely detected at last, is, let me say, of no mean force in the government of mankind. Genuine simplicity of heart is a healing and cementing principle. My plan, therefore, being formed upon the most simple grounds imaginable, may disappoint some people when they hear it. It has nothing to recommend it to the pruriency of curious ears. There is nothing at all new and captivating in it. It has nothing of the splendor of the project which has been lately laid upon your table by the noble lord in the blue riband. It does not propose to fill your lobby with squabbling colony agents who will require the interposition of your mace at every instant to keep the peace amongst them. It does not institute a magnificent auction of finance where captivated provinces come to general ransom by bidding against each other until you knock down the hammer and determine a proportion of payments beyond all the powers of algebra to equalize and settle. End of section 17. Section 18 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Wisdom of Concession. Peace implies reconciliation and where there has been a material dispute, reconciliation does, in a manner, always imply concession on the one part or the other. In this state of things, I make no difficulty in affirming that the proposal ought to originate from us. Great and acknowledged force is not impaired, either in effect or in opinion, by an unwillingness to exert itself. The superior power may offer peace with honor and with safety. Such an offer from such a power will be attributed to magnanimity. But the concessions of the weak are the concessions of fear. When such a one is disarmed, he is wholly at the mercy of his superior, and he loses forever that time and those chances which, as they happen to all men, are the strength and resources of all inferior power. Magnanimity as for the trifling petulance which the rage of party stirs up in little minds, though it should show itself even in this court, it has not made the slightest impression on me. The highest flight of such clamorous birds is winged in an inferior region of the air. We hear them and we look upon them, just as you, gentlemen, 
when you enjoy the serene air on your lofty rocks, look down upon the gulls that skim the mud of your river when it is exhausted of its tide. Duty of Representatives It ought to be the happiness and glory of a representative to live in the strictest union, the closest correspondence, and the most unreserved communication with his constituents. Their wishes ought to have great weight with him, their opinion high respect, their business unremitted attention. It is his duty to sacrifice his repose, his pleasures, his satisfactions to theirs, and above all, ever, and in all cases, to prefer their interests to his own. But his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he ought not to sacrifice to you, to any man, or to any set of men living. These he does not derive from your pleasure, no, nor from the law and the Constitution. They are a trust from providence, for the abuse of which he is deeply answerable. Your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays, instead of serving you, if he sacrifices it to your opinion. Prudential Silence Though I gave so far into his opinion that I immediately threw my thoughts into a sort of parliamentary form, I was by no means equally ready to produce them. It generally argues some degree of natural impotence of mind or some want of knowledge of the world to hazard plans of government except from a seat of authority. Propositions are made, not only ineffectually, but somewhat disreputably, when the minds of men are not properly disposed for their reception. And for my part, I am not ambitious of ridicule, not absolutely a candidate for disgrace. Colonial ties. They are our children, but when children ask for bread, we are not to give a stone. Is it because the natural resistance of things and the various mutations of time hinders our government or any scheme of government from being any more than a sort of approximation to the right? Is it therefore that the colonies are to recede from it infinitely? When this child of ours wishes to assimilate to its parent and to reflect with a true filial resemblance the beauteous countenance of British liberty, are we to turn to them the shameful parts of our Constitution? Are we to give them our weakness for their strength, our opprobrium for their glory, and the slough of slavery, which we are not able to work off, to serve them for their freedom? End of section 18. Section 19 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Government and Legislation. If government were a matter of will upon any side, yours, without question, ought to be superior. But government and legislation are matters of reason and judgment, and not of inclination. And what sort of reason is that in which the determination precedes the discussion, in which one set of men deliberate and another decide, and where those who form the conclusion are perhaps 300 miles distant from those who hear the arguments? Parliament Parliament is not a congress of ambassadors from different and hostile interests, which interests each must maintain as an agent and advocate against other agents and advocates. But Parliament is a deliberative assembly of one nation, with one interest, that of the whole, where not local purposes, not local prejudices ought to guide, but the general good, resulting from the general reason of the whole. You choose a member indeed, but when you have chosen him, he is not member of Bristol, but he is a member of Parliament. Moral Levelers This moral leveling is a servile principle. It leads to practical passive obedience far better than all the doctrines which the pliant accommodation of theology to power has ever produced. It cuts up by the roots 
not only all idea of forcible resistance, but even of civil opposition. It disposes men to an abject submission, not by opinion, which may be shaken by argument or altered by passion, but by the strong ties of public and private interest. For if all men who act in a public situation are equally selfish, corrupt, and venal, what reason can be given for desiring any sort of change, which, besides the evils which must attend all changes, can be productive of no possible advantage? The active men in the state are true samples of the mass. If they are universally depraved, the commonwealth itself is not sound. We may amuse ourselves with talking as much as we please of the virtue of middle or humble life. That is, we may place our confidence in the virtue of those who have never been tried. But if the persons who are continually emerging out of that sphere be no better than those whom birth has placed above it, what hopes are there in the remainder of the body which is to furnish the perpetual succession of the state? All who have ever written on government are unanimous that among a people generally corrupt, liberty cannot long exist. And indeed, how is it possible? When those who are to make the laws, to guard, to enforce, or to obey them, are, by a tacit confederacy of manners, indisposed to the spirit of all generous and noble institutions. Public Salary and Patriotic Service I am not possessed of an exact common measure between real service and its reward. I am very sure that states do sometimes receive services which it is hardly in their power to reward according to their worth. If I were to give my judgment with regard to this country, I do not think the great efficient offices of the state to be overpaid. The service of the public is a thing which cannot be put to auction and struck down to those who will agree to execute it the cheapest. When the proportion between reward and service is our object, we must always consider of what nature the service is, and what sort of men they are that must perform it. What is just payment for one kind of labor, and full encouragement for one kind of talents, is fraud and discouragement to others. Many of the great offices have much duty to do, and much expense of representation to maintain. A Secretary of State, for instance, must not appear sordid in the eyes of the ministers of other nations. Neither ought our ministers abroad to appear contemptible in the courts where they reside. In all offices of duty, there is almost necessarily a great neglect of all domestic affairs. A person in high office can rarely take a view of his family house. If he sees that the state takes no detriment, the state must see that his affairs should take as little. I will even go so far as to affirm that if men were willing to serve in such situations without salary, they ought not to be permitted to do it. Ordinary service must be secured by the motives to ordinary integrity. I do not hesitate to say that that state which lays its foundations in rare and heroic virtues will be sure to have its superstructure in the basest profligacy and corruption. An honorable and fair profit is the best security against avarice and rapacity. As in all things else, a lawful and regulated enjoyment is the best security against debauchery and excess. For as wealth is power, so all power will infallibly draw wealth to itself by some means or other. And when men are left no way of ascertaining their profits, but by their means of obtaining them, those means will be increased to infinity. This is true in all the parts of administration, as well as in the whole. If any individual were to decline his appointments, it might give an unfair advantage to ostentatious ambition over unpretending service. It might breed invidious comparisons. It might tend to destroy whatever little unity and agreement may be found among ministers. And after all, when an ambitious man had run down his competitors by a fallacious show of disinterestedness and fixed himself in power by that means, what security is there that he would not change his course and claim as an indemnity ten times more than he has given up? Rational Liberty 
Liberty, too, must be limited in order to be possessed. The degree of restraint it is impossible in any case to settle precisely, but it ought to be the constant aim of every wise public counsel to find out by cautious experiments and rational, cool endeavors with how little, not how much, of this restraint the community can subsist. For liberty is a good to be improved and not an evil to be lessened. It is not only a private blessing of the first order, but the vital spring and energy of the state itself, which is just so much life and vigor as there is liberty in it. But whether liberty be advantageous or not, for I know it is a fashion to decry the very principle, none will dispute that peace is a blessing, and peace must in the course of human affairs be frequently bought by some indulgence and toleration at least to liberty. For as the Sabbath, though of divine institution, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, government, which can claim no higher origin or authority, in its exercise at least, ought to conform to the exigencies of the time and the temper and character of the people with whom it is concerned, and not always to attempt violently to bend the people to their theories of subjection. The bulk of mankind, on their part, are not excessively curious concerning any theories whilst they are really happy, and one sure symptom of an ill-conducted state is the propensity of the people to resort to them. End of section 19. Section 20 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke Ireland and Magna Carta The feudal baronage and the feudal knighthood, the roots of our primitive constitution, were early transplanted into that soil, and grew and flourished there. Magna Carta, if it did not give us originally the House of Commons, gave us at least a house of commons of weight and consequence but your ancestors did not churlishly sit down alone to the feast of magna carta ireland was made immediately a partaker this benefit of english laws and liberties i confess was not at first extended to all ireland mark the consequence English authority and English liberty had exactly the same boundaries. Your standard could never be advanced an inch beyond your privileges. Sir John Davis shows, beyond a doubt, that the refusal of a general communication of these rights was the true cause why Ireland was five hundred years in subduing and after the vain projects of a military government attempted in the reign of queen elizabeth it was soon discovered that nothing could make that country english in civility and allegiance but your laws and your forms of legislature it was not english arms but the english constitution that conquered ireland from that time Ireland has ever had a general parliament, as she had before a partial parliament. You changed the people, you altered the religion, but you never touched the form or the vital substance of free government in that kingdom. You deposed kings, you restored them, you altered the succession to theirs as well as to your own crown but you never altered their constitution, the principle of which was respected by usurpation, restored with the restoration of monarchy, and established, I trust, for ever, by the glorious revolution. Colonies and British Constitution For that service, 
for all service whether of revenue trade or empire my trust is in her interest in the british constitution my hold of the colonies is in the close affection which grows from common names from kindred blood from similar privileges and equal protection these are ties which though light as air are as strong as links of iron let the colonies always keep the idea of their civil rights associated with your government they will cling and grapple to you and no force under heaven will be of power to tear them from their allegiance but let it be once understood that your government may be one thing and their privileges another that these two things may exist without any mutual relation the cement is gone the cohesion is loosened and everything hastens to decay and dissolution as long as you have the wisdom to keep the sovereign authority of this country as the sanctuary of liberty the sacred temple consecrated to our common faith wherever the chosen race and sons of england worship freedom they will turn their faces towards you the more they multiply the more friends you will have the more ardently they love liberty the more perfect will be their obedience slavery they can have anywhere it is a weed that grows in every soil they may have it from spain they may have it from prussia but until you become lost to all feeling of your true interest and your natural dignity freedom they can have from none but you this is the commodity of price of which you have the monopoly this is the true act of navigation which binds to you the commerce of the colonies and through them secures to you the wealth of the world deny them this participation of freedom and you break that sole bond which originally made and must still preserve the unity of the empire do not entertain so weak an imagination as that your registers and your bonds your affidavits and your sufferances your coquettes and your clearances are what form the great securities of your commerce do not dream that your letters of office and your instructions and your suspending clauses are the things that hold together the great contexture of this mysterious whole these things do not make your government dead instruments passive tools as they are it is the spirit of the english communion that gives all their life and efficacy to them it is the spirit of the english constitution which infused through the mighty mass pervades feeds unites invigorates vivifies every part of the empire even down to the minutest member reciprocal confidence at the first fatal opening of this contest the wisest course seemed to be to put an end as soon as possible to the immediate causes of the dispute and to quiet a discussion not easily settled upon clear principles and arising from claims which pride would permit neither party to abandon by resorting as nearly as possible to the old successful course a mere repeal of the obnoxious tax with a declaration of the legislative authority of this kingdom was then fully sufficient to procure peace to both sides man is a creature of habit and the first breach being of very short continuance the colonies fell back exactly into their ancient state the congress has used an expression with regard to this pacification 
which appears to me truly significant after the repeal of the stamp act the colonies fell says this assembly into their ancient state of unsuspecting confidence in the mother country this unsuspecting confidence is the true centre of gravity amongst mankind about which all the parts are at rest it is this unsuspecting confidence that removes all difficulties and reconciles all the contradictions which occur in the complexity of all ancient puzzled political establishments happy are the rulers which have the secret of preserving it pensions and the crown when men receive obligations from the crown through the pious hands of fathers or of connections as venerable as the paternal the dependencies which arise from thence are the obligations of gratitude and not the fetters of servility such ties originate in virtue and they promote it they continue men in those habitudes of friendship those political connections and those political principles in which they began life they are antidotes against a corrupt levity instead of causes of it what an unseemly spectacle would it afford what a disgrace would it be to the commonwealth that suffered such things to see the hopeful son of a meritorious minister begging his bread at the door of that treasury from whence his father dispensed the economy of an empire and promoted the happiness and glory of his country why should he be obliged to prostrate his honour and to submit his principles at the levy of some proud favourite shouldered and thrust aside by every impudent pretender on the very spot where a few days before he saw himself adored obliged to cringe to the author of the calamities of his house and to kiss the hands that are red with his father's blood colonial progress but nothing in progression can rest on its original plan we may as well think of rocking a grown man in the cradle of an infant therefore as the colonies prospered and increased to a numerous and mighty people spreading over a very great tract of the globe it was natural that they should attribute to assemblies so respectable in their formal constitution some part of the dignity of the great nations which they represented no longer tied to bylaws these assemblies made acts of all sorts and in all cases whatsoever they levied money not for parochial purposes but upon regular grants to the crown following all the rules and principles of a parliament to which they approached every day more and more nearly those who think themselves wiser than providence and stronger than the course of nature may complain of all this variation on the one side or the other as their several humours and prejudices may lead them but things could not be otherwise and english colonies must be had on these terms or not had at all end of section 20Section 21 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Feudal Principles and Modern Times in the first place it is formed in many respects upon feudal principles in the feudal times it was not uncommon even among subjects 
for the lowest offices to be held by considerable persons, persons as unfit by their incapacity as improper from their rank to occupy such employments. They were held by patent, sometimes for life, and sometimes by inheritance. If my memory does not deceive me, a person of no slight consideration held the office of patent hereditary cook to an Earl of Warwick. The Earl of Warwick's soups, I fear, were not the better for the dignity of his kitchen. I think it was an Earl of Gloucester who officiated as steward of the household to the Archbishops of Canterbury. Instances of the same kind may in some degree be found in the Northumberland House Book and other family records. There was some reason in ancient necessities for these ancient customs. Protection was wanted, and the domestic tie, thought not the highest, was the closest. The king's household has not only several strong traces of this feudality, but it is formed also upon the principles of a body corporate. It has its own magistrates, courts, and bylaws. This might be necessary in the ancient times in order to have a government within itself capable of regulating the vast and often unruly multitude which composed and attended it. This was the origin of the ancient court called the Green Cloth, composed of the marshal, treasurer, and other great officers of the household, with certain clerks. The rich subjects of the kingdom, who had formerly the same establishments, only on a reduced scale, have since altered their economy and turned the course of their expense from the maintenance of vast establishments within their walls to the employment of a great variety of independent trades abroad. Their influence is lessened, but a mode of accommodation and a style of splendor suited to the manners of the times has been increased. Royalty itself has insensibly followed, and the royal household has been carried away by the resistless tide of manners, but with this very material difference. Private men have got rid of the establishments along with the reasons of them, whereas the royal household has lost all that was stately and venerable in the antique manners without retrenching anything of the cumbrous charge of a Gothic establishment. It is shrunk into the polished littleness of modern elegance and personal accommodation, it has evaporated from the gross concrete into an essence and rectified spirit of expense where you have tons of ancient pomp in a vial of modern luxury. Restrictive Virtues I know that all parsimony is of a quality approaching to unkindness and that, on some person or other, every reform must operate as a sort of punishment. Indeed, the whole class of the severe and restrictive virtues are at a market almost too high for humanity. What is worse, there are very few of those virtues which are not capable of being imitated and even outdone in many of their most striking effects by the worst of vices. Malignity and envy will carve much more deeply and finish much more sharply in the work of retrenchment than frugality and providence. I do not, therefore, wonder that gentlemen have kept away from such a task as well from good nature as from prudence. Private feeling might, indeed, be overborne by legislative reason, and a man of a long-sighted and a strong-nerved humanity might bring himself not so much to consider from whom he takes a superfluous enjoyment as for whom, in the end, he may preserve the absolute necessaries of life. Libelers of Human Nature I hope there are none of you corrupted with a doctrine taught by wicked men for the worst purposes and received by the malignant credulity of envy and ignorance, which is that the men who act upon the public stage are all alike, all equally corrupt, all influenced by no other views than the sordid lure of salary and pension, the thing I know by experience to be false, never expecting to find perfection in men, and not looking for divine attributes in created beings, in my commerce with my contemporaries, I have found much human virtue. I have seen not a little public spirit, a real subordination of interest to duty, and a decent and regulated sensibility to honest fame and reputation. The age unquestionably produces, 
whether in a greater or lesser number than former times, I know not, daring profligates and insidious hypocrites. What then? Am I not to avail myself of whatever good is to be found in the world because of the mixture of evil that will always be in it? The smallness of the quantity and currency only heightens the value. They who raise suspicions on the good on account of the behavior of ill men are of the party of the latter. The common cant is no justification for taking this party. I have been deceived, say they, by Titius and Movius. I have been the dupe of this pretender or of that mountebank, and I can trust appearances no longer. But my credulity and want of discernment cannot, as I conceive, amount to a fair presumption against any man's integrity. A conscientious person would rather doubt his own judgment than condemn his species. He would say, I have observed without attention or judged upon erroneous maxims. I trusted to profession when I ought to have attended to conduct. Such a man will grow wise, not malignant, by his acquaintance with the world. But he that accuses all mankind of corruption ought to remember that he is sure to convict only one. In truth, I should much rather admit those whom at any time I have disrelished the most to be patterns of perfection than seek a consolation to my own unworthiness in a general communion of depravity with all about me. Refusal a revenue. What, says the financier, is peace to us without money? Your plan gives us no revenue. No, but it does, for it secures to the subject the power of refusal, the first of all revenues. Experience is a cheat, and in fact a liar, if this power in the subject of proportioning his grant or if not granting at all, has not been found the richest mine of revenue ever discovered by the skill or by the fortune of man. It does not indeed vote you 152,752 pounds, 11 shillings, and two and three quarter pence, nor any other paltry limited sum, but it gives the strong box itself, the fund, the bank, from whence only revenues can arise amongst a people sensible of freedom. Posita luditur arca. Cannot you in England, cannot you at this time of day, cannot you, a house of commons, trust to the principle which has raised so mighty a revenue and accumulated a debt of near 140 millions in this country? Is this principle to be true in England and false everywhere else? Is it not true in Ireland? Has it not hitherto been true in the colonies? Why should you presume that in any country a body duly constituted for any function will neglect to perform its duty and abdicate its trust? Such a presumption would go against all governments in all modes. But in truth, this dread of penury of supply from a free assembly has no foundation in nature. For first observe that besides the desire which all men have naturally of supporting the honor of their own government, that sense of dignity and that security to property which ever attend freedom have a tendency to increase the stock of the free community. Most may be taken where most is accumulated, and what is the soil or climate where experience has not uniformly proved that the voluntary flow of heaped-up plenty bursting from the weight of its own rich luxuriance, has ever run with a more copious stream of revenue than could be squeezed from the dry husks of oppressed indigence by the straining of all the politic machinery in the world. A Party Man The only method which has ever been found effectual to preserve any man against the corruption of nature and example is a habit of life and communication of counsels with the most virtuous and public-spirited men of the age you live in. Such a society cannot be kept without advantage or deserted without shame. For this rule of conduct, I may be called in reproach a party man, but I am little affected with such aspersions. In the way which they call party, I worship the constitution of your fathers, and I shall never blush for my political company. All reverence to honor, all idea of what it is will be lost out of the world before it can be imputed as a fault to any man 
that he has been closely connected with those incomparable persons, living and dead, with whom for eleven years I have constantly thought and acted. If I have wandered out of the paths of rectitude into those of interested faction, it was in company with the Savilles, the Dowdswells, the Wentworths, the Bentics, with the Lennoxes, the Manchesters, the Keppels, the Saunderses, with the temperate, permanent, hereditary virtue of the whole house of Cavendish, names among which some have extended your fame and empire in arms, and all have fought the battle of your liberties in fields not less glorious. These, and many more like these, grafting public principles on private honor, have redeemed the present age, and would have adorned the most splendid period in your history. End of section 21. Section 22 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Patriotism and Public Income. Is it not the same virtue which does everything for us here in England? Do you imagine, then, that it is the land tax which raises your revenue, that it is the annual vote in the Committee of Supply which gives you your army, or that it is the mutiny bill which inspires it with bravery and discipline? No, surely no. It is the love of the people. It is their attachment to their government from the sense of the deep stake they have in such a glorious institution which gives you your army and your navy and infuses into both that liberal obedience without which your army would be a base rabble and your navy nothing but rotten timber. All this, I know well enough, will sound wild and chimerical to the profane herd of those vulgar and mechanical politicians who have no place among us, a sort of people who think that nothing exists but what is gross and material, and who, therefore, far from being qualified to be directors of the great movement of empire, are not fit to turn a wheel in the machine. But to men truly initiated and rightly taught, these ruling and master principles, which, in the opinion of such men as I have mentioned, have no substantial existence, are in truth everything and all in all. Magnanimity in politics is not seldom the truest wisdom, and a great empire and little minds go ill together. If we are conscious of our situation and glow with zeal to fill our places as becomes our station and ourselves, we ought to auspicate all our public proceedings on America with the old warning of the church, Sursum Corda, we ought to elevate our minds to the greatness of that trust to which the order of providence has called us. By adverting to the dignity of this high calling, our ancestors have turned a savage wilderness into a glorious empire, and have made the most extensive and the only honorable conquests, not by destroying, but by promoting the wealth, the number, the happiness of the human race." Let us get an American revenue as we have got an American empire. English privileges have made it all that it is. English privileges alone will make it all it can be. American Protestantism. If anything were wanting to this necessary operation of the form of government, religion would have given it a complete effect. Religion, always a principle of energy, and this new people is no way worn out or impaired and their mode of professing it is also one main cause of this free spirit. The people are Protestants, and of that kind which is the most adverse to all implicit submission of mind and opinion. This is a persuasion not only favorable to liberty, but built upon it. I do not think, sir, that the reason of this averseness in the dissenting churches from all that looks like absolute government is so much to be sought in their religious tenets as in their history. Everyone knows that the Roman Catholic religion is at least coeval with most of the governments where it prevails, 
that it has generally gone hand in hand with them and received great favor and every kind of support from authority. The Church of England, too, was formed from her cradle under the nursing care of regular government. But the dissenting interests have sprung up in direct opposition to all the ordinary powers of the world and could justify that opposition only on a strong claim to natural liberty. Their very existence depended on the powerful and unremitted assertion of that claim. All Protestantism, even the most cold and passive, is a sort of dissent. But the religion most prevalent in our northern colonies is a refinement on the principle of resistance. It is the dissidence of dissent and the Protestantism of the Protestant religion. Right of Taxation I am resolved this day to have nothing at all to do with the question of the right of taxation. Some gentlemen startle, but it is true. I put it totally out of the question. It is less than nothing in my consideration. I do not indeed wonder, nor will you, sir, that gentlemen of profound learning are fond of displaying it on this profound subject. But my consideration is narrow, confined, and wholly limited to the policy of the question. I do not examine whether the giving away a man's money be a power accepted and reserved out of the general trust of government, and how far all mankind, in all forms of polity, are entitled to an exercise of that right by the charter of nature, or whether, on the contrary, a right of a taxation is necessarily involved in the general principle of legislation and inseparable from the ordinary supreme power. These are deep questions where great names militate against each other, where reason is perplexed, and an appeal to authorities only thickens the confusion. For high and reverend authorities lift up their heads on both sides, and there is no sure footing in the middle. This point is the great Serbonian bog, betwixt Damiata and Mount Cassius Old, where armies whole have sunk. I do not intend to be overwhelmed in that bog, though in such respectable company. The question with me is not whether you have a right to render your people miserable, but whether it is not your interest to make them happy. It is not what a lawyer tells me I may do, but what humanity, reason, and justice tell me I ought to do. Is a politic act the worse for being a generous one? Is no concession proper but that which is made from your want of right to keep what you grant? Or does it lessen the grace or dignity of relaxing in the exercise of an odious claim because you have your evidence room full of titles and your magazines stuffed with arms to enforce them? What signify all those titles and all those arms? Of what avail are they when the reason of the thing tells me that the assertion of my title is the loss of my suit, and that I could do nothing but wound myself by the use of my own weapons. Contracted Views It is exceedingly common for men to contract their love to their country into an attachment to its petty subdivisions, and they sometimes even cling to their provincial abuses as if they were franchises and local privileges. Accordingly, in places where there is much of this kind of estate, Persons will be always found who would rather trust to their talents in recommending themselves to power for the renewal of their interests than to encumber their purses, though never so lightly, in order to transmit independence to their posterity. It is a great mistake that the desire of securing property is universal among mankind. Gaming is a principle inherent in human nature. It belongs to us all. I would therefore break those tables. I would furnish no evil occupation for that spirit. I would make every man look everywhere, except to the intrigue of a court, for the improvement of his circumstances or the security of his fortune. Assimilating Power of Contact I am sure that the only means of checking precipitate degeneracy is heartily to concur with whatever is the best in our time and to have some more correct standard of judging what that best is than the transient and uncertain favor of a court. If once we are able to find and can prevail on ourselves to strengthen a union of such men, 
whatever accidentally becomes indisposed to ill-exercised power, even by the ordinary operation of human passions, must join with that society and cannot long be joined without in some degree assimilating to it. Virtue will catch as well as vice by contact, and the public stock of honest, manly principle will daily accumulate. We are not too nicely to scrutinize motives as long as action is irreproachable. It is enough, and for a worthy man, perhaps too much, to deal out its infamy to convicted guilt and declared apostasy. End of section 22. Section 23 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Prudence of Timely Reform. But there is a time when men will not suffer bad things because their ancestors have suffered worse. There is a time when the hoary head of inveterate abuse will neither draw reverence nor obtain protection. If the noble lord in the blue riband pleads not guilty to the charges brought against the present system of public economy, it is not possible to give a fair verdict by which he will not stand acquitted. But pleading is not our present business. His plea or his traverse may be allowed as an answer to a charge when a charge is made. But if he puts himself in the way to obstruct reformation, then the faults of his office instantly become his own. Instead of a public officer in an abusive department whose province is an object to be regulated, he becomes a criminal who is to be punished. I do most seriously put it to administration to consider the wisdom of a timely reform. Early reformations are amicable arrangements with a friend in power. Late reformations are terms imposed upon a conquered enemy. Early reformations are made in cool blood. Late reformations are made under a state of inflammation. In that state of things, people behold in government nothing that is respectable. They see the abuse, and they will see nothing else. They fall into the temper of a furious populace provoked at the disorder of a house of ill fame. They never attempt to correct or regulate. They go to work by the shortest way. They abate the nuisance. They pull down the house. Difficulties of Reformers Nothing, you know, is more common than for men to wish and call loudly, too, for a reformation, who, when it arrives, do by no means like the severity of its aspect. Reformation is one of those pieces which must be put at some distance in order to please. Its greatest favorers love it better in the abstract than in the substance. When any old prejudice of their own or any interest that they value is touched, they become scrupulous, they become captious, and every man has his separate exception. Some pluck out the black hairs, some the gray. One point must be given up to one. Another point must be yielded to another. Nothing is suffered to prevail upon its own principle. The whole is so frittered down and disjointed that scarcely a trace of the original scheme remains. Thus, between the resistance of power and the unsystematical process of popularity, the undertaker and the undertaking are both exposed, and the poor reformer is hissed off the stage both by friends and foes. Philosophy of Commerce If honesty be true policy with regard to the transient interest of individuals, it is much more certainly so with regard to the permanent interests of communities. I know that it is but too natural for us to see our own certain ruin in the possible prosperity of other people. It is hard to persuade us that everything which is got by another is not taken from ourselves. But it is fit that we should get the better of these suggestions, which come from what is not the best and soundest part of our nature, and that we should form to ourselves a way of thinking more rational, more just, and more religious. Trade is not a limited thing, as if the objects of mutual demand and consumption 
could not stretch beyond the bounds of our jealousies, God has given the earth to the children of men, and he has undoubtedly, in giving it to them, given them what is abundantly sufficient for all their exigencies, not a scanty, but a most liberal provision for them all. The author of our nature has written it strongly in that nature, and has promulgated the same law in his written word that man shall eat his bread by his labor. And I am persuaded that no man and no combination of men, for their own ideas of their particular profit, can, without great impiety, undertake to say that he shall not do so, that they have no sort of right either to prevent the labor or to withhold the bread. Theorizing Politicians There are people who have split and anatomized the doctrine of free government as if it were an abstract question concerning metaphysical liberty and necessity and not a matter of moral prudence and natural feeling. They have disputed whether liberty be a positive or a negative idea, whether it does not consist in being governed by laws without considering what are the laws or who are the makers, whether man has any rights by nature, and whether all the property he enjoys be not the alms of his government and his life itself their favor and indulgence. Others corrupting religion, as these have perverted philosophy, contend that Christians are redeemed into captivity, and the blood of the Savior of mankind has been shed to make them the slaves of a few proud and insolent sinners. These shocking extremes, provoking to extremes of another kind, speculations are let loose as destructive to all authority, as the former are to all freedom, and every government is called tyranny and usurpation, which is not formed on their fancies. In this manner, the stirs up of this contention not satisfied with distracting our dependencies and filling them with blood and slaughter, are corrupting our understandings. They are endeavoring to tear up, along with practical liberty, all the foundations of human society, all equity and justice, religion and order. Economy and Public Spirit Economy and Public Spirit have made a beneficent and an honest spoil. They have plundered from extravagance and luxury, for the use of substantial service, a revenue of near 400,000 pounds. The reform of the finances, joined to this reform of the court, gives to the public 900,000 pounds a year and upwards. The minister who does these things is a great man, but the king who desires that they should be done is a far greater. We must do justice to our enemies. These are the acts of a patriot king. I am not in dread of the vast armies of France. I am not in dread of the gallant spirit of its brave and numerous nobility. I am not alarmed even at the great navy which has been so miraculously created. All these things Louis the Fourteenth had before. With all these things, the French monarchy has more than once fallen prostrate at the feet of the public faith of Great Britain. It was the want of public credit which disabled France from recovering after her defeats, or recovering even from her victories and triumphs. It was a prodigal court. It was an ill-ordered revenue that sapped the foundations of all her greatness. Credit cannot exist under the arm of necessity. Necessity strikes at credit, I allow, with a heavier and quicker blow under an arbitrary monarchy than under a limited and balanced government, but still necessity and credit are natural enemies and cannot be long reconciled in any situation. From necessity and corruption, a free state may lose the spirit of that complex constitution which is the foundation of confidence. End of section 23. Section 24 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Reform ought to be progressive. Whenever we improve, it is right to leave room for a further improvement. It is right to consider, to look about us, to examine the effect of what we have done. 
then we can proceed with confidence because we can proceed with intelligence, whereas in hot reformations, in what men more zealous than considerate call making clear work, the whole is generally so crude, so harsh, so indigested, mixed with so much imprudence and so much injustice, so contrary to the whole course of human nature and human institutions that the very people who are most eager for it are among the first to grow disgusted at what they have done. Then some part of the abdicated grievance is recalled from its exile in order to become a corrective of the correction. Then the abuse assumes all the credit and popularity of a reform. The very idea of purity and disinterestedness in politics falls into disrepute and is considered as a vision of hot and inexperienced men, and thus disorders become incurable, not by the virulence of their own quality, but by the unapt and violent nature of the remedies. A great part, therefore, of my idea of reform is meant to operate gradually. Some benefits will come at a nearer, some at a more remote period. We must no more make haste to be rich by parsimony than by intemperate acquisition. Civil freedom. Civil freedom, gentlemen, is not, as many have endeavored to persuade you, a thing that lies hid in the depth of abstruse science. It is a blessing and a benefit, not an abstract speculation, and all the just reasoning that can be upon it is of so coarse a texture as perfectly to suit the ordinary capacities of those who are to enjoy and of those who are to defend it. Far from any resemblance to those propositions in geometry and metaphysics which admit no medium but must be true or false in all their latitude, social and civil freedom, like all other things in common life, are variously mixed and modified, enjoyed in very different degrees, and shaped into an infinite diversity of forms according to the temper and circumstances of every community. The extreme of liberty, which is its abstract perfection but its real fault, obtains nowhere, nor ought to obtain anywhere, because extremes, as we all know, in every point which relates either to our duties or satisfactions in life, are destructive both to virtue and enjoyment. Tendencies of Power When any community is subordinately connected with another, the great danger of the connection is the extreme pride and self-complacency of the superior, which in all matters of controversy will probably decide in its own favor. It is a powerful corrective to such a very rational cause of fear if the inferior body can be made to believe that the party inclination or political views of several in the principal state will induce them in some degree to counteract this blind and tyrannical partiality. There is no danger that anyone acquiring consideration or power in the presiding state should carry this leaning to the inferior too far. The fault of human nature is not of that sort. Power, in whatever hands, is rarely guilty of too strict limitations on itself. But one great advantage to the support of authority attends such an amicable and protecting connection, that those who have conferred favors obtain influence, and from the foresight of future events can persuade men who have received obligations sometimes to return them. Thus, by the mediation of those healing principles, call them good or evil, troublesome discussions are brought to some sort of adjustment, and every hot controversy is not a civil war. Individual Good and Public Benefit The individual good felt in a public benefit is comparatively so small comes round through such an involved labyrinth of intricate and tedious revolutions, whilst a present personal detriment is so heavy where it falls and so instant in its operation that the cold commendation of a public advantage never was and never will be a match for the quick sensibility of a private loss. And you may depend on it, sir, that when many people have an interest in railing, sooner or later, they will bring a considerable degree of unpopularity upon any measure, so that, for the present at least, the Reformation will operate against the Reformers, and revenge, as against them at the least, will produce all the effects of corruption. 
public corruption. Nor is it the worst effect of this unnatural contention that our laws are corrupted. Whilst manners remain entire, they will correct the vices of law and soften it at length to their own temper. But we have to lament that in most of the late proceedings we see very few traces of that generosity, humanity, and dignity of mind which formerly characterized this nation. War suspends the rules of moral obligation, and what is long suspended is in danger of being totally abrogated. Civil wars strike deepest of all into the manners of the people. They vitiate their politics. They corrupt their morals. They pervert even the natural taste and relish of equity and justice. By teaching us to consider our fellow citizens in a hostile light, the whole body of our nation becomes gradually less dear to us. The very names of affection and kindred, which were the bond of charity whilst we agreed, become new incentives to hatred and rage when the communion of our country is dissolved. We may flatter ourselves that we shall not fall into this misfortune, but we have no charter of exemption that I know of from the ordinary frailties of our nature. End of section 24. Section 25 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Cruelty and Cowardice. A conscientious man would be cautious how he dealt in blood. He would feel some apprehension at being called to a tremendous account for engaging in so deep a play without any sort of knowledge of the game. It is no excuse for presumptuous ignorance that it is directed by insolent passion. The poorest being that crawls on earth, contending to save itself from injustice and oppression, is an object respectable in the eyes of God and man. But I cannot conceive any existence under heaven which, in the depths of its wisdom, tolerates all sorts of things, that is more truly odious and disgusting than an impotent, helpless creature without civil wisdom or military skill, without a consciousness of any other qualification for power but his servility to it, bloated with pride and arrogance, calling for battles which he is not to fight, contending for a violent dominion which he can never exercise, and satisfied to be himself mean and miserable in order to render others contemptible and wretched. Bad laws produce base subserviency. Bad laws are the worst sort of tyranny. In such a country as this, they are of all bad things the worst, worse by far than anywhere else, and they derive a particular malignity even from the wisdom and soundness of the rest of our institutions. For very obvious reasons, you cannot trust the crown with a dispensing power over any of your laws. However, a government, be it as bad as it may, will, in the exercise of a discretionary power, discriminate times and persons, and will not ordinarily pursue any man when its own safety is not concerned. A mercenary informer knows no distinction. Under such a system, the obnoxious people are slaves, not only to the government, but they live at the mercy of every individual. They are at once the slaves of the whole community and of every part of it, and the worst and most unmerciful men are those on whose goodness they most depend. In this situation, men not only shrink from the frowns of a stern magistrate, but they are obliged to fly from their very species. The seeds of destruction are sown in civil intercourse and social habitudes. The blood of wholesome kindred is infected. Their tables and beds are surrounded with snares. All the means given by providence to make life safe and comfortable are perverted into instruments of terror and torment. This species of universal subserviency that makes the very servant who waits behind your chair the arbiter of your life and fortune has such a tendency to degrade and abase mankind and to deprive them of that assured and liberal state of mind which alone can make us what we ought to be, that I vow to God 
I would sooner bring myself to put a man to immediate death for opinions I disliked, and so to get rid of the man and his opinions at once, than to fret him with a feverish being, tainted with the jail distemper of a contagious servitude, to keep him above ground an animated mass of putrefaction, corrupted himself and corrupting all about him. False Regret If we repent of our good actions, what, I pray you, is left for our faults and follies? It is not the beneficence of the laws. It is the unnatural temper which beneficence can fret and sour that is to be lamented. It is this temper which, by all rational means, ought to be sweetened and corrected. If froward men should refuse this cure, can they vitiate anything but themselves? Does evil so react upon good as not only to retard its motion, but to change its nature? If it can so operate, then good men will always be in the power of the bad, and virtue, by a dreadful reverse of order, must lie under perpetual subjection and bondage to vice. British Dominion in East India With very few, and those inconsiderable intervals, the British Dominion, either in the company's name or in the names of princes absolutely dependent upon the company, extends from the mountains that separate India from Tartary to Cape Camoran, that is, one and twenty degrees of latitude. In the northern parts, it is a solid mass of land, about 800 miles in length and four or 500 broad. As you go southward, it becomes narrower for space. It afterwards dilates, but narrower or broader, you possess the whole eastern and northeastern coast of that vast country, quite from the borders of Pegu. Bengal, Bahar, and Orissa, with Benares, now unfortunately in our immediate possession, measure 161,978 square English miles, a territory considerably larger than the whole kingdom of France. Oude, with its dependent provinces, is 53,286 square miles, not a great deal less than England. The Carnatic, with Tanjore and the Sirkars, is 65,948 square miles, very considerably larger than England, and the whole of the company's dominions, comprehending Bombay and Salset, amounts to 281,412 square miles, which forms a territory larger than any European dominion, Russia and Turkey excepted. Through all that vast extent of country, there is not a man who eats a mouthful of rice but by permission of the East India Company. So far with regard to the extent, the population of this great empire is not easily to be calculated. When the countries of which it is composed came into our possession, they were all eminently peopled and eminently productive, though at that time considerably declined from their ancient prosperity. But since they are come into our hands, however, if we make the period of our estimate immediately before the utter desolation of the Carnatic, and if we allow for the havoc which our government had even then made in these regions, we cannot, in my opinion, rate the population at much less than 30 millions of souls, more than four times the number of persons in the island of Great Britain. My next inquiry to that of the number is the quality and description of the inhabitants. This multitude of men does not consist of an abject and barbarous populace, much less of gangs of savages like the Guaranis and Chiquitos who wander on the waste borders of the river of Amazons or the Plate, but a people for ages civilized and cultivated, cultivated by all the arts of polished life, whilst we were yet in the woods. There have been, and still the skeletons remain, princes once of great dignity, authority, and opulence. There are to be found the chiefs of tribes and nations. There is to be found an ancient and venerable priesthood, the depository of their laws, learning, and history, the guides of the people whilst living, and their consolation in death, a nobility of great antiquity and renown, a multitude of cities, not exceeded in population and trade by those of the first class in Europe, merchants and bankers, 
individual houses of whom have once vied in capital with the Bank of England, whose credit had often supported a tottering state and preserved their governments in the midst of war and desolation. Millions of ingenious manufacturers and mechanics, millions of the most diligent and not the least intelligent tillers of the earth. There are to be found almost all the religions professed by men, the Brahminical, the Musulman, the Eastern and the Western Christian. If I were to take the whole aggregate of our possessions there, I should compare it as the nearest parallel I can find with the Empire of Germany. Our immediate possessions I should compare with the Austrian dominions, and they would not suffer in the comparison. The Nabob of Oud might stand for the King of Prussia. The Nabob of Arkot I would compare as superior in territory and equal in revenue to the Elector of Saxony. Chait Singh, the Raja of Benares, might well rank with the Prince of Hesse, at least, and the Raja of Tanjore, though hardly equal in extent of dominion, superior in revenue, to the Elector of Bavaria. The Polygars and the Northern Zamindars and other great chiefs might well class with the rest of the princes, dukes, counts, marquises, and bishops in the empire, all of whom I mention to honor and surely without disparagement to any or all of those most respectable princes and grandees. All this vast mass, composed of so many orders and classes of men, is again infinitely diversified by manners, by religion, by hereditary employment, through all their possible combinations. This renders the handling of India a matter in a high degree critical and delicate. But, oh, it has been handled rudely indeed. Even some of the reformers seem to have forgot that they had anything to do but to regulate the tenants of a manor or the shopkeepers of the next county town. It is an empire of this extent, of this complicated nature, of this dignity and importance that I have compared to Germany. And the German government, not for an exact resemblance, but as a sort of a middle term by which India might be approximated to our understandings and, if possible, to our feelings, in order to awaken something of sympathy for the unfortunate natives of which I am afraid we are not perfectly susceptible whilst we look at this very remote object through a false and cloudy medium. Political Charity Honest men will not forget either their merit or their sufferings. There are men, and many I trust there are, who, out of love to their country and their kind, would torture their invention to find excuses for the mistakes of their brethren, and who, to stifle dissension, would construe even doubtful appearances with the utmost favor. Such men will never persuade themselves to be ingenious and refined in discovering disaffection and treason in the manifest palpable signs of suffering loyalty. Persecution is so unnatural to them that they gladly snatch the very first opportunity of laying aside all the tricks and devices of penal politics and of returning home after all their irksome and vexatious wanderings to our natural family mansion, to the grand social principle that unites all men in all descriptions under the shadow of an equal and impartial justice. End of section 25. Section 26 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Evils of Distraction The very attempt towards pleasing everybody discovers a temper always flashy and often false and insincere. Therefore, as I have proceeded straight onward in my conduct, so I will proceed on my account of those parts of it which have been most accepted to. But I must first beg leave just to hint to you that we may suffer very great detriment by being open to every talker. It is not to be imagined how much of service is lost from spirits full of activity and full of energy who are pressing who are rushing forward to great and capital objects, 
when you oblige them to be continually looking back. Whilst they are defending one service, they defraud you of an hundred. Applaud us when we run, console us when we fall, cheer us when we recover, but let us pass on. For God's sake, let us pass on. Charles Fox. And now, having done my duty to the bill, let me say a word to the author. I should leave him to his own noble sentiments if the unworthy and illiberal language with which he has been treated beyond all example of parliamentary liberty did not make a few words necessary, not so much in justice to him as to my own feelings. I must say, then, that it will be a distinction honorable to the age that the rescue of the greatest number of the human race that ever were so grievously oppressed from the greatest tyranny that was ever exercised has fallen to the lot of abilities and dispositions equal to the task, that it has fallen to one who has the enlargement to comprehend, the spirit to undertake, and the eloquence to support so great a measure of hazardous benevolence. His spirit is not owing to his ignorance of the state of men and things. He well knows what snares are spread about his path, from personal animosity, from court intrigues, and possibly from popular delusion. But he has put to hazard his ease, his security, his interest, his power, even his darling popularity, for the benefit of a people whom he has never seen. This is the road that all heroes have trod before him. He has traduced and abused for his supposed motives. He will remember that obloquy is a necessary ingredient in the composition of all true glory. He will remember that it was not only in the Roman customs, but it is in the nature and constitution of things that calumny and abuse are essential parts of triumph. These thoughts will support a mind which only exists for honor under the burthen of temporary reproach. He is doing indeed a great good, such as rarely falls to the lot and almost as rarely coincides with the desires of any man. Let him use his time. Let him give the whole length of the reins to his benevolence. He is now on a great eminence where the eyes of mankind are turned to him. He may live long, he may do much, but here is the summit. He never can exceed what he does this day. He has faults, but they are faults that, though they may in a small degree tarnish the luster and sometimes impede the march of his abilities, have nothing in them to extinguish the fire of great virtues. In those faults there is no mixture of deceit, of hypocrisy, of pride, of ferocity, of complexional despotism, or want of feeling for the distresses of mankind. His are faults which might exist in a descendant of Henry the Fourth of France, as they did exist in that father of his country. Henry the Fourth wished that he might live to see a fowl in the pot of every peasant in his kingdom. That sentiment of homely benevolence was worth all the splendid sayings that are recorded of kings. But he wished perhaps for more than could be obtained, and the goodness of the man exceeded the power of the king. But this gentleman, a subject, may this day say this at least with truth, that he secures the rice in his pot to every man in India. A poet of antiquity thought it one of the first distinctions to a prince whom he meant to celebrate that through a long succession of generations he had been the progenitor of an able and virtuous citizen who by force of the arts of peace had corrected governments of oppression and suppressed wars of rapine. Indole pro quanta juvenis quantum que deteris. Orsone populus ventura in secula civum. Il super gangum super exauditus et indus. Implebit teres voce et ferialia bea. Fumin compesit lingue. This was what was said of the predecessor of the only person to whose eloquence it does not wrong that of the mover of this bill to be compared. But the Ganges and the Indus are the patrimony of the fame of my honorable friend, and not of Cicero. I confess, I anticipate with joy the reward of those whose whole consequence, power, and authority exist only for the benefit of mankind, and I carry my mind to all the people, and all the names and descriptions 
that relieved by this bill will bless the labors of this Parliament and the confidence which the best House of Commons has given to him who the best deserves it. The little cavils of party will not be heard, where freedom and happiness will be felt. There is not a tongue, a nation, or religion in India which will not bless the presiding care and manly beneficence of this house, and of him who proposes to you this great work. Your names will never be separated before the throne of the divine goodness, in whatever language or with whatever rites pardon is asked for sin, and reward for those who imitate the Godhead in his universal bounty to his creatures. These honors you deserve, and they will surely be paid, when all the jargon of influence and party and patronage are swept into oblivion. The Impracticable Undesirable I know it is common for men to say that such and such things are perfectly right, very desirable, but that, unfortunately, they are not practicable. Oh, no, sir, no. Those things which are not practicable are not desirable. There is nothing in the world really beneficial that does not lie within the reach of an informed understanding and a well-directed pursuit. There is nothing that God has judged good for us that he has not given us the means to accomplish, both in the natural and the moral world. If we cry like children for the moon, like children, we must cry on. Constitution of the Commons The late House of Commons has been punished for its independence. That example is made. Have we an example on record of a House of Commons punished for its servility? The rewards of a Senate so disposed are manifest to the world. Several gentlemen are very desirous of altering the constitution of the House of Commons, but they must alter the frame and constitution of human nature itself before they can so fashion it by any mode of election that its conduct will not be influenced by reward and punishment, by fame and by disgrace. If these examples take root in the minds of men, what members hereafter will be bold enough not to be corrupt? especially as the king's highway of obsequiousness is so very broad and easy. To make a passive member of Parliament, no dignity of mind, no principles of honor, no resolution, no ability, no industry, no learning, no experience are in the least degree necessary. To defend a post of importance against a powerful enemy requires an Elliot. A drunken invalid is qualified to hoist a white flag or to deliver up the keys of the fortress on his knees. Emoluments of Office No man knows, when he cuts off the incitements to a virtuous ambition and the just rewards of public service, what infinite mischief he may do his country through all generations. Such saving to the public may prove the worst mode of robbing it. The crown, which has in its hands the trust of the daily pay for national service, ought to have in its hands also the means for the repose of public labor and the fixed settlement of acknowledged merit. There is a time when the weather-beaten vessels of the state ought to come into harbor. They must at length have a retreat from the malice of rivals, from the perfidy of political friends, and the inconstancy of the people. Many of the persons who in all times have filled the great offices of state have been younger brothers who had originally little, if any, fortune. These offices do not furnish the means of amassing wealth. There ought to be some power in the crown of granting pensions out of the reach of its own caprices. An entail of dependence is a bad reward of merit. End of section 26. Section 27 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Moral Distinctions. Those who are least anxious about your conduct are not those that love you most. Moderate affection and satiated enjoyment are cold and respectful, but an ardent and injured passion is tempered up with wrath and grief and shame and conscious worth 
and the maddening sense of violated right. A jealous love lights his torch from the firebrands of the Furies. They who call upon you to belong wholly to the people are those who wish you to return to your proper home, to the sphere of your duty, to the post of your honor, to the mansion house of all genuine, serene, and solid satisfaction. Electors and Representatives Look, gentlemen, to the whole tenor of your member's conduct. Try whether his ambition or his avarice have jostled him out of the straight line of duty, or whether that grand foe of the offices of active life, that master vice in men of business, a degenerate and inglorious sloth, has made him flag and languish in his course. This is the object of our inquiry. If our member's conduct can bear this touch, mark it for sterling. He may have fallen into errors. He must have faults. But our error is greater, and our fault is radically ruinous to ourselves if we do not bear, if we do not even applaud, the whole compound and mixed mass of such a character. Not to act thus is folly. I had almost said it is impiety. He censures God, who quarrels with the imperfections of man. Gentlemen, we must not be peevish with those who serve the people. For none will serve us whilst there is a court to serve, but those who are of a nice and jealous honor. They who think everything, in comparison of that honor, to be dust and ashes, will not bear to have it soiled and impaired by those for whose sake they make a thousand sacrifices to preserve it immaculate and whole. We shall either drive such men from the public stage, or we shall send them to the court for protection, where, if they must sacrifice their reputation, they will at least secure their interest. Depend upon it that the lovers of freedom will be free. None will violate their conscience to please us, in order afterwards to discharge that conscience which they have violated, by doing us faithful and affectionate service. If we degrade and deprave their minds by servility, it will be absurd to expect that they who are creeping and abject towards us will ever be bold and incorruptible asserters of our freedom against the most seducing and the most formidable of all powers. No, human nature is not so formed, nor shall we improve the faculties or better the morals of public men by our possession of the most infallible receipt in the world for making cheats and hypocrites. Let me say with plainness, I, who am no longer in a public character, that if by a fair, by an indulgent, by a gentlemanly behavior to our representatives, we do not give confidence to their minds and a liberal scope to their understandings, if we do not permit our members to act upon a very enlarged view of things, we shall at length infallibly degrade our national representation into a confused and scuffling bustle of local agency. When the popular member is narrowed in his ideas and rendered timid in his proceedings, the service of the crown will be the sole nursery of statesmen. Among the frolics of the court, it may at length take that of attending to its business. Then the monopoly of mental power will be added to the power of all other kinds it possesses. On the side of the people, there will be nothing but impotence, for ignorance is impotence. Narrowness of mind is impotence. Timidity is itself impotence and makes all other qualities that go along with it impotent and useless. Popular Opinion, a Fallacious Standard When we know that the opinions of even the greatest multitudes are the standard of rectitude, I shall think myself obliged to make those opinions the masters of my conscience. But if it may be doubted whether omnipotence itself is competent to alter the essential constitution of right and wrong, sure I am that such things as they and I are possessed of no such power. No man carries further than I do the policy of making government pleasing to the people, but the widest range of this politic complacence is confined within the limits of justice. I would not only consult the interest of the people, but I would cheerfully gratify their humors. We are all a sort of children that must be soothed and managed. I think I am not austere or formal in my nature. I would bear, I would even myself play my part in any innocent buffooneries to divert them. 
but I never will act the tyrant for their amusement. If they will mix malice in their sports, I shall never consent to throw them any living, sentient creature whatsoever. No, not so much as a kitling to torment. English Reformation The condition of our nature is such that we buy our blessings at a price. The Reformation, one of the greatest periods of human improvement, was a time of trouble and confusion. The vast structure of superstition and tyranny, which had been for ages in rearing, and which was combined with the interest of the great and of the many, which was molded into the laws, the manners, and the civil institutions of nations, and blended with the frame and policy of states, could not be brought to the ground without a fearful struggle, nor could it fall without a violent concussion of itself and all about it. When this great revolution was attempted in a more regular mode by government, it was opposed by plots and seditions of the people. When, by popular efforts, it was repressed as a rebellion by the hand of power, and bloody executions, often bloodily returned, marked the whole of its progress through all its stages. The affairs of religion, which are no longer heard of in the tumult of our present contentions, made a principal ingredient in the wars and politics of that time. The enthusiasm of religion threw a gloom over the politics, and political interests poisoned and perverted the spirit of religion upon all sides. The Protestant religion in that violent struggle infected, as the Popish had been before, by worldly interests and worldly passions, became a persecutor in its turn, sometimes of the new sects, which carried their own principles further than it was convenient to the original reformers, and always of the body from whom they parted, and this persecuting spirit arose, not only from the bitterness of retaliation, but from the merciless policy of fear. It was long before the spirit of true piety and true wisdom, involved in the principles of the Reformation, could be depurated from the dregs and feculence of the contention with which it was carried through. However, until this be done, the Reformation is not complete, and those who think themselves good Protestants from their animosity to others are in that respect no Protestants at all. Proscription This way of proscribing the citizens by denominations and general descriptions, dignified by the name of reason of state and security for constitutions and commonwealths, is nothing better at bottom than the miserable invention of an ungenerous ambition, which would fain hold the sacred trust of power, without any of the virtues or any of the energies that give a title to it. A receipt of policy, made up of a detestable compound of malice, cowardice, and sloth. They would govern men against their will, but in that government they would be discharged from the exercise of vigilance, providence, and fortitude, and therefore, that they may sleep on their watch, they consent to take some one division of the society into partnership of the tyranny over the rest. But let government, in what form it may be, comprehend the whole in its justice and restrain the suspicious by its vigilance. Let it keep watch and ward. Let it discover by its sagacity and punish by its firmness all delinquency against its power, whenever delinquency exists in the overt acts, and then it will be as safe as ever God in nature intended it should be. Crimes are the acts of individuals, and not of denominations, and therefore arbitrarily to class men under general descriptions in order to proscribe and punish them in the lump for a presumed delinquency, of which perhaps but a part, perhaps none at all, are guilty, is indeed a compendious method, and saves a world of trouble about proof. But such a method, instead of being law, is an act of unnatural rebellion against the legal dominion of reason and justice. And this vice, and any constitution that entertains it, at one time or other, will certainly bring on its ruin. End of section 27。section 28 of selections from the speeches and writings of Edmund Burke。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. 
Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke Just Freedom I must fairly tell you that so far as my principles are concerned, principles that I hope will only depart with my last breath, I have no idea of a liberty unconnected with honesty and justice, nor do I believe that any good constitutions of government or of freedom can find it necessary for their security to doom any part of the people to a permanent slavery. Such a constitution of freedom, if such can be, is in effect no more than another name for the tyranny of the strongest faction, and factions in republics have been, and are, full as capable as monarchs of the most cruel oppression and injustice. It is but too true that the love and even the very idea of genuine liberty is extremely rare. It is but too true that there are many whose whole scheme of freedom is made up of pride, perverseness, and insolence. They feel themselves in a state of thraldom. They imagine that their souls are cooped and cabined in unless they have some man or some body of men dependent on their mercy. The desire of having someone below them descends to those who are the very lowest of all. And a Protestant cobbler, debased by his poverty, but exalted by his share of the ruling church, feels a pride in knowing it is by his generosity alone that the peer, whose footman's instep he measures, is able to keep his chaplain from a jail. England's Embassy to America They enter the capital of America only to abandon it, and these asserters and representatives of the dignity of England at the tail of a flying army let fly their Parthian shafts of memorials and remonstrances at random behind them. Their promises and their offers, their flatteries and their menaces were all despised, and we were saved from the disgrace of their formal reception only because the Congress scorned to receive them, whilst the State House of Independent Philadelphia opened her doors to the public entry of the Ambassador of France. From war and blood, we went to submission, and from submission plunged back again to war and blood, to desolate and be desolated, without measure, hope, or end. I am a royalist. I blushed for this degradation of the crown. I am a Whig. I blushed for the dishonor of Parliament. I am a true Englishman. I felt to the quick for the disgrace of England. I am a man. I felt for the melancholy reverse of human affairs in the fall of the first power in the world. Howard the Philanthropist I cannot name this gentleman without remarking that his labors and writings have done much to open the eyes and hearts of mankind. He has visited all Europe, not to survey the sumptuousness of palaces or the stateliness of temples, not to make accurate measurements of the remains of ancient grandeur, nor to form a scale of the curiosity of modern art, not to collect medals or collate manuscripts, but to dive into the depths of dungeons, to plunge into the infection of hospitals, to survey the mansions of sorrow and pain, to take the gauge and dimensions of misery, depression, and contempt, to remember the forgotten, to attend to the neglected, to visit the forsaken, and to compare and collate the distresses of all men in all countries. His plan is original, and it as full of genius as it is of humanity. It was a voyage of discovery, a circumnavigation of charity. Already the benefit of his labor is felt more or less in every country. I hope he will anticipate his final reward by seeing all its effects fully realized in his own. He will receive, not by detail, but in gross, the reward of those who visit the prisoner. And he has so forestalled and monopolized this branch of charity that there will be, I trust, little room to merit by such acts of benevolence hereafter. Parliamentary Retrospect It is certainly not pleasing to be put out of the public service, but I wish to be a member of Parliament to have my share of doing good and resisting evil. It would therefore be absurd to renounce my objects in order to obtain my seat. I deceive myself, indeed most grossly, if I had not much rather passed the remainder of my life hidden in the recesses of the deepest obscurity, 
feeding my mind even with the visions and imaginations of such things than to be placed on the most splendid throne of the universe, tantalized with a denial of the practice of all which can make the greatest situation any other than the greatest curse. Gentlemen, I have had my day. I can never sufficiently express my gratitude to you for having set me in a place wherein I could lend the slightest help to great and laudable designs. If I have had my share in any measure giving quiet to private property and private conscience, if by my vote I have aided in securing to families the best possession, peace, if I have joined in reconciling kings to their subjects and subjects to their prince, if I have assisted to loosen the foreign holdings of the citizen and taught him to look for his protection to the laws of his country and for his comfort to the goodwill of his countrymen, if I have thus taken my part with the best of men in the best of their actions, I can shut the book. I might wish to read a page or two more, but this is enough for my measure. I have not lived in vain. People and Parliament let the commons in Parliament assemble be one and the same thing with the commons at large. The distinctions that are made to separate us are unnatural and wicked contrivances. Let us identify, let us incorporate ourselves with the people. Let us cut all the cables and snap the chains which tie us to an unfaithful shore and enter the friendly harbor that shoots far out into the main its moles and jetties to receive us. War with the world and peace with our constituents. Be this our motto and our principle. Then indeed we shall be truly great. Respecting ourselves, we shall be respected by the world. At present all is troubled and cloudy and distracted and full of anger and turbulence, both abroad and at home. But the air may be cleared by this storm and light and fertility may follow it. Let us give a faithful pledge to the people that we honor indeed the crown, but that we belong to them, that we are their auxiliaries and not their taskmasters, the fellow laborers in the same vineyard, not lording over their rights, but helpers of their joy, that to tax them is a grievance to ourselves, but to cut off from our enjoyments to forward theirs is the highest gratification we are capable of receiving. End of section 28. Section 29 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Reformed Civil List. As things now stand, every man, in proportion to his consequence at court, tends to add to the expense of the civil list by all manner of jobs, if not for himself, yet for his dependents. When the new plan is established, those who are now suitors for jobs will become the most strenuous opposers of them. They will have a common interest with the minister in public economy. Every class, as it stands low, will become security for the payment of the preceding class, and thus the persons whose insignificant services defraud those that are useful would then become interested in their payment. Then the powerful, instead of oppressing, would be obliged to support the weak, and idleness would become concerned in the reward of industry. The whole fabric of the civil economy would become compact and connected in all its parts. It would be formed into a well-organized body where every member contributes to the support of the whole, and where even the lazy stomach secures the vigor of the active arm. French and English Revolution He felt some concern that the strange thing called a revolution in France should be compared with a glorious event commonly called the Revolution in England, and the conduct of the soldiery on that occasion compared with the behavior of some of the troops of France in the present instance. At that period, the Prince of Orange, a prince of the royal blood in England, was called in by the flower of the English aristocracy to defend its ancient constitution 
and not to level all distinctions. To this prince, so invited, the aristocratic leaders who commanded the troops went over with their several corps in bodies to the deliverer of their country. Aristocratic leaders brought up the corps of citizens who newly enlisted in this cause. Military obedience changed its object, but military discipline was not for a moment interrupted in its principle. The troops were ready for war, but indisposed to mutiny. But as the conduct of the English armies was different, so was that of the whole English nation at that time. In truth, the circumstances of our revolution, as it is called, and that of France, are just the reverse of each other in almost every particular, and in the whole spirit of the transaction. With us, it was the case of a legal monarch attempting arbitrary power. In France, it is the case of an arbitrary monarch beginning, from whatever cause, to legalize his authority. The one was to be resisted, the other was to be managed and directed. But in neither case was the order of the state to be changed, lest government might be ruined, which ought only to be corrected and legalized. With us, we got rid of the man and preserved the constituent parts of the state. There, they get rid of the constituent parts of the state and keep the man. What we did was in truth and substance, and in a constitutional light, a revolution not made but prevented. We took solid securities. We settled doubtful questions. We corrected anomalies in our law. In the stable, fundamental parts of our Constitution, we made no revolution, no, nor any alteration at all. We did not impair the monarchy. Perhaps it might be shown that we strengthened it very considerably. The nation kept the same ranks, the same orders, the same privileges, the same franchises, the same rules for property, the same subordinations, the same order in the law, in the revenue, and in the magistracy. The same lords, the same commons, the same corporations, the same electors. The church was not impaired. Her estates, her majesty, her splendor, her orders and gradations continued the same. She was preserved in her full efficiency and cleared only of a certain intolerance, which was her weakness and disgrace. The church and the state were the same after the revolution that they were before but better secured in every part. Was little done because a revolution was not made in the Constitution? No, everything was done, because we commenced with reparation, not with ruin. Accordingly, the state flourished. Instead of laying as dead in a sort of trance, or exposed, as some others, in an epileptic fit to the pity or derision of the world for her wild, ridiculous, convulsive movements, impotent to every purpose but that of dashing out her brains against the pavement, Great Britain rose above the standard even of her former self. An era of a more improved domestic prosperity then commenced, and still continues not only unimpaired, but growing under the wasting hand of time. All the energies of the country were awakened. England never preserved a firmer countenance, nor a more vigorous arm to all her enemies, and to all her rivals. Europe under her respired and revived. Everywhere she appeared as a protector, asserter, or avenger of liberty. A war was made and supported against fortune itself. The Treaty of Ryswick, which first limited the power of France, was soon after made. The Grand Alliance very shortly followed, which shook to the foundations the dreadful power which menaced the independence of mankind. The states of Europe lay happy under the shade of a great and free monarchy, which knew how to be great without endangering its own peace at home or the internal or external peace of any of its neighbors. Armed Discipline He knew too well, and he felt as much as any man, how difficult it was to accommodate a standing army to a free constitution or to any constitution. An armed, disciplined body is, in its essence, dangerous to liberty. Undisciplined, it is ruinous to society. Its component parts are, in the latter case, neither good citizens nor good soldiers. What have they thought of in France under such a difficulty as almost puts the human faculties to a stand? 
they have put their army under such a variety of principles of duty that it is more likely to breed litigants, pettifoggers, and mutineers than soldiers. They have set up to balance their crown army, another army, deriving under another authority called a municipal army, a balance of armies, not of orders. These latter they have destroyed with every mark of insult and oppression. States may, and they will best, exist with a partition of civil powers. Armies cannot exist under a divided command. This state of things, he thought, in effect, a state of war, or at best, but a truce instead of peace in the country. Gilded Despotism In the last century, Louis the Fourteenth had established a greater and better disciplined military force than ever had been before seen in Europe, and with it a perfect despotism. Though that despotism was proudly arrayed in manners, gallantry, splendor, magnificence, and even covered over with the imposing robes of science, literature, and arts, it was, in government, nothing better than a painted and gilded tyranny. In religion, a hard, stern intolerance, the fit companion and auxiliary to the despotic tyranny which prevailed in its government. The same character of despotism insinuated itself into every court of Europe, the same spirit of disproportioned magnificence, the same love of standing armies above the ability of the people. In particular, our then sovereigns, King Charles and King James, fell in love with the government of their neighbor, so flattering to the pride of kings. A similarity of sentiments brought on connections equally dangerous to the interests and liberties of their country. It were well that the infection had gone no farther than the throne. The admiration of a government flourishing and successful, unchecked in its operations, and seeming therefore to compass its objects more speedily and effectually, gained something upon all ranks of people. The good patriots of that day, however, struggled against it. They sought nothing more anxiously than to break off all communication with France and to beget a total alienation from its counsels and its example, which, by the animosity prevalent between the abettors of the religious system and the asserters of ours, was in some degree affected. Our French Dangers In the last age, we were in danger of being entangled by the example of France in the net of a relentless despotism. It is not necessary to say anything upon that example. It exists no longer. Our present danger, from the example of a people whose character knows no medium, is, with regard to government, a danger from anarchy a danger of being led through an admiration of successful fraud and violence to an imitation of the excesses of an irrational, unprincipled, proscribing, confiscating, plundering, ferocious, bloody, and tyrannical democracy. On the side of religion, the danger of their example is no longer from intolerance, but from atheism, a foul, unnatural vice, foe to all the dignity and consolation of mankind, which seems in France for a long time to have been embodied into a faction, accredited and almost avowed. End of section 29. Section 30 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Sir George Seville. When an act of great and signal humanity was to be done, and done with all the weight and authority that belonged to it, the world would cast its eyes upon none but him. I hope that few things which have a tendency to bless or to adorn life have wholly escaped my observation in my passage through it. I have sought the acquaintance of that gentleman and have seen him in all situations. He is a true genius, with an understanding vigorous and acute and refined and distinguishing even to excess and illuminated with the most unbounded, peculiar and original cast of imagination. 
With these, he possesses many external and instrumental advantages, and he makes use of them all. His fortune is among the largest, a fortune which, wholly unencumbered as it is, with one single charge from luxury, vanity, or excess, sinks under the benevolence of its dispenser. This private benevolence, expanding itself into patriotism, renders his whole being the estate of the public, in which he has not reserved a peculium for himself of profit, diversion, or relaxation. During the session, the first in and the last out of the House of Commons, he passes from the Senate to the camp, and seldom seeing the seat of his ancestors, he is always in the Senate to serve his country or in the field to defend it. Corruption Not Self-Reformed Those who would admit the reformation of India to the destroyers of it are the enemies to that reformation. They would make a distinction between directors and proprietors, which, in the present state of things, does not, cannot exist. But a right honorable gentleman says he would keep the present government of India in the court of directors and would, to curb them, provide salutary regulations. Wonderful. That is, he would appoint the old offenders to correct the old offenses, and he would render the vicious and the foolish wise and virtuous by salutary regulations. He would appoint the wolf as guardian of the sheep, but he has invented a curious muzzle by which this protecting wolf shall not be able to open his jaws above an inch or two at the utmost. Thus his work is finished. But I tell the right honorable gentleman that controlled depravity is not innocence, and that it is not the labor of delinquency in chains that will correct abuses. Will these gentlemen of the direction animadvert on the partners of their own guilt? Never did a serious plan of amending any old tyrannical establishment propose the authors and abettors of the abuses as the reformers of them. The Bribed and the Bribers if I am to speak my private sentiments, I think that in a thousand cases for one, it would be far less mischievous to the public and full as little dishonorable to themselves to be polluted with direct bribery than thus to become a standing auxiliary to the oppression, usury, and peculation of multitudes in order to obtain a corrupt support to their power. It is by bribing, not so often by being bribed, that wicked politicians bring ruin on mankind. Avarice is a rival to the pursuits of many. It finds a multitude of checks and many opposers in every walk of life. But the objects of ambition are for the few, and every person who aims at indirect profit and therefore wants other protection than innocence and law instead of its rival becomes its instrument. There is a natural allegiance and fealty due to this domineering paramount evil from all the vassal vices which acknowledge its superiority and readily militate under its banners. And it is under that discipline alone that avarice is able to spread to any considerable extent or to render itself a general public mischief. Hyder Ali when at length Hyder Ali found that he had to do with men who either would sign no convention or whom no treaty and no signature could bind and who were the determined enemies of human intercourse itself, he decreed to make the country possessed by these incorrigible and predestinated criminals a memorable example to mankind. He resolved, in the gloomy recesses of a mind capacious of such things, to leave the whole Carnatic an everlasting monument of vengeance, and to put perpetual desolation as a barrier between him and those, against whom the faith which holds the moral elements of the world together was no protection. He became at length so confident of his force, so collected in his might, that he made no secret whatsoever of his dreadful resolution. Having terminated his disputes with every enemy and every rival, who buried their mutual animosities in their common detestation against the creditors of the Nabob of Arcot, he drew from every quarter whatever a savage ferocity could add to his new rudiments in the arts of destruction, and compounding all the materials of fury, havoc, and desolation into one black cloud, he hung for a while on the declivities of the mountains. 
Whilst the authors of all these evils were idly and stupidly gazing on this menacing meteor, which blackened all their horizon, it suddenly burst and poured down the whole of its contents upon the plains of the Carnatic. Then ensued a scene of woe, the like of which no eye had seen, no heart conceived, and which no tongue can adequately tell. All the horrors of war before known or heard of were mercy to that new havoc. A storm of universal fire blasted every field, consumed every house, destroyed every temple. The miserable inhabitants, flying from their flaming villages, in part were slaughtered. Others, without regard to sex, to age, to the respective rank or sacredness of function, fathers torn from children, husbands from wives, enveloped in a whirlwind of cavalry, and amidst the goading spears of drivers and the trampling of pursuing horses, were swept into captivity in an unknown and hostile land. Those who were able to evade the tempest fled to the walled cities, but escaping from fire, sword, and exile, they fell into the jaws of famine. The alms of the settlement in this dreadful exigency were certainly liberal, and all was done by charity that private charity could do. But it was a people in beggary. It was a nation which stretched out its hands for food. For months together, these creatures of sufferance, whose very excess and luxury in their most plenteous days had fallen short of the allowance of our austerest fasts, silent, patient, resigned, without sedition or disturbance, almost without complaint, perished by an hundred a day in the streets of Madras. Every day, seventy at least laid their bodies in the streets or on the glacis of Tanjore, and expired of famine in the granary of India. I was going to awake your justice towards this unhappy part of our fellow citizens by bringing before you some of the circumstances of this plague of hunger. Of all the calamities which beset and waylay the life of man, this comes the nearest to our heart, and is that wherein the proudest of us all feels himself to be nothing more than he is, but I find myself unable to manage it with decorum. These details are of a species of horror so nauseous and disgusting, they are so degrading to the sufferers and to the hearers, they are so humiliating to human nature itself, that, on better thoughts, I think it more advisable to throw a pall over this hideous object and to leave it to your general conceptions. Reformation and Anarchy Contrasted and Compared that the house must perceive, from his coming forward to mark an expression or two of his best friend, how anxious he was to keep the distemper of France from the least countenance in England, where he was sure some wicked persons had shown a strong disposition to recommend an imitation of the French spirit of reform. He was so strongly opposed to any the least tendency towards the means of introducing a democracy like theirs, as well as to the end itself that much as it would afflict him if such a thing could be attempted, and that any friend of his could concur in such measures. He was far, very far, from believing they could. He would abandon his best friends and join with his worst enemies to oppose either the means or the end, and to resist all violent exertions of the spirit of innovation, so distant from all principles of true and safe reformation, a spirit well calculated to overturn states, but perfectly unfit to amend them. That he was no enemy to reformation. Almost every business in which he was much concerned, from the first day he sat in that house to that hour, was a business of reformation, and when he had not been employed in correcting, he had been employed in resisting abuses. Some traces of this spirit in him now stand on their statute book, in his opinion, anything which unnecessarily tore to pieces the contexture of the state not only prevented all real reformation, but introduced evils which would call, but perhaps call in vain, for new reformation. That he thought the French nation very unwise. What they valued themselves on was a disgrace to them. They had gloried, and some people in England had thought fit to take share in that glory in making a revolution as if revolutions were good things in themselves. All the horrors and all the crimes of the anarchy which led to their revolution 
which attend its progress and which may virtually attend it in its establishment, pass for nothing with the lovers of revolutions. The French have made their way through the destruction of their country to a bad constitution when they were absolutely in possession of a good one. They were in possession of it the day the states met in separate orders. Their business, had they been either virtuous or wise, or had they been left to their own judgment, was to secure the stability and independence of the states according to those orders under the monarch on the throne. It was then their duty to redress grievances. Instead of redressing grievances and improving the fabric of their state to which they were called by their monarch and sent by their country, they were made to take a very different course. They first destroyed all the balances and counterpoises which served to fix the state and to give it a steady direction, and which furnish sure correctives to any violent spirit which may prevail in any of the orders. These balances existed in their oldest constitution, and in the constitution of this country, and in the constitution of all the countries in Europe. These they rashly destroyed, and then they melted down the whole into one incongruous, ill-connected mass. When they had done this, they instantly, and with the most atrocious perfidy and breach of all faith among men, laid the axe to the root of all property, and consequently of all national prosperity, by the principles they established, and the example they set in confiscating all the possessions of the church. They made and recorded a sort of institute and digest of anarchy, called the rights of man, in such a pedantic abuse of elementary principles as would have disgraced boys at school. But this declaration of rights was worse than trifling and pedantic in them, is by their name and authority they systematically destroyed every hold of authority by opinion, religious or civil, on the minds of the people. By this mad declaration they subverted the state and brought on such calamities as no country without a long war has ever been known to suffer, and which may in the end produce such a war, and perhaps many such. With them the question was not between despotism and liberty. The sacrifice they made of the peace and power of their country was not made on the altar of freedom. Freedom and a better security for freedom than that they have taken, they might have had without any sacrifice at all. They brought themselves into all the calamities they suffer, not that through them they might obtain a British constitution. They plunged themselves headlong into those calamities to prevent themselves from settling into that constitution or into anything resembling it. End of section 30. Section 31 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Confidence and Jealousy Confidence might become a vice, and jealousy a virtue, according to circumstances. That confidence, of all public virtues, was the most dangerous, and jealousy in a house of commons, of all public vices, the most tolerable, especially where the number and the charge of standing armies in time of peace was the question. Economy of Injustice Strange as this scheme of conduct and ministry is, and inconsistent with all just policy, it is still true to itself and faithful to its own perverted order. Those who are bountiful to crimes will be rigid to merit, and penurious to service. Their penury is even held out as a blind and cover to their prodigality. The economy of injustice is to furnish resources for the fund of corruption. Then they pay off their protection to great crimes and great criminals by being inexorable to the paltry frailties of little men. And these modern flagellants are sure with a rigid fidelity, to whip their own enormities on the vicarious back of every small offender. Subsistence and Revenue The benefits of heaven to any community ought never to be connected with political arrangements 
or made to depend on the personal conduct of princes in which the mistake or error or neglect or distress or passion of a moment on either side may bring famine on millions and ruin an innocent nation perhaps for ages. The means of the subsistence of mankind should be as immutable as the laws of nature. Let power and dominion take what course they may. Authority and Venality It is difficult for the most wise and upright government to correct the abuses of remote delegated power, productive of unmeasured wealth, and protected by the boldness and strength of the same ill-got riches. These abuses, full of their own wild native vigor, will grow and flourish under mere neglect. But where the supreme authority, not content with winking at the rapacity of its inferior instruments, is so shameless and corrupt as openly to give bounties and premiums for disobedience to its laws, when it will not trust to the activity of avarice in the pursuit of its own gains, when it secures public robbery by all the careful jealousy and attention with which it ought to protect property from such violence, the commonwealth then has become totally perverted from its purposes. Neither God nor man will long endure it nor will it long endure itself. In that case, there is an unnatural infection, a pestilential taint fermenting in the constitution of society, which fever and convulsions of some kind or other must throw off, or in which the vital powers, worsted in an unequal struggle, are pushed back upon themselves, and by a reversal of their whole functions, fester to gain green, to death, and instead of what was but just now the delight and boast of the creation, there will be cast out in the face of the sun a bloated, putrid, noisome carcass full of stench and poison, an offense, a horror, a lesson to the world. Prerogative of the Crown and Privilege of Parliament It is the undoubted prerogative of the Crown to dissolve Parliament, but we beg leave to lay before His Majesty that it is, of all the trusts vested in his majesty, the most critical and delicate, and that in which this house has the most reason to require not only the good faith, but the favor of the crown. His commons are not always upon a par with his ministers in an application to popular judgment. It is not in the power of the members of this house to go to their election at the moment the most favorable to them. It is in the power of the crown to choose a time for their dissolution, whilst great and arduous matters of state and legislation are depending, which may be easily misunderstood, and which cannot be fully explained before that misunderstanding may prove fatal to the honor that belongs and to the consideration that is due to members of Parliament. With His Majesty is the gift of all the rewards, the honors, distinctions, favor, and graces of the state— with his majesty is the mitigation of all the rigors of the law, and we rejoice to see the crown possessed of trusts calculated to obtain good will and charged with duties which are popular and pleasing. Our trusts are of a different kind. Our duties are harsh and invidious in their nature, and justice and safety is all we can expect in the exercise of them. We are to offer salutary, which is not always pleasing, counsel. We are to inquire and to accuse, and the objects of our inquiry and charge will be, for the most part, persons of wealth, power, and extensive connections. We are to make rigid laws for the preservation of revenue, which of necessity more or less confines some action, or restrains some function, which before was free. What is the most critical and invidious of all? The whole body of the public impositions originate from us, and the hand of the House of Commons is seen and felt in every burthen that presses on the people. Whilst ultimately we are serving them, and in the first instance whilst we are serving His Majesty, it will be hard, indeed, if we should see a House of Commons the victim of its zeal and fidelity, sacrificed by his ministers to those very popular discontents, which shall be excited by our dutiful endeavors for the security and greatness of his throne. No other consequence can result from such an example, but that, in future, the House of Commons, consulting its safety at the expense of its duties, 
and suffering the whole energy of the state to be relaxed, would shrink from every service, which, however necessary, is of a great and arduous nature, or that, willing to provide for the public necessities, and at the same time to secure the means of performing that task, they will exchange independence for protection, and will court a subservient existence through the favor of those ministers of state or those secret advisers who ought themselves to stand in awe of the commons of this realm. A house of commons, respected by his ministers, is essential to his majesty's service. It is fit that they should yield to parliament, and not that parliament should be new modeled until it is fitted to their purposes. If our authority is only to be held up when we coincide an opinion with his majesty's advisers, but is to be set at naught the moment it differs from them, the House of Commons will sink into a mere appendage of administration and will lose that independent character which, inseparably connecting the honor and reputation with the acts of this House, enables us to afford a real, effective, and substantial support to his government. It is the deference shown to our opinion when we dissent from the servants of the Crown, which alone can give authority to the proceedings of this House when it concurs with their measures. That authority once lost, the credit of His Majesty's Crown will be impaired in the eyes of all nations. Foreign powers, who may yet wish to revive a friendly intercourse with this nation, will look in vain for that hold which gave a connection with Great Britain the preference to an alliance with any other state. A House of Commons, of which ministers were known to stand in awe, where everything was necessarily discussed on principles fit to be openly and publicly avowed, and which could not be retracted or varied without danger, furnished a ground of confidence in the public faith, which the engagement of no state dependent on the fluctuation of personal favor and private advice can ever pretend to. If faith with the House of Commons, the grand security for the national faith itself, can be broken with impunity, a wound is given to the political importance of Great Britain, which will not easily be healed. End of section 31. Section 32 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Burke and Fox. His confidence in Mr. Fox was such, and so ample, as to be almost implicit, that he was not ashamed to avow that degree of docility, that when the choice is well made, it strengthens instead of oppressing our intellect, that he who calls in the aid of an equal understanding doubles his own, he who profits of a superior understanding raises his powers to a level with the height of the superior understanding he unites with. He had found the benefit of such a junction, and would not lightly depart from it. He wished almost, on all occasions, that his sentiments were understood to be conveyed in Mr. Fox's words, and he wished, as amongst the greatest benefits he could wish the country, an eminent share of power to that right honorable gentleman, because he knew that, to his great and masterly understanding, he had joined the greatest possible degree of that natural moderation, which is the best corrective of power that he was of the most artless, candid, open, and benevolent disposition, disinterested in the extreme of a temper mild and placable even to a fault, without one drop of gall in his whole constitution. Peers and Commons The Commons have the deepest interest in the purity and integrity of the peerage. The peers dispose of all the property in the kingdom in the last resort, and they dispose of it on their honor and not on their oaths, as all the members of every other tribunal in the kingdom must do, though in them the proceeding is not conclusive. We have, therefore, a right to demand that no application shall be made to peers of such a nature as may give room to call in question, much less to attaint our sole security for all that we possess. 
This corrupt proceeding appeared to the House of Commons, who are the natural guardians of the purity of Parliament and of the purity of every branch of judicature, a most reprehensible and dangerous practice tending to shake the very foundation of the authority of the House of Peers, and they branded it as such by their resolution. Natural Self-Destruction The French had shown themselves the ablest architects of ruin that had hitherto existed in the world. In that very short space of time, they had completely pulled down to the ground their monarchy, their church, their nobility, their law, their revenue, their army, their navy, their commerce, their arts, and their manufactures. They had done their business for us as rivals in a way in which twenty Ramelis or Blenheims could never have done it. Were we absolute conquerors and France to lie prostrate at our feet, we should be ashamed to send a commission to settle their affairs which could impose so hard a law upon the French and so destructive of all their consequence as a nation as that they had imposed on themselves. The Carnatic The Carnatic is a country not much inferior in extent to England. Figure to yourself, Mr. Speaker, the land in whose representative chair you sit. Figure to yourself the form and fashion of your sweet and cheerful country from Thames to Trent, north and south, and from the Irish to the German sea east and west, emptied and emboweled. May God avert the omen of our crimes by so accomplished a desolation. Extend your imagination a little further, and then suppose your ministers taking a survey of this scene of waste and desolation. What would be your thoughts if you should be informed that they were computing how much had been the amount of the excises, how much the customs, how much the land and malt tax, in order that they should charge, take it in the most favorable light, for public service, upon the relics of the satiated vengeance of relentless enemies, the whole of what England had yielded in the most exuberant seasons of peace and abundance? What would you call it? To call it tyranny, sublimed into madness, would be too faint an image. Yet this very madness is the principle upon which the ministers at your right hand have proceeded in their estimate of the revenues of the Carnatic, when they were providing not supply for the establishments of its protection, but rewards for the authors of its ruin. Every day you are fatigued and disgusted with his cant. The Carnatic is a country that will soon recover and become instantly as prosperous as ever. They think they are talking to innocents, who will believe that, by sowing of dragon's teeth, men may come up ready-grown and ready-armed. They who will give themselves the trouble of considering, for it requires no great reach of thought, no very profound knowledge, the manner in which mankind are increased and countries cultivated will regard all this raving as it ought to be regarded. In order that the people, after a long period of vexation and plunder, may be in a condition to maintain government, government must begin by maintaining them. Here the road to economy lies not through receipt, but through expense, and in that country, Nature has given no shortcut to your object. Men must propagate like other animals, by the mouth. Never did oppression light the nuptial torch. Never did extortion and usury spread out the genial bed. Does any one of you think that England, so wasted, would, under such a nursing attendance, so rapidly and cheaply recover? But he is meanly acquainted with either England or India, who does not know that England would a thousand times sooner resume population, fertility, and what ought to be the ultimate secretion from both, revenue, than such a country as the Carnatic. The Carnatic is not by the bounty of nature a fertile soil. The general size of its cattle is proof enough that it is much otherwise. It is some days since I moved that a curious, interesting map kept in the India house should be laid before you. The India House is not yet in readiness to send it. I have therefore brought down my own copy, and there it lies for the use of any gentleman who may think such a matter worthy of his attention. It is indeed a noble map, and of noble things, but it is decisive against the golden dreams and sanguine speculations of avarice 
run mad. In addition to what you know must be the case in every part of the world, the necessity of a previous provision of habitation, seed, stock, capital, that map will show you that the uses of the influences of heaven itself are in that country a work of art. The Carnatic is refreshed by few or no living brooks or running streams, and it has rain only at a season, but its product of rice extracts the use of water subject to perpetual command. This is the National Bank of the Carnatic, on which it must have a perpetual credit, or it perishes irretrievably. For that reason, in the happier times of India, a number almost incredible of reservoirs have been made in chosen places throughout the whole country. They are formed for the greater part of mounds of earth and stones, with sluices of solid masonry, the whole constructed with admirable skill and labor, and maintained at a mighty charge. In the territory contained in that map alone, I have been at the trouble of reckoning the reservoirs, and they amount to upwards of 1,100, from the extent of two or three acres to five miles in circuit. From these reservoirs, currents are occasionally drawn over the fields, and these watercourses again call for a considerable expense to keep them properly scoured and duly leveled. Taking the district in that map as a measure, there cannot be in the Carnatic and Tanjore fewer than 10,000 of these reservoirs of the larger and middling dimensions, to say nothing of those for domestic services and the uses of religious purification. These are not the enterprises of your power, nor in a style of magnificence suited to the taste of your minister. These are the monuments of real kings, who were the fathers of their people, testators to a posterity which they embraced as their own. These were the grand sepulchres built by ambition, but by the ambition of an insatiable benevolence, which, not contented with reigning in the dispensation of happiness during the contracted term of human life, had strained, with all the reachings and graspings of a vivacious mind, to extend the dominion of their bounty beyond the limits of nature, and to perpetuate themselves through generations of generations, the guardians, the protectors, the nourishers of mankind. Abstract Theory of Human Liberty I love a manly, moral, regulated liberty as well as any gentleman of that society, be he who he will. And perhaps I have given as good proofs of my attachment to that cause in the whole course of my public conduct. I think I envy liberty as little as they do to any other nation. But I cannot stand forward and give praise or blame to anything which relates to human actions and human concerns on a simple view of the object as it stands stripped of every relation in all the nakedness and solitude of metaphysical abstraction. Circumstances, which with some gentlemen pass for nothing, give in reality to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effect. The circumstances are what render every civil and political scheme beneficial or noxious to mankind. Abstractedly speaking, government as well as liberty is good. Yet could I, in common sense, ten years ago, have felicitated France on her enjoyment of a government, for she then had a government, without inquiry what the nature of that government was or how it was administered. Can I now congratulate the same nation upon its freedom? Is it because liberty in the abstract may be classed amongst the blessings of mankind that I am seriously to felicitate a madman who has escaped from the protecting restraint and wholesome darkness of his cell on his restoration to the enjoyment of light and liberty? Am I to congratulate a highwayman and murderer who has broken prison upon the recovery of his natural rights? This would be to act over again the scene of the criminals condemned to the galleys, and their heroic delivery, the metaphysic night of the sorrowful countenance. When I see the spirit of liberty in action, I see a strong principle at work, and this, for a while, is all I can possibly know of it. The wild gas, the fixed air, is plainly broke loose, but we ought to suspend our judgment until the first effervescence is a little subsided, till the liquor is cleared, 
and until we see something deeper than the agitation of a troubled and frothy surface. I must be tolerably sure, before I venture publicly to congratulate men upon a blessing, that they have really received one. Flattery corrupts both the receiver and the giver, and adulation is not of more service to the people than to kings. I should therefore suspend my congratulations on the new liberty of France until I was informed how it had been combined with government, with public force, with the discipline and obedience of armies, with the collection of an effective and well-distributed revenue, with morality and religion, with solidity and property, with peace and order, with civil and social manners. All these, in their way, are good things too, and without them, liberty is not a benefit whilst it lasts and is not likely to continue long. The effect of liberty to individuals is that they may do what they please. We ought to see what it will please them to do before we risk congratulations, which may be soon turned into complaints. Prudence would dictate this in the case of separate, insulated, private men. But liberty, when men act in bodies, is power. Considerate people, before they declare themselves, will observe the use which is made of power, and particularly of so trying a thing as new power in new persons, of whose principles, tempers, and dispositions they have little or no experience, and in situations where those who appear the most stirring in the scene may possibly not be the real movers. End of section 32. Section 33 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Politics and the Pulpit. Supposing, however, that something like moderation were visible in this political sermon, yet politics and the pulpit are terms that have little agreement. No sound ought to be heard in the church but the healing voice of Christian charity. The cause of civil liberty and civil government gains as little as that of religion by this confusion of duties. Those who quit their proper character to assume what does not belong to them are, for the greater part, ignorant both of the character they leave and of the character they assume. Wholly unacquainted with the world in which they are so fond of meddling and inexperienced in all its affairs, on which they pronounce with so much confidence, they have nothing of politics but the passions they excite. Surely the church is a place where one day's truce ought to be allowed to the dissensions and animosities of mankind. Idea of French Revolution it appears to me as if I were in a great crisis, not of the affairs of France alone, but of all Europe, perhaps of more than Europe. All circumstances taken together, the French Revolution is the most astonishing that has hitherto happened in the world. The most wonderful things are brought about in many instances by means the most absurd and ridiculous, in the most ridiculous modes, and apparently by the most contemptible instruments. Everything seems out of nature in this strange chaos of levity and ferocity and of all sorts of crimes jumbled together with all sorts of follies. In viewing this monstrous, tragic, comic scene, the most opposite passions necessarily succeed and sometimes mix with each other in the mind. Alternate contempt and indignation, alternate laughter and tears, alternate scorn and horror. Patriotic Distinction I certainly have the honor to belong to more clubs than one in which the constitution of this kingdom and the principles of the glorious revolution are held in high reverence, and I reckon myself among the most forward in my zeal for maintaining that constitution and those principles in their utmost purity and vigor. It is because I do so that I think it necessary for me that there should be no mistake those who cultivate the memory of our revolution and those who are attached to the constitution of this kingdom will take good care how they are involved with persons who
who, under the pretext of zeal towards the revolution and constitution, too frequently wander from their true principles and are ready on every occasion to depart from the firm but cautious and deliberate spirit which produced the one and which presides in the other. Kingly power not based on popular choice. According to this spiritual doctor of politics, if his majesty does not owe his crown to the choice of his people, he is no lawful king. Now nothing can be more untrue than that the crown of this kingdom is so held by his majesty. Therefore, if you follow their rule, the king of Great Britain, who most certainly does not owe his high office to any form of popular election, is in no respect better than the rest of the gang of usurpers who reign, or rather rob, all over the face of this our miserable world, without any sort of right or title to the allegiance of their people. The policy of this general doctrine, so qualified, is evident enough. The propagators of this political gospel are in hopes that their abstract principle, their principle that a popular choice is necessary to the legal existence of the sovereign magistracy, would be overlooked, whilst the king of Great Britain was not affected by it. In the meantime, the ears of their congregations would be gradually habituated to it, as if it were a first principle admitted without dispute. For the present, it would only operate as a theory, pickled in the preserving juices of pulpit eloquence and laid by for future use. Condo et compono que mox de promer possum. By this policy, whilst our government is soothed with a reservation in its favor to which it has no claim, the security which it has in common with all governments, so far as opinion as security, is taken away. Thus these politicians proceed, whilst little notice is taken of their doctrines, but when they come to be examined upon the plain meaning of their words and the direct tendency of their doctrines, then equivocations and slippery construction come into play. When they say the king owes his crown to the choice of his people and is therefore the only lawful sovereign in the world, they will perhaps tell us they mean to say no more than that some of the king's predecessors have been called to the throne by some sort of choice, and therefore he owes his crown to the choice of his people. Thus, by a miserable subterfuge, they hope to render their proposition safe by rendering it nugatory. They are welcome to the asylum they seek for their offense, since they take refuge in their folly. For if you admit this interpretation, how does their idea of election differ from our idea of inheritance? And how does the settlement of the crown in the Brunswick line derived from James I come to legalize our monarchy rather than that of any of the neighboring countries? At some time or other, to be sure, all the beginners of dynasties were chosen by those who called them to govern. There is ground enough for the opinion that all the kingdoms of Europe were, at a remote period, elective, with more or fewer limitations in the objects of choice. But whatever kings might have been here or elsewhere a thousand years ago, or in whatever manner the ruling dynasties of England or France may have begun, the king of Great Britain is, at this day, king by a fixed rule of succession, according to the laws of his country. And whilst the legal conditions of the compact of sovereignty are performed by him, as they are performed, he holds his crown in contempt of the choice of the revolution society, who have not a single vote for a king amongst them, either individually or collectively. Though I make no doubt they would soon erect themselves into an electoral college if things were ripe to give effect to their claim. His Majesty's heirs and successors, each in his time and order, will come to the crown with the same contempt of their choice with which his majesty has succeeded to that he wears. Whatever may be the success of evasion in explaining away the gross error of fact, which supposes that his majesty, though he holds it in concurrence with the wishes, owes his crown to the choice of his people, yet nothing can evade their full explicit declaration concerning the principle of a right in the people to choose, which right is directly maintained 
and tenaciously adhered to. All the oblique insinuations concerning election bottom in this proposition and are referable to it, lest the foundation of the king's exclusive legal title should pass for a mere rant of adulatory freedom, the political divine proceeds dogmatically to assert that, by the principles of the revolution, the people of England have acquired three fundamental rights, all of which, with him, compose one system and lie together in one short sentence, namely, that we have acquired a right, one, to choose our own governors, two, to cashier them for misconduct, three, to frame a government for ourselves. This new and hitherto unheard of Bill of Rights, though made in the name of the whole people, belongs to those gentlemen and their faction only. The body of the people of England have no share in it. They utterly disclaim it. They will resist the practical assertion of it with their lives and fortunes. They are bound to do so by the laws of their country, made at the time of that very revolution which is appealed to in favor of the fictitious rights claimed by the society which abuses its name. Preaching Democracy of Dissent If the noble seekers should find nothing to satisfy their pious fancies in the old staple of the national church, or in all the rich variety to be found in the well-assorted warehouses of the dissenting congregations, Dr. Price advises them to improve upon nonconformity and to set up, each of them, a separate meeting house upon his own particular principles. It is somewhat remarkable that this reverend divine should be so earnest for setting up new churches and so perfectly indifferent concerning the doctrine which may be taught in them. His zeal is of a curious character. It is not for the propagation of his own opinions, but of any opinions. It is not for the diffusion of truth, but for the spreading of contradiction. Let the noble teachers but dissent. It is no matter from whom or from what. This great point once secured, it is taken for granted their religion will be rational and manly. I doubt whether religion would reap all the benefits which the calculating divine computes from this great company of great preachers. It would certainly be a valuable addition of nondescripts to the ample collection of known classes, genera, and species, which at present beautify the hortus siccus of descent. A sermon from a noble duke, or a noble marquis, or a noble earl, or baron bold, would certainly increase and diversify the amusements of this town, which begins to grow satiated with the uniform round of its vapid dissipations. I should only stipulate that these new mess johns in robes and coronets should keep some sort of bounds in the democratic and leveling principles which are expected from their titled pulpits. The new evangelists will, I dare say, disappoint the hopes that are conceived of them. They will not become, literally as well as figuratively, polemic divines, nor be disposed so to drill their congregations that they may, as in former blessed times, preach their doctrines to regiments of dragoons and corps of infantry and artillery. Such arrangements, however favorable to the cause of compulsory freedom, civil and religious, may not be equally conducive to the national tranquility. These few restrictions, I hope, are no great stretches of intolerance, no very violent exertions of despotism. End of section 33. Section 34 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Jargon of Republicanism. Dr. Price, in this sermon, condemns very properly the practice of gross, adulatory addresses to kings. Instead of this fulsome style, he proposes that his majesty should be told, on occasions of congratulation, that he is to consider himself as more properly the servant than the sovereign of his people. 
For a compliment, this new form of address does not seem to be very soothing. Those who are servants in name, as well as in effect, do not like to be told of their situation, their duty, and their obligations. The slave, in the old play, tells his master, Hec commemoratio est quasi exprobatio. It is not pleasant as compliment. It is not wholesome as instruction. After all, if the king were to bring himself to echo this new kind of address, to adopt it in terms, and even to take the appellation of servant of the people as his royal style, how either he or we should be much mended by it, I cannot imagine. I have seen very assuming letters signed, Your Most Obedient Humble Servant. The proudest denomination that ever was endured on earth took a title of still greater humility than that which is now proposed for sovereigns by the Apostle of Liberty. Kings and nations were trampled upon by the foot of one calling himself the Servant of Servants, and mandates for deposing sovereigns were sealed with a signet of the Fisherman. I should have considered all this as no more than a sort of flippant, vain discourse, in which, as in an unsavory fume, several persons suffer the spirit of liberty to evaporate, if it were not plainly in support of the idea, and a part of the scheme of cashiering kings for misconduct. In that light, it is worth some observation. Kings, in one sense, are undoubtedly the servants of the people, because their power has no other rational end than that of the general advantage. But it is not true that they are, in the ordinary sense, by our constitution at least, anything like servants, the essence of whose situation is to obey the commands of some other and to be removable at pleasure. But the king of Great Britain obeys no other person. All other persons are individually and collectively too under him and owe to him a legal obedience. The law, which knows neither to flatter nor to insult, calls this high magistrate not our servant, as this humble divine calls him, but our sovereign lord the king. And we, on our parts, have learned to speak only the primitive language of the law and not the confused jargon of their Babylonian pulpits. Conservative Progress of Inherited Freedom The policy appears to me to be the result of profound reflection, or rather the happy effect of following nature, which is wisdom without reflection and above it. A spirit of innovation is generally the result of a selfish temper and confined views. People will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. Besides, the people of England well know that the idea of inheritance furnishes a sure principle of conservation and a sure principle of transmission without at all excluding a principle of improvement. It leaves acquisition free but it secures what it acquires. Whatever advantages are obtained by a state proceeding on these maxims are locked fast as in a sort of family settlement, grasped as in a kind of mortmain forever. By a constitutional policy working after the pattern of nature, we receive, we hold, we transmit our government and our privileges in the same manner in which we enjoy and transmit our property and our lives. The institutions of policy, the goods of fortune, the gifts of providence are handed down to us and from us in the same course and order. Our political system is placed in a just correspondence and symmetry with the order of the world and with the mode of existence decreed to a permanent body composed of transitory parts, wherein, by the disposition of a stupendous wisdom, molding together the great mysterious incorporation of the human race, the whole at one time is never old or middle-aged or young, but in a condition of unchangeable constancy, moves on through the varied tenure of perpetual decay, fall, renovation, and progression. Thus, by preserving the method of nature in the conduct of the state, in what we improve, we are never wholly new. In what we retain, we are never wholly obsolete. By adhering in this manner and on those principles to our forefathers, we are guided not by the superstition of antiquarians, but by the spirit of philosophic analogy. In this choice of inheritance, we have given to our frame of polity 
the image of a relation in blood, binding up the constitution of our country with our dearest domestic ties, adapting our fundamental laws into the bosom of our family affections, keeping inseparable and cherishing with the warmth of all their combined and mutually reflected charities our state, our hearths, our sepulchres, and our altars. Through the same plan of a conformity to nature in our artificial institutions, and by calling in the aid of her unerring and powerful instincts to fortify the fallible and feeble contrivances of our reason, we have derived several other, and those no small benefits, from considering our liberties in the light of an inheritance. Always acting as if in the presence of canonized forefathers, the spirit of freedom, leading in itself to misrule and excess, is tempered with an awful gravity. This idea of a liberal descent inspires us with a sense of habitual native dignity, which prevents that upstart insolence almost inevitably adhering to and disgracing those who are the first acquirers of any distinction. By this means, our liberty becomes a noble freedom. It carries an imposing and majestic aspect. It has a pedigree and illustrating ancestors. It has its bearings and its ensigns armorial. It has its gallery of portraits, its monumental inscriptions, its records, evidences, and titles. We procure reverence to our civil institutions on the principle upon which nature teaches us to revere individual men, on account of their age and on account of those from whom they are descended. All your sophisters cannot produce anything better adapted to preserve a rational and manly freedom than the course that we have pursued, who have chosen our nature rather than our speculations, our breasts rather than our inventions, for the great conservatories and magazines of our rights and privileges. Conservation and Correction A state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. Without such means, it might even risk the loss of that part of the Constitution which it wished the most religiously to preserve. The two principles of conservation and correction operated strongly at the two critical periods of the Restoration and Revolution, when England found itself without a king. At both those periods, the nation had lost the bond of union in their ancient edifice. They did not, however, dissolve the whole fabric. On the contrary, in both cases, they regenerated the deficient part of the old constitution through the parts which were not impaired. They kept these old parts exactly as they were, that the part recovered might be suited to them. They acted by the ancient organized states in the shape of their old organization, and not by the organic moleculae of a disbanded people. At no time, perhaps, did the sovereign legislature manifest a more tender regard to that fundamental principle of British constitutional policy than at the time of the Revolution, when it deviated from the direct line of hereditary succession. The crown was carried somewhat out of the line in which it had before moved, but the new line was derived from the same stock. It was still a line of hereditary descent, still in hereditary descent in the same blood, though in hereditary descent qualified with Protestantism. When the legislature altered the direction but kept the principle, they showed that they held it inviolable. Hereditary Succession of English Crown Unquestionably there was at the Revolution, in the person of King William, a small and a temporary deviation from the strict order of a regular hereditary succession, but it is against all genuine principles of jurisprudence to draw a principle from a law made in a special case and regarding an individual person. Privilegium non transit in exemplum. If ever there was a time favorable for establishing the principle that a king of popular choice was the only legal king, without all doubt it was at the revolution. Its not being done at that time is a proof that the nation was of opinion it ought not to be done at any time. There is no person so completely ignorant of our history as not to know that the majority in Parliament of both parties were so little disposed to anything resembling that principle 
that at first they were determined to place the vacant crown not on the head of the Prince of Orange, but on that of his wife Mary, daughter of King James, the eldest-born of the issue of that king, which they acknowledged as undoubtedly his. It would be to repeat a very trite story to recall to your memory all those circumstances which demonstrated that their accepting King William was not properly a choice, but to all those who did not wish, in effect, to recall King James or to deluge their country in blood and again to bring their religion, laws, and liberties into the peril they had just escaped. It was an act of necessity in the strictest moral sense in which necessity can be taken. So far is it from being true that we acquired a right by the revolution to elect our kings, that if we had possessed it before, the English nation did at that time most solemnly renounce and abdicate it for themselves and for all their posterity forever. These gentlemen may value themselves as much as they please on their Whig principles, but I never desire to be thought a better Whig than Lord Summers, or to understand the principles of the Revolution better than those by whom it was brought about, or to read in the Declaration of Right any mysteries unknown to those whose penetrating style has engraved in our ordinances and in our hearts the words and spirit of that immortal law. It is true that, aided with the powers derived from force and opportunity, the nation was at that time, in some sense, free to take what course it pleased for filling the throne, but only free to do so upon the same grounds on which they might have wholly abolished their monarchy and every other part of their constitution. However, they did not think such bold changes within their commission. It is indeed difficult, perhaps impossible, to give limits to the mere abstract competence of the supreme power, such as was exercised by Parliament at that time. But the limits of a moral competence, subjecting, even in powers more indisputably sovereign, occasional will to permanent reason, and to the steady maxims of faith, justice, and fixed fundamental policy, are perfectly intelligible and perfectly binding upon those who exercise any authority under any name or under any title in the state. The House of Lords, for instance, is not morally competent to dissolve the House of Commons. No, nor even to dissolve itself, nor to abdicate, if it would, its portion in the legislature of the kingdom. Though a king may abdicate for his own person, he cannot abdicate for the monarchy. By a strong or by a stronger reason, the House of Commons cannot renounce its share of authority. The engagement and pact of society, which generally goes by the name of the Constitution, forbids such invasion and such surrender. The constituent parts of a state are obliged to hold their public faith with each other, and with all those who derive any serious interest under their engagements, as much as the whole state is bound to keep its faith with separate communities. Otherwise, competence and power would soon be confounded, and no law be left but the will of a prevailing force. On this principle, the succession of the crown has always been what it now is, an hereditary succession by law. In the old line, it was a succession by the common law, in the new, by the statute law, operating on the principles of the common law, not changing the substance, but regulating the mode and describing the persons. Both these descriptions of law are of the same force and are derived from an equal authority emanating from the common agreement and original compact of the state, communi sponsion republicae, and as such are equally binding on king and people too, as long as the terms are observed and they continue the same body politic. Limits of Legislative Capacity If we were to know nothing of this assembly but by its title and function, no colors could paint to the imagination anything more venerable. In that light, the mind of an inquirer, subdued by such an awful image as that of the virtue and wisdom of a whole people collected into one focus, would pause and hesitate in condemning things even of the very worst aspect. Instead of blamable, they would appear only mysterious. But no name, no power, no function, 
no artificial institution whatsoever can make the men of whom any system of authority is composed any other than God and nature and education and their habits of life have made them. Capacities beyond these the people have not to give. Virtue and wisdom may be the objects of their choice, but their choice confers neither the one nor the other on those upon whom they lay their ordaining hands. They have not the engagement of nature. They have not the promise of revelation for any such power. End of section 34. Section 35 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Our Constitution, not fabricated, but inherited. The Revolution was made to preserve our ancient indisputable laws and liberties, and that ancient constitution of government, which is our only security for law and liberty. If you are desirous of knowing the spirit of our constitution and the policy which predominated in that great period which has secured it to this hour, pray look for both in our histories, in our records, in our acts of parliament, and journals of parliament, and not in the sermons of the old Jewry, and the after-dinner toasts of the Revolution Society. In the former, you will find other ideas and another language. Such a claim is as ill-suited to our temper and wishes as it is unsupported by any appearance of authority. The very idea of the fabrication of a new government is enough to fill us with disgust and horror. We wished at the period of the Revolution, and do now wish, to derive all we possess as an inheritance from our forefathers. Upon that body and stock of inheritance, we have taken care not to inoculate any scion alien to the nature of the original plant. All the reformations we have hitherto made have proceeded upon the principle of reverence to antiquity, and I hope, nay, I am persuaded, that all those which possibly may be made hereafter will be carefully formed upon analogical precedent, authority, and example. Our oldest reformation is that of Magna Carta. You will see that Sir Edward Coke, that great oracle of our law, and indeed all the great men who follow him to Blackstone, are industrious to prove the pedigree of our liberties. They endeavor to prove that the ancient charter, the Magna Carta of King John, was connected with another positive charter from Henry I, and that both the one and the other were nothing more than a reaffirmance of the still more ancient standing law of the kingdom. In the matter of fact, for the greater part, these authors appear to be in the right, perhaps not always, but if the lawyers mistake in some particulars, it proves my position still the more strongly, because it demonstrates the powerful prepossession towards antiquity, with which the minds of all our lawyers and legislators, and of all the people whom they wish to influence, have been always filled, and the stationary policy of this kingdom in considering their most sacred rights and franchises as an inheritance. In the famous law of the third of Charles I, called the Petition of Right, the Parliament says to the king, Your subjects have inherited this freedom claiming their franchises not on abstract principles, as the rights of men, but as the rights of Englishmen, and as a patrimony derived from their forefathers. Selden and the other profoundly learned men who drew this petition of right were as well acquainted, at least, with all the general theories concerning the rights of men as any of the discoursers in our pulpits or on your tribune. Full as well as Dr. Price, or as the abbey sees, but for reasons worthy of that practical wisdom which superseded their theoretic science, they preferred this positive, recorded, hereditary title to all which can be dear to the man and the citizen, to that vague speculative right 
which exposed their sure inheritance to be scrambled for and torn to pieces by every wild, litigious spirit. The same policy pervades all the laws which have since been made for the preservation of our liberties. In the first of William and Mary, in the famous statute called the Declaration of Right, the two houses utter not a syllable of a right to frame a government for themselves. You will see that their whole care was to secure the religion, laws, and liberties that had been long possessed and had been lately endangered. Quote, Taking into their most serious consideration the best means for making such an establishment that their religion, laws, and liberties might not be in danger of being again subverted, end quote, they auspicate all their proceedings by stating as some of those best means in the first place to do as their ancestors in like cases have usually done for vindicating their ancient rights and liberties to declare. And then they pray the king and queen that it may be declared and enacted that all and singular the rights and liberties asserted and declared are the true ancient and indubitable rights and liberties of the people of this kingdom. You will observe that from Magna Carta to the Declaration of Right, it has been the uniform policy of our Constitution to claim and assert our liberties as an entailed inheritance derived to us from our forefathers and to be transmitted to our posterity as an estate specially belonging to the people of this kingdom without any reference whatever to any other more general or prior right. By this means, our Constitution preserves a unity in so great a diversity of its parts. We have an inheritable crown, an inheritable peerage, and a house of commons and a people inheriting privileges, franchises, and liberties from a long line of ancestors. Low Aims and Low Instruments When men of rank sacrifice all ideas of dignity to an ambition without a distinct object and work with low instruments and for low ends, the whole composition becomes low and base. Does not something like this now appear in France? Does it not produce something ignoble and inglorious, a kind of meanness in all the prevalent policy, a tendency in all that is done to lower along with individuals all the dignity and importance of the state? Other revolutions have been conducted by persons who, whilst they attempted or affected changes in the commonwealth, sanctified their ambition by advancing the dignity of the people whose peace they troubled. They had long views. They aimed at the rule, not at the destruction of their country. They were men of great civil and great military talents, and if the terror, the ornament of their age. They were not like Jew brokers, contending with each other who could best remedy with fraudulent circulation and depreciated paper the wretchedness and ruin brought on their country by their degenerate counsels. The compliment made to one of the great bad men of the old stamp, Cromwell, by his kinsman, a favorite poet of that time, shows what it was he proposed, and what indeed, to a great degree, he accomplished in the success of his ambition. Still as you rise, the state exalted too, finds no distemper whilst tis changed by you, changed like the world's great scene, when without noise the rising sun nights, vulgar lights destroys. These disturbers were not so much like men usurping power as asserting their natural place in society. Their rising was to illuminate and beautify the world. Their conquest over their competitors was by outshining them. The hand that, like a destroying angel, smote the country, communicated to it the force and energy under which it suffered. I do not say, God forbid, I do not say that the virtues of such men were to be taken as a balance to their crimes, but they were some corrective to their effects. Such was, as I said, our Cromwell. Such were your whole race of Guises, Condes, and Coligny's. Such the Richelieu's, who in more quiet times acted in the spirit of a civil war. Such as better men, and in a less dubious cause, were your Henry the Fourth and your Sully, though nursed in civil confusions, 
and not wholly without some of their taint. It is a thing to be wondered at, to see how very soon France, when she had a moment to respire, recovered and emerged from the longest and most dreadful civil war that ever was known in any nation. Why? Because among all their massacres, they had not slain the mind in their country. A conscious dignity, a noble pride, a generous sense of glory and emulation was not extinguished. On the contrary, it was kindled and inflamed. The organs also of the state, however shattered, existed. All the prizes of honor and virtue, all the rewards, all the distinctions remained. But your present confusion, like a palsy, has attacked the fountain of life itself. Every person in your country, in a situation to be actuated by a principle of honor, is disgraced and degraded, and can entertain no sensation of life except in a mortified and humiliated indignation. But this generation will quickly pass away. The next generation of the nobility will resemble the artificers and clowns and money jobbers, usurers and Jews, who will be always their fellows, sometimes their masters. Believe me, sir, those who attempt to level never equalize. In all societies, consisting of various descriptions of citizens, some description must be uppermost. The levelers, therefore, only change and pervert the natural order of things. They load the edifice of society by setting up in the air what the solidity of the structure requires to be on the ground. The associations of tailors and carpenters, of which the Republic of Paris, for instance, is composed, cannot be equal to the situation into which, by the worst of usurpations, a usurpation on the prerogatives of nature, you attempt to force them. The Chancellor of France, at the opening of the States, said in a tone of oratorical flourish that all occupations were honorable. If he meant only that no honest employment was disgraceful, he would not have gone beyond the truth. But in asserting that anything is honorable, we imply some distinction in its favor. The occupation of a hairdresser or of a working tallow chandler cannot be a matter of honor to any person, to say nothing of a number of other more servile employments. Such descriptions of men ought not to suffer oppression from the state, but the state suffers oppression if such as they, either individually or collectively, are permitted to rule. In this you think you are combating prejudice, but you are at war with nature. House of Commons contrasted with National Assembly The British House of Commons, without shutting its doors to any merit in any class, is, by the sure operation of adequate causes, filled with everything illustrious in rank, in descent, in hereditary, and in acquired opulence, in cultivated talents, in military, civil, naval, and politic distinction that the country can afford. But supposing, what hardly can be supposed as a case, that the House of Commons should be composed in the same manner with a terce etat in France, would this dominion of chicane be born with patience or even conceived without horror? God forbid I should insinuate anything derogatory to that profession, which is another priesthood, administering the rights of sacred justice. But whilst I revere men in the functions which belong to them, and would do as much as one man can do to prevent their exclusion from any, I cannot, to flatter them, give the lie to nature. They are good and useful in the composition. They must be mischievous if they preponderate so as virtually to become the whole. Their very excellence in their peculiar functions may be far from a qualification for others. It cannot escape observation that when men are too much confined to professional and faculty habits, and as it were inveterate in the recurrent employment of that narrow circle, they are rather disabled than qualified for whatever depends on the knowledge of mankind, on experience in mixed affairs, on a comprehensive connected view of the various complicated external and internal interests which go to the formation of that multifarious thing called a state. After all, if the House of Commons were to have a wholly professional and faculty composition, what is the power of the House of Commons, 
circumscribed and shut in by the immovable barriers of law, usages, positive rules of doctrine and practice, counterpoised by the House of Lords, and every moment of its existence at the discretion of the Crown to continue, prorogue, or dissolve us. The power of the House of Commons, direct or indirect, is indeed great, and long may it be able to preserve its greatness, and the spirit belonging to true greatness at the full. And it will do so as long as it can keep the breakers of law in India from becoming the makers of law for England. The power, however, of the House of Commons, when least diminished, is as a drop of water in the ocean, compared to that residing in a settled majority of your National Assembly. That Assembly, since the destruction of the orders, has no fundamental law, no strict convention, no respected usage to restrain it. Instead of finding themselves obliged to conform to a fixed constitution, they have a power to make a constitution which shall conform to their designs. Nothing in heaven or upon earth can serve as a control on them. What ought to be the heads, the hearts, the dispositions that are qualified or that dare not only to make laws under a fixed constitution, but at one heat to stroke out a totally new constitution for a great kingdom, and every part of it, from the monarch on the throne to the vestry of a parish. But fools rush in where angels fear to tread. In such a state of unbounded power for undefined and undefinable purposes, the evil of a moral and almost physical inaptitude of the man to the function must be the greatest we can conceive to happen in the management of human affairs. Property, more than ability, represented in Parliament. Nothing is a due and adequate representation of a state that does not represent its ability as well as its property. But as ability is a vigorous and active principle, and as property is sluggish, inert, and timid, it never can be safe from the invasions of ability, unless it be, out of all proportion, predominant in the representation. It must be represented, too, in great masses of accumulation, or it is not rightly protected. The characteristic essence of property, formed out of the combined principles of its acquisition and conservation, is to be unequal. The great masses, therefore, which excite envy and tempt rapacity, must be put out of the possibility of danger. Then they form a natural rampart about the lesser properties in all their gradations. The same quantity of property, which is by the natural course of things divided among many, has not the same operation. Its defensive power is weakened as it is diffused. In this diffusion, each man's portion is less than what, in the eagerness of his desires, he may flatter himself to obtain by dissipating the accumulations of others. The plunder of the few would, indeed, give but a share inconceivably small in the distribution to the many. But the many are not capable of making this calculation, and those who lead them to rapine never intend this distribution. The power of perpetuating our property in our families is one of the most valuable and interesting circumstances belonging to it, and that which tends the most to the perpetuation of society itself. It makes our weakness subservient to our virtue. It grafts benevolence even upon avarice. The possessors of family wealth and of the distinction which attends hereditary possession as most concerned in it are the natural securities for this transmission. With us, the House of Peers is formed upon this principle. It is wholly composed of hereditary property and hereditary distinction and made, therefore, the third of the legislature, and in the last event, the sole judge of all property in all its subdivisions. The House of Commons, too, though not necessarily, yet in fact, is always so composed in the far greater part. Let those large proprietors be what they will, and they have their chance of being among the best. They are, at the very worst, the ballast in the vessel of the commonwealth. For though hereditary wealth and the rank which goes with it are too much idolized by creeping sycophants and the blind, abject admirers of power, they are too rashly slighted in shallow speculations of the petulant, assuming, 
short-sighted coxcombs of philosophy. Some decent regulated preeminence, some preference, not exclusive appropriation, given to birth is neither unnatural nor unjust nor impolitic. It is said that 24 millions ought to prevail over 200,000. True, if the constitution of a kingdom be a problem of arithmetic, this sort of discourse does well enough with the lamppost for its second. To men who may reason calmly, it is ridiculous. The will of the many and their interest must very often differ, and great will be the difference when they make an evil choice. Virtue and wisdom qualify for government. I do not, my dear sir, conceive you to be of that sophistical, captious spirit or of that uncandid dullness as to require for every general observation or sentiment an explicit detail of the correctives and exceptions which reason will presume to be included in all the general propositions which come from reasonable men. You do not imagine that I wish to confine power, authority, and distinction to blood and names and titles. No, sir, there is no qualification for government but virtue and wisdom, actual or presumptive. Wherever they are actually found, they have, in whatever state, condition, profession, or trade, the passport of heaven to human place and honor. Woe to the country which would madly and impiously reject the service of the talents and virtues, civil, military, or religious, that are given to grace and to serve it, and would condemn to obscurity everything formed to diffuse luster and glory around a state. Woe to that country, too, that, passing into the opposite extreme, considers a low education, a mean, contracted view of things, a sordid, mercenary occupation as a preferable title to command. Everything ought to be open, but not indifferently to every man. No rotation, no appointment by lot, no mode of election operating in the spirit of sortition or rotation can be generally good in a government conversant in extensive objects. Because they have no tendency, direct or indirect, to select the man with a view to the duty or to accommodate the one to the other. I do not hesitate to say that the road to eminence and power from obscure condition ought not to be made too easy, nor a thing too much of course. If rare merit be the rarest of all rare things, it ought to pass through some sort of probation. The temple of honor ought to be seated on an eminence. If it be opened through virtue, let it be remembered, too, that virtue is never tried, but by some difficulty and some struggle. End of section 35 Section 36 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke Natural and Civil Rights Far am I from denying in theory, full as far as my heart from withholding in practice, if I were of power to give or to withhold, the real rights of men. In denying their false claims of right, I do not mean to injure those which are real, and are such as their pretended rights would totally destroy. If civil society be made for the advantage of man, all the advantages for which it is made become his right. It is an institution of beneficence, and law itself is only beneficence acting by a rule. Men have a right to live by that rule. They have a right to do justice, as between their fellows, whether their fellows are in politic function or in ordinary occupation. They have a right to the fruits of their industry and to the means of making their industry fruitful. They have a right to the acquisitions of their parents, to the nourishment and improvement of their offspring, to instruction in life, and to consolation in death. Whatever each man can separately do without trespassing upon others, he has a right to do for himself and he has a right to a fair portion of all which society, with all its combinations of skill and force, can do in his favor. In this partnership all men have equal rights, 
but not to equal things. He that has but five shillings in the partnership has as good a right to it as he that has five hundred pounds has to his larger proportion. But he has not a right to an equal dividend in the product of the joint stock. And as to the share of power, authority, and direction which each individual ought to have in the management of the state, that I must deny to be amongst the direct original rights of man in civil society. For I have in my contemplation the civil social man and no other. It is a thing to be settled by convention. If civil society be the offspring of convention, that convention must be its law. That convention must limit and modify all the descriptions of constitution which are formed under it. Every sort of legislature judicial or executory power are its creatures. They can have no being in any other state of things. And how can any man claim, under the conventions of civil society, rights which do not so much as suppose its existence, rights which are absolutely repugnant to it? One of the first motives to civil society, and which becomes one of its fundamental rules, is that no man should be judge in his own cause. By this, each person has at once divested himself of the first fundamental right of uncovenanted man, that is, to judge for himself and to assert his own cause. He abdicates all right to be his own governor. He inclusively, in a great measure, abandons the right of self-defense, the first law of nature. Men cannot enjoy the rights of an uncivil and of a civil state together. That he may obtain justice he gives up his right of determining what it is in points the most essential to him. That he may secure some liberty, he makes a surrender in trust of the whole of it. Government is not made in virtue of natural rights, which may and do exist in total independence of it, and exist in much greater clearness and in a much greater degree of abstract perfection. But their abstract perfection is their practical defect, by having a right to everything, they want everything. Government is a contrivance of human wisdom to provide for human wants. Men have a right that these wants should be provided for by this wisdom. Among these wants is to be reckoned the want, out of civil society, of a sufficient restraint upon their passions. Society requires not only that the passions of individuals should be subjected, but that even in the mass and body, as well as in the individuals, the inclinations of men should frequently be thwarted, their will controlled, and their passions brought into subjection. This can only be done by a power out of themselves, and not, in the exercise of its function, subject to that will into those passions which it is its office to bridle and subdue. In this sense, the restraints on men, as well as their liberties, are to be reckoned among their rights. But as the liberties and the restrictions vary with times and circumstances and admit of infinite modifications, they cannot be settled upon any abstract rule, and nothing is so foolish as to discuss them upon that principle. The moment you abate anything from the full rights of men, each to govern himself, and suffer any artificial positive limitation upon those rights, from that moment, the whole organization of government becomes a consideration of convenience. This it is which makes the constitution of a state and the due distribution of its powers a matter of the most delicate and complicated skill. It requires a deep knowledge of human nature and human necessities and of the things which facilitate or obstruct the various ends which are to be pursued by the mechanism of civil institutions. The state is to have recruits to its strength and remedies to its distempers. What is the use of discussing a man's abstract right to food or medicine? The question is upon the method of procuring and administering them. In that deliberation, I shall always advise to call in the aid of the farmer and the physician rather than the professor of metaphysics. The science of constructing a commonwealth or renovating it or reforming it is, like every other experimental science, not to be taught a priori. Nor is it a short experience that can instruct us in that practical science, 
because the real effects of moral causes are not always immediate, but that which in the first instance is prejudicial may be excellent in its remoter operation, and its excellence may arise even from the ill effects it produces in the beginning. The reverse also happens, and very plausible schemes with very pleasing commencements have often shameful and lamentable conclusions, and states there are often some obscure and almost latent causes, things which appear at first view of little moment, on which a very great part of its prosperity or adversity may most essentially depend. The science of government being therefore so practical in itself and intended for such practical purposes, a matter which requires experience and even more experience than any person can gain in his whole life, however sagacious and observing he may be, it is with infinite caution that any man ought to venture upon pulling down an edifice, which has answered in any tolerable degree for ages the common purposes of society, or on building it up again, without having models and patterns of approved utility before his eyes. These metaphysic rites entering into common life, like rays of light which pierce into a dense medium, are, by the laws of nature, refracted from their straight line. Indeed, in the gross and complicated mass of human passions and concerns, the primitive rites of men undergo such a variety of refractions and reflections that it becomes absurd to talk of them as if they continued in the simplicity of their original direction. The nature of man is intricate. The objects of society are of the greatest possible complexity, and therefore no simple disposition or direction of power can be suitable either to man's nature or to the quality of his affairs. When I hear the simplicity of contrivance aimed at and boasted of in any new political constitutions, I am at no loss to decide that the artificers are grossly ignorant of their trade or totally negligent of their duty. The simple governments are fundamentally defective, to say no worse of them. If you were to contemplate society in but one point of view, all these simple modes of polity are infinitely captivating. In effect, each would answer its single end much more perfectly than the more complex is able to attain all its complex purposes. But it is better that the whole should be imperfectly and anomalously answered than that, while some parts are provided for with great exactness, others might be totally neglected or perhaps materially injured by the overcare of a favorite member. The pretended rights of these theorists are all extremes, and in proportion as they are metaphysically true, they are morally and politically false. The rights of men are in a sort of middle, incapable of definition, but not impossible to be discerned. The rights of men and governments are their advantages, and these are often in balances between differences of good, in compromises sometimes between good and evil, and sometimes between evil and evil. Political reason is a computing principle, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, morally and not metaphysically or mathematically, true moral denominations. By these theorists, the right of the people is almost always sophistically confounded with their power. The body of the community, whenever it can come to act, can meet with no effectual resistance, but till power and right are the same, the whole body of them has no right inconsistent with virtue, and the first of all virtues, prudence. Marie Antoinette, it is now sixteen or seventeen years since I saw the Queen of France, then the Dauphiness at Versailles, and surely never lighted on this orb, which she hardly seemed to touch, a more delightful vision. I saw her just above the horizon, decorating and cheering the elevated sphere she just began to move in, glittering like the morning star, full of life and splendor and joy. Oh, what a revolution, and what a heart must I have to contemplate without emotion that elevation and that fall. Little did I dream when she added titles of veneration to those of enthusiastic, distant, respectful love, that she should ever be obliged to carry the sharp antidote against disgrace concealed in that bosom. Little did I dream 
that I should have lived to see such disasters fallen upon her in a nation of gallant men, in a nation of men of honor and of cavaliers. I thought ten thousand swords must have leaped from their scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. But the age of chivalry is gone. That of sophisters, economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. Never, never more shall we behold that generous loyalty to rank and sex, that proud submission, that dignified obedience, that subordination of the heart, which kept alive, even in servitude itself, the spirit of an exalted freedom. The unbought grace of life, the cheap defense of nations, the nurse of manly sentiment and heroic enterprise is gone. It is gone, that sensibility of principle, that chastity of honor, which felt a stain like a wound, which inspired courage whilst it mitigated ferocity, which enabled whatever it touched, and under which vice itself lost half its evil by losing all its grossness. Spirit of a Gentleman and the Spirit of Religion How much of that prosperous state was owing to the spirit of our old manners and opinions is not easy to say. But as such causes cannot be indifferent in their operation, we must presume that, on the whole, their operation was beneficial. We are but too apt to consider things in the state in which we find them, without sufficiently adverting to the causes by which they have been produced, and possibly may be upheld. Nothing is more certain than that our manners, our civilization, and all the good things which are connected with manners and with civilization, have, in this European world of ours, depended for ages upon two principles, and were indeed the result of both combined. I mean the spirit of a gentleman and the spirit of religion. The nobility and the clergy, the one by profession, the other by patronage, kept learning in existence, even in the midst of arms and confusions, and whilst governments were rather in their causes than formed. Learning paid back what it received to nobility and to priesthood, and paid it with usury by enlarging their ideas and by furnishing their minds. Happy if they had all continued to know their indissoluble union and their proper place. Happy if learning, not debauched by ambition, had been satisfied to continue the instructor and not aspired to be the master. Along with its natural protectors and guardians, learning will be cast into the mire and trodden down under the hoofs of a swinish multitude. If, as I suspect, modern letters owe more than they are always willing to own to ancient manners, so do other interests which we value full as much as they are worth. Even commerce and trade and manufacture, the gods of our economical politicians, are themselves, perhaps, but creatures, are themselves but effects, which as first causes we choose to worship. They certainly grew under the same shade in which learning flourished. They too may decay with their natural protecting principles. With you, for the present at least, they all threaten to disappear together. Where trade and manufactures are wanting to a people, and the spirit of nobility and religion remains, sentiment supplies, and not always ill supplies, their place. But if commerce and the arts should be lost in an experiment to try how well a state may stand without these old fundamental principles, what sort of a thing must be a nation of gross, stupid, ferocious, and at the same time poor and sordid barbarians, destitute of religion, honor, or manly pride, possessing nothing at present and hoping for nothing hereafter? Power survives opinion. But power of some kind or other will survive the shock in which manners and opinions perish, and it will find other and worse means for its support. The usurpation which, in order to subvert ancient institutions, has destroyed ancient principles, will hold power by arts similar to those by which it has acquired it. When the old feudal and chivalrous spirit of fealty, which, by freeing kings from fear, freed both kings and subjects from the precaution of tyranny, shall be extinct in the minds of men. Plots and assassinations will be anticipated by preventive murder and preventive confiscation, 
and that long roll of grim and bloody maxims which form the political code of all power not standing at its own honor and the honor of those who are to obey it. Kings will be tyrants from policy when subjects are rebels from principle. Chivalry, a moralizing charm. This mixed system of opinion and sentiment had its origin in the ancient chivalry, and the principle, though varied in its appearance by the varying state of human affairs, subsisted and influenced through a long succession of generations, even to the time we live in. If it should ever be totally extinguished, the loss, I fear, will be great. It is this which has given its character to modern Europe. It is this which has distinguished it under all its forms of government and distinguished it to its advantage from the states of Asia and possibly from those states which flourished in the most brilliant periods of the antique world. It was this which, without confounding ranks, had produced a noble equality and handed it down through all the gradations of social life. It was this opinion which mitigated kings into companions and raised private men to be fellows with kings. Without force or opposition, it subdued the fierceness of pride and power. It obliged sovereigns to submit to the soft collar of social esteem, compelled stern authority to submit to elegance, and gave a dominating vanquisher of laws to be subdued by manners. But now all is to be changed. All the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which harmonized the different shades of life, and which, by a bland assimilation, incorporated into politics the sentiments which beautify and soften private society, are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All the superadded ideas, furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination, which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation, are to be exploded as a ridiculous, absurd, and antiquated fashion. On this scheme of things, a king is but a man, a queen is but a woman, a woman is but an animal, and an animal not of the highest order. All homage paid to the sex in general as such, and without distinct views, is to be regarded as romance and folly. Regicide and parricide and sacrilege are but fictions of superstition, corrupting jurisprudence by destroying its simplicity. The murder of a king or a queen, or a bishop, or a father, are only common homicide. And if the people are by any chance, or in any way, gainers by it, a sort of homicide much the most pardonable, and to which we ought not to make too severe a scrutiny. On the scheme of this barbarous philosophy, which is the offspring of cold hearts and muddy understandings, and which is as void of solid wisdom as it is destitute of all taste and elegance, laws are to be supported only by their own terrors and by the concern which each individual may find in them from his own private speculations or can spare to them from his own private interests. In the groves of their academy, at the end of every vista, you see nothing but the gallows. Nothing is left which engages the affections on the part of the commonwealth. On the principles of this mechanic philosophy, our institutions can never be embodied, if I may use the expression, in persons, so as to create in us love, veneration, admiration, or attachment. But that sort of reason which banishes the affections is incapable of filling their place. These public affections, combined with manners, are required sometimes as supplements, sometimes as correctives, always as aids to law. The precept given by a wise man, as well as a great critic, for the construction of poems is equally true as to states. Non satis est poltra esse poemata dulci assunto. There ought to be a system of manners in every nation which a well-formed mind would be disposed to relish. To make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. End of section 36.
Section 37 of Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selections from the Speeches and Writings of Edmund Burke. Sacredness of Moral Instincts. Why do I feel so differently from the Reverend Dr. Price and those of his lay flock who will choose to adopt the sentiments of his discourse? For this plain reason. Because it is natural I should. Because we are so made as to be affected at such spectacles with melancholy sentiments upon the unstable condition of mortal prosperity and the tremendous uncertainty of human greatness because in those natural feelings we learn great lessons, because in events like these our passions instruct our reason, because when kings are hurled from their thrones by the supreme director of this great drama and become the objects of insult to the base and of pity to the good, we behold such disasters in the moral as we should behold a miracle in the physical order of things. We are alarmed into reflection, our minds, as it has long since been observed, are purified by terror and pity. Our weak, unthinking pride is humbled under the dispensations of a mysterious wisdom. Some tears might be drawn from me if such a spectacle were exhibited on the stage. I should be truly ashamed of finding in myself that superficial, theatric sense of painted distress whilst I could exult over it in real life. With such a perverted mind, I could never venture to show my face at a tragedy. People would think the tears that Garrick formerly, or that Siddons not long since, have extorted from me were the tears of hypocrisy, I should know them to be the tears of folly. Indeed, the theatre is a better school of moral sentiments than churches, where the feelings of humanity are thus outraged. Poets who have to deal with an audience not yet graduated in the school of the rights of men, and who must apply themselves to the moral constitution of the heart, would not dare to produce such a triumph as a matter of exultation. There, where men follow their natural impulses, they would not bear the odious maxims of a Machiavellian policy, whether applied to the attainment of monarchical or democratic tyranny. They would reject them on the modern as they once did on the ancient stage, where they could not bear even the hypothetical proposition of such wickedness in the mouth of a personated tyrant, though suitable to the character he sustained. No theatric audience in Athens would bear what has been borne in the midst of the real tragedy of this triumphal day. A principal actor weighing, as it were in scales hung in a shop of horrors, so much actual crime against so much contingent advantage, and after putting in and out weights, declaring that the balance was on the side of the advantages. They would not bear to see the crimes of new democracy posted as in a ledger against the crimes of old despotism, and the bookkeepers of politics finding democracy still in debt, but by no means unable or unwilling to pay the balance. In the theater, the first intuitive glance, without any elaborate process of reasoning, will show that this method of political computation would justify every extent of crime. They would see that on these principles, even where the very worst acts were not perpetrated, it was owing rather to the fortune of the conspirators than to their parsimony in the expenditure of treachery and blood. They would soon see that criminal means once tolerated are soon preferred. They present a shorter cut to the object than through the highway of the moral virtues. Justifying perfidy and murder for public benefit, public benefit would soon become the pretext and perfidy and murder the end, until rapacity, malice, revenge, and fear more dreadful than revenge could satiate their insatiable appetites. Such must be the consequences of losing, in the splendor of these triumphs of the rights of men, all natural sense of wrong and right. Parental Experience Had it pleased God to continue to me the hopes of succession, 
I should have been, according to my mediocrity and the mediocrity of the age I live in, a sort of founder of a family. I should have left a son who in all the points in which personal merit can be viewed, in science, in erudition, in genius, in taste, in honor, in generosity, in humanity, in every liberal sentiment and every liberal accomplishment, would not have shown himself inferior to the Duke of Bedford or to any of those whom he traces in his line. His grace very soon would have wanted all plausibility in his attack upon that provision which belonged more to mine than to me. He would soon have supplied every deficiency and symmetrized every disproportion. It would not have been for that successor to resort to any stagnant wasting reservoir of merit in me or in any ancestry. He had in himself a salient, living spring of generous and manly action. Every day he lived, he would have repurchased the bounty of the crown, and ten times more if ten times more he had received. He was made a public creature, and had no enjoyment whatever but in the performance of some duty. At this exigent moment, the loss of a finished man is not easily supplied. But a disposer whose power we are little able to resist, and whose wisdom it behooves us not at all to dispute, has ordained it in another manner, and, whatever my querulous weakness might suggest, a far better. The storm has gone over me, and I lie like one of those old oaks which the late hurricane has scattered about me. I am stripped of all my honors, I am torn up by the roots, and lie prostrate on the earth. There, and prostrate there, I most unfeignedly recognize the divine justice, and in some degree submit to it. But whilst I humble myself before God, I do not know that it is forbidden to repel the attacks of unjust and inconsiderate men. The patience of Job is proverbial. After some of the convulsive struggles of our irritable nature, he submitted himself and repented in dust and ashes. But even so, I do not find him blamed for reprehending, and with a considerable degree of verbal asperity, those ill-natured neighbors of his who visited his dunghill to read moral, political, and economical lectures on his misery. I am alone. I have none to meet my enemies in the gate. Indeed, my lord, I greatly deceive myself if in this hard season I would give a peck of refuse wheat for all that is called fame and honor in the world. This is the appetite but of a few. It is a luxury, it is a privilege, it is an indulgence for those who are at their ease. But we are all of us made to shun disgrace, as we are made to shrink from pain and poverty and disease. It is an instinct, and under the direction of reason, instinct is always in the right. I live in an inverted order. They who ought to have succeeded me have gone before me. They who should have been to me as posterity are in the place of ancestors. I owe to the dearest relation, which ever must subsist in memory, that act of piety which he would have performed to me. I owe it to him to show that he was not descended, as the Duke of Bedford would have it, from an unworthy parent. Revolutionary Scene History, who keeps a durable record of all our acts and exercises her awful censure over the proceedings of all sorts of sovereigns, will not forget either those events or the era of this liberal refinement in the intercourse of mankind. History will record that on the morning of the 6th of October, 1789, the King and Queen of France, after a day of confusion, alarm, dismay, and slaughter, lay down under the pledged security of public faith to indulge nature in a few hours of respite and troubled melancholy repose. From this sleep the queen was first startled by the voice of the sentinel at her door, who cried out to her to save herself by flight, that this was the last proof of fidelity he could give, 
that they were upon him and he was dead. Instantly he was cut down. A band of cruel ruffians and assassins, reeking with his blood, rushed into the chamber of the queen, and pierced with a hundred strokes of bayonets and poniards the bed from whence this persecuted woman had but just time to fly almost naked, and through ways unknown to the murderers, had escaped to seek refuge at the feet of a king and husband, not secure of his own life for a moment. This king, to say no more of him, and this queen and their infant children, who once would have been the pride and hope of a great and generous people, were then forced to abandon the sanctuary of the most splendid palace in the world, which they left swimming in blood, polluted by massacre, and strewed with scattered limbs and mutilated carcasses. Thence they were conducted into the capital of their kingdom. Two had been selected from the unprovoked, unresisted, promiscuous slaughter which was made of the gentlemen of birth and family who composed the king's bodyguard. These two gentlemen, with all the parade of an execution of justice, were cruelly and publicly dragged to the block and beheaded in the great court of the palace. Their heads were stuck upon spears and led the procession, whilst the royal captives who followed in the train were slowly moved along amidst the horrid yells and shrilling screams and frantic dances and infamous contumelies and all the unutterable abominations of the furies of hell in the abused shape of the vilest of women. After they had been made to taste, drop by drop, more than the bitterness of death, in the slow torture of a journey of twelve miles protracted to six hours, they were, under a guard composed of those very soldiers who had thus conducted them through this famous triumph, lodged in one of the old palaces of Paris, now converted into a Bastille for kings. Is this a triumph to be consecrated at altars, to be commemorated with grateful thanksgiving, to be offered to the divine humanity with fervent prayer and enthusiastic ejaculation? These Theban and Thracian orgies acted in France, and applauded only in the old Jewry, I assure you, kindle prophetic enthusiasm in the minds but of very few people in this kingdom. Although a saint and apostle, who may have revelations of his own, and who has so completely vanquished all the mean superstitions of the heart, may incline to think it pious and decorous to compare it with the entrance into the world of the Prince of Peace, proclaimed in a holy temple by a venerable sage, and not long before not worse announced by the voice of angels to quiet the innocence of shepherds. Economy on State Principles Economy in my plans was, as it ought to be, secondary, subordinate, instrumental. I acted on state principles. I found a great distemper in the commonwealth, and according to the nature of the evil and of the object, I treated it. The malady was deep, it was complicated in the causes and in the symptoms. Throughout it was full of contraindicants. On one hand government, daily growing more invidious from an apparent increase of the means of strength, was every day growing more contemptible by real weakness. Nor was this dissolution confined to government commonly so called. It extended to Parliament, which was losing not a little in its dignity and estimation by an opinion of its not acting on worthy motives. On the other hand, the desires of the people, partly natural and partly infused into them by art, appeared in so wild and inconsiderate a manner with regard to the economical object, for I set aside for a moment the dreadful tampering with the body of the Constitution itself, that if their petitions had literally been complied with, the state would have been convulsed, and the gate would have been opened through which all property might be sacked and ravaged. Nothing could have saved the public from the mischiefs of the false reform but its absurdity, which would soon have brought itself, and with it all real reform, into discredit. 
this would have left a rankling wound in the hearts of the people, who would know they had failed in the accomplishment of their wishes, but who, like the rest of mankind in all ages, would impute the blame to anything rather than to their own proceedings. But there were then persons in the world who nourished complaint, and would have been thoroughly disappointed if the people were ever satisfied. I was not of that humour. I wished that they should be satisfied. It was my aim to give to the people the substance of what I knew they desired, and what I thought was right, whether they desired it or not, before it had been modified for them into senseless petitions. I knew that there is a manifest, marked distinction which ill men with ill designs, or weak men incapable of any design, will constantly be confounding, that is, a marked distinction between change and reformation. The former alters the substance of the objects themselves and gets rid of all their essential good as well as of all the accidental evil annexed to them. Change is novelty, and whether it is to operate any one of the effects of reformation at all, or whether it may not contradict the very principle upon which reformation is desired, cannot be certainly known beforehand. Reform is not a change in the substance, or in the primary modification of the object, but a direct application of a remedy to the grievance complained of. So far as that is removed, all is sure. It stops there, and if it fails, the substance which underwent the operation, at the very worst, is but where it was. All this, in effect, I think, but am not sure, I have said elsewhere. It cannot at this time be too often repeated, line upon line, precept upon precept, until it comes into the currency of a proverb, to innovate is not to reform. The French revolutionists complained of everything. They refused to reform anything. And they left nothing no, nothing at all unchanged. The consequences are before us, not in remote history, not in future prognostication. They are about us, they are upon us. They shake the public security, they menace private enjoyment. They dwarf the growth of the young, they break the quiet of the old. If we travel, they stop our way. They infest us in town, they pursue us to the country. Our business is interrupted, our repose is troubled, our pleasures are saddened. Our very studies are poisoned and perverted, and knowledge is rendered worse than ignorance by the enormous evils of this dreadful innovation. The revolution harpies of France, sprung from night and hell, or from that chaotic anarchy which generates equivocally all monstrous, all prodigious things, cuckoo-like, adulterously lay their eggs and brood over and hatch them in the nest of every neighboring state. These obscene harpies, who deck themselves in I know not what divine attributes, but who in reality are foul and ravenous birds of prey, both mothers and daughters, flutter over our heads and souse down upon our tables and leave nothing unrent, unrifled, unravaged, or unpolluted with the slime of their filthy offal. Philosophic Vanity, Its Maxims and Effects The Assembly recommends to its youth a study of the bold experimenters in morality. Everybody knows that there is a great dispute amongst their leaders which of them is the best resemblance of Rousseau. In truth, they all resemble him. His blood they transfuse into their minds and into their manners. Him they study, him they meditate, him they turn over in all the time they can spare from the laborious mischief of the day or the debauches of the night. Rousseau is their canon of holy writ, in his life, he is their canon of Polycletus. He is their standard figure of perfection. To this man and this writer, as a pattern to authors and to Frenchmen, 
The foundries of Paris are now running for statues, with the kettles of their poor and the bells of their churches. If an author had written like a great genius on geometry, though its practical and speculative morals were vicious in the extreme, it might appear that in voting the statue they honoured only the geometrician. But Rousseau is a moralist or he is nothing. It is impossible, therefore, putting the circumstances together, to mistake their design in choosing the author with whom they have begun to recommend a course of studies. Their great problem is to find a substitute for all the principles which hitherto have been employed to regulate the human will and action. They find dispositions in the mind of such force and quality as may fit men, far better than the old morality, for the purposes of such a state as theirs, and may go much further in supporting their power and destroying their enemies. They have therefore chosen a selfish, flattering, seductive, ostentatious vice in the place of plain duty. True humility, the basis of the Christian system, is the low but deep and firm foundation of all real virtue. But this, as very painful in the practice and little imposing in the appearance, they have totally discarded. Their object is to merge all natural and all social sentiment in inordinate vanity. In a small degree, and conversant in little things, vanity is of little moment. When full-grown, it is the worst of vices, and the occasional mimic of them all. It makes the whole man false. It leaves nothing sincere or trustworthy about him. His best qualities are poisoned and perverted by it, and operate exactly as the worst. When your lords had many writers as immoral as the object of their statue, such as Voltaire and others, they chose Rousseau, because in him that peculiar vice, which they wished to erect into ruling virtue, was by far the most conspicuous. We have had the great professor and founder of the philosophy of vanity in England. As I had good opportunities of knowing his proceedings almost from day to day, he left no doubt on my mind that he entertained no principle either to influence his heart or to guide his understanding, but vanity. With this vice he was possessed to a degree little short of madness. It is from the same deranged eccentric vanity that this, the insane Socrates of the National Assembly, was impelled to publish a mad confession of his mad faults, and to attempt a new sort of glory from bringing heartily to light the obscure and vulgar vices which we know may sometimes be blended with eminent talents. He has not observed on the nature of vanity who does not know that it is omnivorous, that it has no choice in its food, that it is fond to talk even of its own faults and vices, as what will excite surprise and draw attention, and what will pass at worst for openness and candor. It was this abuse and perversion, which vanity makes even of hypocrisy, that has driven Rousseau to record a life not so much as checkered or spotted here and there with virtues, or even distinguished by a single good action. It is such a life he chooses to offer to the attention of mankind. It is such a life that, with a wild defiance, he flings in the face of his Creator, whom he acknowledges only to brave. Your assembly, knowing how much more powerful example is found than precept, has chosen this man, by his own account without a single virtue, for a model. To him they erect their first statue. From him they commence their series of honors and distinctions. It is that new invented virtue which your masters canonize that led their model hero constantly to exhaust the stores of his powerful rhetoric in the expression of universal benevolence, whilst his heart was incapable of harboring one spark of common parental affection. Benevolence to the whole species, and want of feeling for every individual with whom the professors come in contact, form the character of the new philosophy. 
setting up for an unsocial independence, this their hero of vanity refuses the just price of common labour, as well as the tribute which opulence owes to genius, and which, when paid, honours the giver and the receiver. And then he pleads his beggary as an excuse for his crimes. He melts with tenderness for those only who touch him by the remotest relation, and then, without one natural pang, casts away, as a sort of awful and excrement, the spawn of his disgustful amours, and sends his children to the hospital of foundlings. The bear loves, licks, and forms her young, but bears are not philosophers. Vanity, however, finds its account in reversing the train of our natural feelings. Thousands admire the sentimental writer. The affectionate father is hardly known in his parish. Under this philosophic instructor in the ethics of vanity, they have attempted in France a regeneration of the moral constitution of man. Statesmen, like your present rulers, exist by everything which is spurious, fictitious, and false, by everything which takes the man from his house and sets him on a stage, which makes him up an artificial creature, with painted theatric sentiments, fit to be seen by the glare of candlelight, and formed to be contemplated at a due distance. Vanity is too apt to prevail in all of us and in all countries. To the improvement of Frenchmen it seems not absolutely necessary that it should be taught upon system, but it is plain that the present rebellion was its legitimate offspring, and it is piously fed by that rebellion with a daily dole. If the system of institution recommended by the assembly be false and theatric, it is because their system of government is of the same character. To that, and to that alone, it is strictly conformable. To understand either, we must connect the morals with the politics of the legislators. Your practical philosophers, systematic in everything, have wisely begun at the source. As the relation between parents and children is the first amongst the elements of vulgar, natural morality, they erect statues to a wild, ferocious, low-minded, hard-hearted father of fine general feelings, a lover of his kind, but a hater of his kindred. Your masters reject the duties of his vulgar relation as contrary to liberty, as not founded in the social compact, and not binding according to the rights of men, because the relation is not, of course, the result of free election. Never so on the side of the children, not always on the part of the parents. The next relation which they regenerate by their statues to Rousseau is that which is next in sanctity to that of a father. They differ from those old-fashioned thinkers who considered pedagogues as sober and venerable characters and allied to the parental. The moralists of the dark times, praeceptorum sancti voluere parentis esse loco. In this age of light, they teach the people that preceptors ought to be in the place of gallants. They systematically corrupt a very corruptible race. For some time a growing nuisance amongst you, a set of pert, petulant literators, to whom, instead of their proper but severe unostentatious duties, they assign the brilliant part of men of wit and pleasure, of gay young military sparks, and danglers at toilets. They call on the rising generation in France to take a sympathy in the adventures and fortunes, and they endeavor to engage their sensibility on the side of pedagogues who betray the most awful family trusts and vitiate their female pupils. They teach the people that the debauchers of virgins, almost in the arms of their parents, may be safe inmates in the houses and even fit guardians of the honor of those husbands who succeed legally to the office which the young literators had preoccupied without asking leave of law or conscience. Thus they dispose of all the family relations of parents and children, husbands and wives. Through this same instructor, by whom they corrupt the morals, they corrupt the taste. Taste and elegance, 
though they are reckoned only among the smaller and secondary morals, yet are of no mean importance in the regulation of life. A moral taste is not of force to turn vice into virtue, but it recommends virtue with something like the blandishments of pleasure, and it infinitely abates the evils of vice. Rousseau, a writer of great force and vivacity, is totally destitute of taste in any sense of the word. Your masters, who are his scholars, conceive that all refinement has an aristocratic character. The last age had exhausted all its powers in giving a grace and nobleness to our mutual appetites, and in raising them into a higher class and order than seemed justly to belong to them. Through Rousseau, your masters are resolved to destroy these aristocratic prejudices. The passion called love has so general and powerful an influence. It makes so much of the entertainment, and indeed so much of the occupation of that part of life which decides the character forever, that the mode and the principles on which it engages the sympathy and strikes the imagination become of the utmost importance to the morals and manners of every society. Your rulers were well aware of this, and in their system of changing your manners to accommodate them to their politics, they found nothing so convenient as Rousseau. Through him they teach men to love after the fashion of philosophers, that is, they teach to men, to Frenchmen, a love without gallantry a love without anything of that fine flower of youthfulness and gentility which places it, if not among the virtues, among the ornaments of life. Instead of this passion, naturally allied to grace and manners, they infuse into their youth an unfashioned, indelicate, sour, gloomy, ferocious medley of pedantry and lewdness, of metaphysical speculations blended with the coarsest sensuality. Such is the general morality of the passions to be found in their famous philosopher, in his famous work of philosophical gallantry, the Nouvelle Eloise. When the fence from the gallantry of preceptors is broken down, and your families are no longer protected by decent pride and salutary domestic prejudice, there is but one step to a frightful corruption. The rulers in the National Assembly are in good hopes that the females of the first families in France may become an easy prey to dancing masters, fiddlers, pattern drawers, friseurs, and valets de chambre, and other active citizens of that description, who, having the entry into your houses, and being half domesticated by their situation, may be blended with you by regular and irregular relations. By a law they have made these people their equals. By adopting the sentiments of Rousseau they have made them your rivals. In this manner these great legislators complete their plan of leveling and establish their rights of men on a sure foundation. I am certain that the writings of Rousseau lead directly to this kind of shameful evil. I have often wondered how he comes to be so much more admired and followed on the continent than he is here. Perhaps a secret charm in the language may have its share in this extraordinary difference. We certainly perceive, and to a degree we feel, in this writer, a style glowing, animated, enthusiastic, at the same time that we find it lax, diffuse, and not in the best taste of composition all the members of the piece being pretty equally laboured and expanded, without any due selection or subordination of parts. He is generally too much on the stretch, and his manner has little variety. We cannot rest upon any of his works, though they contain observations which occasionally discover a considerable insight into human nature. But his doctrines on the whole are so inapplicable to real life and manners that we never dream of drawing from them any rule for laws or conduct, or for fortifying or illustrating anything by a reference to his opinions. They have with us the fate of older paradoxes. Cum ventum ad verum est, sensus moresque repugnant, atque ipsa utilitas justi prope mater et aequi. 
Perhaps bold speculations are more acceptable because more new to you than to us, who have been long since satiated with them. We continue, as in the two last ages, to read, more generally than I believe is now done on the continent, the authors of sound antiquity. These occupy our minds. They give us another taste and turn, and will not suffer us to be more than transiently amused with paradoxical morality. It is not that I consider this writer as wholly destitute of just notions. Amongst his irregularities, it must be reckoned that he is sometimes moral, and moral in a very sublime strain. But the general spirit and tendency of his works is mischievous, and the more mischievous for this mixture, for perfect depravity of sentiment is not reconcilable with eloquence, and the mind, though corruptible, not complexionally vicious, would reject and throw off with disgust a lesson of pure and unmixed evil. These writers make even virtue a pander to vice. However, I less consider the author than the system of the assembly in perverting morality through his means. This, I confess, makes me nearly despair of any attempt upon the minds of their followers through reason, honor, or conscience. The great object of your tyrants is to destroy the gentlemen of France, and for that purpose they destroy, to the best of their power, all the effect of those relations which may render considerable men powerful or even safe. To destroy that order, they vitiate the whole community. That no means may exist of confederating against their tyranny, by the false sympathies of this nouvelle Eloise they endeavor to subvert those principles of domestic trust and fidelity which form the discipline of social life. They propagate principles by which every servant may think it, if not his duty, at least his privilege, to betray his master. By those principles, every considerable father of a family loses the sanctuary of his house. Debet sua cuique domus esse per fugium tutissimo, says the law which your legislators have taken so much pains first to decry, then to repeal. They destroy all the tranquility and security of domestic life, turning the asylum of the house into a gloomy prison where the father of the family must drag out a miserable existence endangered in proportion to the apparent means of his safety, where he is worse than solitary in a crowd of domestics, and more apprehensive from his servants and inmates than from the hired, bloodthirsty mob without doors who are ready to pull him to the lanterne. It is thus, and for the same end, that they endeavor to destroy that tribunal of conscience which exists independently of edicts and decrees. Your despots govern by terror. They know that he who fears God fears nothing else, and therefore they eradicate from the mind, through their Voltaire, their Helvetius, and the rest of that infamous gang, that only sort of fear which generates true courage. Their object is that their fellow citizens may be under the dominion of no awe but that of their committee of research and of their lanterne. Having found the advantage of assassination in the formation of their tyranny, it is the grand resource in which they trust for the support of it. Whoever opposes any of their proceedings, or is suspected of a design to oppose them, is to answer it with his life or the lives of his wife and children. This infamous, cruel, and cowardly practice of assassination they have the impudence to call merciful. They boast that they operated their usurpation rather by terror than by force, and that a few seasonable murders have prevented the bloodshed of many battles. There is no doubt they will extend these acts of mercy whenever they see an occasion. Dreadful, however, will be the consequences of their attempt to avoid the evils of war by the merciful policy of murder. If, by effectual punishment of the guilty, they do not wholly disavow that practice, and the threat of it too as any part of their policy, if ever a foreign prince enters into France, 
he must enter it as into a country of assassins. The mode of civilized war will not be practiced, nor are the French who act on the present system entitled to expect it. They whose known policy is to assassinate every citizen whom they suspect to be discontented by their tyranny and to corrupt the soldiery of every open enemy must look for no modified hostility. All war which is not battle will be military execution. This will beget acts of retaliation from you, and every retaliation will beget a new revenge. The hellhounds of war on all sides will be uncoupled and unmuzzled. The new school of murder and barbarism, set up in Paris, having destroyed, so far as in it lies, all the other manners and principles which have hitherto civilized Europe, will destroy also the mode of civilized war, which, more than anything else, has distinguished the Christian world. Such is the approaching golden age which the Virgil of your assembly has sung to his polios. End of section 37 Read by Geoffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa, in 2024